Recorded Books presents an unabridged recording of The Last Camel Died at Noon by Elizabeth Peters. Narrated by Barbara Rosenblatt. This book is copyrighted 1991 by Elizabeth Peters. This recording is copyrighted 1991 by Recorded Books. In the deserts of the Sudan, among ancient Egyptian ruins along the banks of the Nile, Amelia Peabody, her obstinate husband Radcliffe Emerson, and their precocious son Ramses unearth more secrets than they had intended to. What they discover is not the archaeological oasis they'd anticipated, but rather a flirtation with danger that outrivals all this adventurous family's previous predicaments. And now, the last camel died at noon. Book One Chapter One I told you this was a harebrained scheme. Hands on hips, brows lowering, Emerson stood gazing fixedly at the recumbent ruminant. A sympathetic friend, if camels have such, which is doubtful, might have taken comfort in the fact that scarcely a ripple of agitated sand surrounded the place of its demise. Like the others in the caravan, of which it was the last, it had simply stopped, sunk to its knees, and passed on peacefully and quietly. Conditions, I might add, that are uncharacteristic of camels alive or moribund. Those conditions are also uncharacteristic of Emerson. To the readers who have encountered my distinguished husband, in the flesh or in the pages of my earlier works, it will come as no surprise to learn that he reacted to the camel's death as if the animal had committed suicide for the sole purpose of inconveniencing him. Eyes blazing like sapphires in his tanned and chiselled face, he plucked the hat from his head, flung it upon the sand, and kicked it a considerable distance before turning his furious glare toward me. Curse it, Amelia! I told you this was a harebrained scheme! Yes, Emerson, you did, I replied. In those precise words, if I am not mistaken, if you will cast your mind back to our first discussion of this enterprise, you may remember that I was in full agreement with you. Then what? Emerson turned in a circle. Boundless and bare, as the poet puts it, the lone and level sands stretched far away. Then what the devil are we doing here? Emerson bellowed. It was a reasonable question, and one that may also have occurred to the reader of this narrative. Professor Radcliffe Emerson, FRS, FBA, LLD, Edinburgh, DCL, Oxford, member of the American Philosophical Society, etc., preeminent Egyptologist of this or any other era, was frequently to be encountered in unusual, not to say peculiar, surroundings. Will I ever forget that magical moment when I entered a tomb in the desolate cliffs bordering the Nile and found him delirious with fever, in desperate need of attentions he was helpless to resist? The bond forged between us by my expert nursing was strengthened by the dangers we subsequently shared, and in due course, reader, I married him. Since that momentous day, we had excavated in every major site in Egypt and written extensively on our discoveries. Modesty prevents me from claiming too large a share of the scholarly reputation we had earned, but Emerson would have been the first to proclaim that we were a partnership in archaeology as in marriage. From the sandy wastes of the cemeteries of Memphis to the rocky cliffs of the Theban necropolis, we had wandered hand in hand, figuratively speaking, in terrain almost as inhospitable as the desert that presently surrounded us. And never before, however, had we been more than a few miles from the Nile and its life-giving water. It lay far behind us now, and there was not a pyramid or a broken wall to be seen, much less a tree or a sign of habitation. What indeed were we doing there? 
Without camels, we were marooned on a sea of sand, and our situation was infinitely more desperate than that of shipwrecked sailors. I seated myself upon the ground with my back against the camel. The sun was at the zenith. The only shade was cast by the body of the poor beast. Emerson paced back and forth, kicking up clouds of sand and swearing. His expertise in this latter exercise had earned him the admiring title of Father of Curses from our Egyptian workman, and on this occasion he surpassed himself. I sympathized with his feelings, but duty compelled me to remonstrate. "'You forget yourself, Emerson,' I remarked, indicating our companions. They stood side by side, watching me with grave concern, and I must say they made a ludicrous pair. Many of the native Nilotic peoples are unusually tall, and Kemet, the only servant remaining to us, was over six feet in height. He wore a turban and a loose robe of woven blue and white cotton. His face, with its clean-cut features and deeply bronzed skin, bore a striking resemblance to that of his companion, but the second individual was less than four feet tall. He was also my son, Walter Peabody Emerson, known as Ramses, who should not have been there. Emerson cut off his expletive in mid-syllable, though the effort almost choked him. Still in need of a vent for his boiling emotions, he focused them on me. Who selected these damp, these cussed camels? You know perfectly well who selected them, I replied. I always select the animals for our expeditions, and doctor them too. The local people treat camels and donkeys so badly. Don't give me one of your lectures on veterinary medicine and kindness to animals, Emerson bellowed. I knew, I knew your delusions about your medical knowledge would lead us into disaster one day. You have been dosing these damp, these confounded animals. What did you give them? Emerson, are you accusing me of poisoning the camels? I struggled to overcome the indignation his outrageous accusation had provoked. I believe you have taken leave of your senses. Well... "'And if I have, there is some excuse for me,' Emerson said, in a more moderate tone. "'He edged closer to me. "'Our situation is desperate enough to disturb any man, "'even one as even-tempered as I. Uh, "'I beg your pardon, my dear Peabody. "'Don't cry. "'Emerson calls me Amelia only when he is annoyed with me. "'Peabody is my maiden name,' And it was thus that Emerson, in one of his feeble attempts at sarcasm, addressed me during the early days of our acquaintance. Hallowed by fond memories, it has now become a private pet name, so to speak, indicative of affection and respect. I lowered the handkerchief I had raised to my eyes and smiled at him. A few grains of sand in my eye, Emerson, that is all. You will never find me succumbing to helpless tears when firmness is required, as you are well aware. Mm. Said Emerson. All the same, Mamma, said Ramses. Papa has raised a point worthy of consideration. It is surely stretching coincidence to the point of impossibility to assume that all the camels should die, suddenly and with no symptoms of disease, within forty-eight hours of one another. I assure you, Ramses, that consideration had already occurred to me. Run and fetch Papa's hat, if you please. No, Emerson, I know your dislike of hats, but I insist that you put it on. We are in bad enough case without having you laid low by sunstroke. Emerson made no reply. His eyes were fixed on the small figure of his son, trotting obediently after the sun helmet, and his expression was so poignant that my eyes dimmed. It was not fear for himself that weakened my husband, nor even concern for me. We had faced death together not once, but many times. He knew he could count on me to meet that grim adversary with a smile and a stiff upper lip. No. It was the probable fate of Ramses that brought the moisture to his keen blue eyes. 
So moved was I that I vowed not to remind Emerson that it was his fault that his son and heir had been condemned to a slow, lingering, painful death from dehydration. Well, we have been in worse situations, I said. At least we three have. And I presume, Kemet, that you are no stranger to peril. Have you any suggestions, my friend? Responding to my gesture, Kemet approached and squatted down next to me. Ramses immediately squatted as well. He had conceived a great admiration for this taciturn, handsome man, and the sight of them, like a stalk and its chick, brought a smile to my lips. Emerson was not amused. Fanning himself with his hat, he remarked sarcastically, "'If Kemet has a suggestion that can get us out of this dilemma, "'I will take off my hat to him. "'We... "'You cannot take off your hat until you put it on, Emerson,' I interrupted. "'Emerson slapped the offending article onto his unruly black head "'with such force that his eyelashes fluttered wildly. "'As I was saying,' We are more than six days from the Nile, as the camel trots, considerably longer on foot. If the so-called map we have followed is to be trusted, there is a water hole or oasis ahead. It is a journey of approximately two days by camel, of which we have none. We have water for perhaps two days, with strict rationing. It was an accurate and depressing summary. What Emerson did not say, because the rest of us knew it, was that our desperate condition was due to the defection of our servants. They had departed in a body the night before, taking with them all the water skins, except the partially filled containers we had had with us in our tent, and the canteen I always carry attached to my belt. They might have done worse. They might have murdered us. I cannot, however, attribute their forbearance to kindness of heart. Emerson's strength and ferocity are legendary. Many of the simple natives believe he is armed with supernatural powers. And I myself have a certain reputation as the Sit Hakim, dispenser of mysterious medicines. Rather than challenge us, they had stolen away in the dead of night. Kemet claimed he had been struck unconscious when he attempted to prevent them, and, indeed, he had a sizable lump on his head to prove it. Why he had not joined the mutineers, I could not explain. It might have been loyalty, though he owed us no more than did the others who had worked for us as long, or it might have been that he had not been invited to join them. There was a great deal about Kemet that wanted explaining, "'expressionless as the nesting bird he somewhat resembled at that moment, "'his knees being on approximately the level of his ears. "'He was not at all a comic figure. "'Indeed, his chiselled features had a dignity that reminded me "'of certain Fourth Dynasty sculptures, "'most particularly the magnificent portrait of King Kephron, "'builder of the Second Pyramid.' I had once remarked to Emerson on the resemblance. He had replied that it was not surprising, since the ancient Egyptians were of mixed racial stock, and some of the Nubian tribes were probably their remote descendants. I should add that this theory of Emerson's, which he regarded not as theory but as fact, was not accepted by the great majority of his colleagues. But I perceive that I am wandering from the plot of my narrative as I am inclined to do when questions of scholarly interest arise. Let me turn back the pages of my journal and explain in proper sequence of time how we came to find ourselves in such an extraordinary predicament. I do not do this in the meretricious hope of prolonging your anxiety as to our survival, dear reader, for if you have the intelligence I expect my readers to possess... You will know I could not be writing this account if I were in the same state as the camels. I must turn back not a few but many pages and take you to a quiet country house in Kent when the turning of the leaves from green to golden bronze betokened the approach of autumn. 
After a busy summer spent teaching, lecturing, and readying the publication of our previous season's excavations, we were about to begin preparations for our annual winter's work in Egypt. Emerson was seated behind his desk. I walked briskly to and fro, hands behind my back. The bust of Socrates, oddly speckled with black, for it was at this bust that Emerson was wont to hurl his pen when inspiration flagged or something happened to irritate him, watched us benevolently. The subject of discussion, or so I fondly believed, was the future intellectual development of our son. I fully sympathise with your reservations concerning the public school system, Emerson, I assured him. But the boy must have some formal training, somewhere, sometime. He is growing up quite a little savage. You do yourself an injustice, my dear, Emerson murmured, glancing at the newspaper he was holding. He has improved, I admitted. He doesn't talk quite as much as he used to, and he has not been in danger of life or limb for several weeks. But he has no notion how to get on with children his own age. Emerson looked up. His brow furrowed. Now, Peabody, that is not the case. Last winter, with Ahmed's children... I speak of English children, Emerson. Naturally. There is nothing natural about English children. Good gad, Amelia. Our public schools have a caste system more pernicious than that of India. And those at the bottom of the ladder are abused more viciously than any untouchable... As for getting on with members of the opposite sex, you do not mean, I hope, to exclude female children from Ramsay's social connections? Well, I assure you that that is precisely what your precious public schools aim to achieve. Warming to his theme, Emerson leapt up, scattering papers in all directions, and began to pace back and forth on a path at right angles to mine. Curse it! I sometimes wonder how the upper classes in this country ever manage to reproduce. By the time a lad leaves university, he is so intimidated by girls of his own class, it is almost impossible for him to speak to them in intelligible sentences. If he did, he would not receive an intelligible answer for the education of women, if it can be dignified by that term. Oof. I beg your pardon, my dear. Are you hurt? Not at all. I accepted the hand he offered to assist me to rise. But if you insist on pacing while you lecture, at least walk with me, instead of at right angles to my path. A collision was inevitable. A sunny smile replaced his scowl, and he pulled me into a fond embrace. Only that sort of collision, I hope. Come now, Peabody. You know we agree on the inadequacies of the educational system. You don't want to break the lad's spirit. I only want to bend it a little, I murmured. But it is hard to resist Emerson when he smiles and... Never mind what he was doing. But when I say Emerson's eyes are sapphire blue, his hair is black and thick, and his frame is as trim and muscular as that of a Greek athlete, not even referring to the cleft or dimple in his chin... All the enthusiasm he brings to the exercise of his conjugal rights. Well, I need not be more specific, but I am sure any right-thinking female will understand why the subject of Ramsay's education ceased to interest me. After Emerson had resumed his seat and picked up the newspaper, I returned to the subject, but in a considerably softened mood. My dear Emerson, your powers of persuasion, that is to say, your arguments are most convincing. Ramses could go to school in Cairo. There is a new academy for young gentlemen of which I have had good reports. And since we will be excavating at Saqqara... The newspaper behind which Emerson had retired rattled loudly. I stopped speaking, seized by a hideous premonition... Though, as events were to prove, not nearly hideous enough. Emerson, I said gently, you have applied for the Furman, haven't you? You surely would not repeat the error you made a few years ago when you neglected to apply in time, and instead of receiving permission to work at Dashur, 
we ended up at the most boring, unproductive site in all of Lower Egypt? Emerson, put down that newspaper and answer me. Have you obtained permission from the Department of Antiquities to excavate at Saqqara this season? Emerson lowered the newspaper and flinched at finding my face only inches from his. Kitchener, he said, has taken Berber. It is inconceivable to me that future generations will fail to realise the vital importance of the study of history, or that Britons will be ignorant of one of the most remarkable chapters in the development of their empire. Yet stranger things have happened, and in the event of such a catastrophe, for I would call it nothing less, I beg leave of my readers to remind them of facts that should be as familiar to them as they are to me. In 1884, when I made my first visit to Egypt, most English persons persisted in regarding the Mahdi as only another ragged religious fanatic, despite the fact that his followers had already overrun half the Sudan. This country, encompassing the region from the rocky cataracts of Aswan to the jungles south of the junction of the Blue and White Niles, had been conquered by Egypt in 1821. The Pashas, who were not Egyptians at all, but descendants of an Albanian adventurer, had proceeded to rule the region even more corruptly and inefficiently than they did Egypt itself. The benevolent intervention of the great powers, especially Britain, rescued Egypt from disaster. But matters continued to worsen in the Sudan, until Muhammad Ahmed ibn el Said Abdullah, proclaimed himself the Mahdi, the reincarnation of the Prophet, and rallied the forces of rebellion against Egyptian tyranny and misrule. His followers believed he was the descendant of a line of sheikhs. His enemies sneered at him as a poor, ignorant boat builder. Whatever his origins, he possessed an extraordinarily magnetic personality and a remarkable gift of oratory. Armed only with sticks and spears, his ragtag troops had swept all before them and were threatening the Sudanese capital of Khartoum. Against the figure of the Mahdi stands that of the heroic General Gordon. Early in 1884, he had been sent to Khartoum to arrange for the withdrawal of the troops garrisoned there and in the nearby fort of Omdurman. There was a good deal of public feeling against this decision, for abandoning Khartoum meant giving up the entire Sudan. Gordon was accused, then and later, of never meaning to comply with his orders. Whatever his reasons for delaying the withdrawal, he did just that. By the autumn of 1884, when I arrived in Egypt, Khartoum was besieged by the wild hordes of the Mahdi, and all the surrounding country, to the very borders of Egypt, was in rebel hands. The gallant Gordon held Khartoum, and British public opinion, led by the Queen herself, demanded his rescue. An expedition was finally sent, but it did not reach the beleaguered city until February of the following year, three days after Khartoum fell, and the gallant Gordon was cut down in the courtyard of his house. Too late was the agonised cry of Britannia. Ironically, the Mahdi survived his great foe by less than six months, but his place was taken by one of his lieutenants, the Khalifa Abdallah el-Tashi, who ruled even more tyrannically than his master. For over a decade, the land had groaned under his cruelties, while the British lion licked its wounds and refused to avenge the fallen hero. The reasons, political, economic and military, that led to a decision to reconquer the Sudan are too complex to discuss here. Suffice it to say that the campaign had begun in 1896 and that by the autumn of the following year our forces were advancing on the fourth cataract under the gallant Kitchener, who had been named Sirdar of the Egyptian army. But what, one might ask, do these world-shaking affairs have to do with the winter plans of a pair of innocent Egyptologists? Alas, I knew the answer only too well, and I sank into a chair beside the desk.
Emerson, I said. Emerson, I beg of you, don't tell me you want to dig in the Sudan this winter. My dear Peabody, Emerson flung the newspaper aside and fixed the full power of his brilliant gaze upon me. You know none better that I have wanted to excavate at Napata or Meroe for years. I'd have tackled it last year if you hadn't raised such a fuss, or if you had consented to remain in Egypt with Ramses while I did so, and waited to learn that they had put your head on a pike as they did Gordon's, I murmured. Nonsense. I'd have been in no danger. Some of my best friends were Mardists. But never mind, he continued quickly, to forestall the protest I was about to make. Not of the truth of his statement, for Emerson had friends in very strange places, but of the common sense of his plan. The situation is entirely different now, Peabody. The region around Napata is already in Egyptian hands. At the rate Kitchener is going, he will take Khartoum by the time we reach Egypt. And Meroe, the site I favour, is north of Khartoum. It will be quite safe. But Emerson... Pyramids, Peabody. Emerson's deep voice dropped to a seductive baritone growl. Royal pyramids, untouched by any archaeologist. The pharaohs of the 25th dynasty were Nubians, proud, virile soldiers who marched out of the south to conquer the degenerate rulers of a decadent Egypt. These heroes were buried in their homeland of Kush, formerly Nubia, now the Sudan, I know that, Emerson, but after Egypt lost its independence to the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Muslims, a mighty kingdom flourished in Kush, Emerson continued poetically, and a trifle inaccurately. Egyptian culture survived in that far-off land, the same region, as I believe, from which it had originally sprung. Think of it, Peabody, to investigate not only the continuation of that mighty civilization, but perhaps its roots as well. Emotion overcame him. His voice failed, his eyes glazed. There were only two things that could reduce Emerson to such a state. One was the idea of going where no scholar had gone before him, of being the discoverer of new worlds, new civilizations. Need I say that I shared that noble ambition? No. My pulse quickened. I felt reason sink under the passion of his words. One last faint ray of common sense made me murmur, But... But me no buts, Peabody. He grasped my hands in his, those strong, bronzed hands, which could wield pick and shovel more vigorously than any of his workmen, but which were capable of the most sensitive, the most exquisite touch. His eyes held mine. I fancied the brilliant rays of saffirine blue struck from his orbs straight into my dazzled brain. You are with me. You know you are. And you will be with me, my darling Peabody, this winter in Meroe. Rising, he drew me once more into his masterful embrace. I said no more. Indeed, I was unable to say more, since his lips were pressed to mine. But I thought to myself, Very well, Emerson, I will be with you. But Ramses will be at the Academy for Young Gentlemen in Cairo. I am seldom wrong. On those rare occasions when I am wrong, it is usually because I have underestimated the stubbornness of Emerson or the devious wiles of Ramses, nor a combination of the two. In defence of my powers of precognition, however, I must say that the bizarre twist our expedition was to take resulted not so much from our little familial differences of opinion as from a startling development that no one, not even I, could possibly have anticipated. It took place on a wet autumn evening, not long after the conversation I have just described. 
I had a number of reservations about Emerson's projected plans for the winter, and once the euphoria of his persuasive powers had subsided, I was not shy of expressing them. Though the northern Sudan was officially pacified and under Egyptian occupation as far south as Dongola, only an idiot would have assumed that travel in the region was completely safe. The unfortunate inhabitants of the area had suffered from war, oppression and starvation. Many were homeless, most were hungry, and anyone who ventured among them without an armed escort was practically asking to be murdered. Emerson brushed this aside. We would not venture among them. We would be working in a region under military occupation with troops close by. Furthermore, some of his best friends... Having resigned myself to accept his plans, and I will admit that the thought of pyramids, my consuming passion, had some effect, I hastened to complete our arrangements for departure. After so many years, I had the process down to a routine, but additional precautions and many extra supplies would be necessary if we were to venture into such a remote region. Of course, I had no help whatever from Emerson, who spent all his time poring over obscure volumes on what little was known of the ancient inhabitants of the Sudan, and in long conversations with his brother Walter. Walter was a brilliant linguist who specialised in the ancient languages of Egypt. The prospect of obtaining texts in the obscure and as yet undeciphered Meroitic tongue raised his enthusiasm to fever pitch. Instead of trying to dissuade Emerson from his hazardous project, he actually encouraged him. Walter had married my dear friend Evelyn, the granddaughter and heiress of the Duke of Chalfont. Theirs had been an exceedingly happy union, and it had been blessed with four... No, at the time of which I speak, I believe the number was five children. One tended to lose track with Evelyn, as my husband once coarsely remarked, overlooking, as men are inclined to do, that his brother was at least equally responsible. The young Emersons were staying with us on the evening of which I am about to speak. Greatly as I enjoyed the opportunity to spend time with my dearest friend and a brother-in-law whom I truly esteem, and their five, unless it was six, delightful offspring, I had an additional reason this particular year for encouraging the visit. I had not entirely abandoned hope of persuading Emerson that Ramses should be left in England when we set out on our hazardous journey. I knew I could count on Evelyn to add her gentle persuasion to mine. For reasons which eluded me, she doted on Ramses. It is impossible to give a proper impression of Ramses by describing his characteristics. One must observe him in action to understand how even the most admirable traits can be perverted or carried to such an extreme that they cease to be virtues and become the reverse. At that time, Ramses was ten years of age. He could speak Arabic like a native, read three different scripts of ancient Egyptian as easily as he could read Latin, Hebrew, and Greek, which is to say, as easily as English, sing a wide variety of vulgar songs in Arabic, and ride almost anything with four legs. He had no other useful skills. He was fond of his pretty, gentle aunt, and I hoped she could help persuade him to stay with her that winter. The presence of his cousins would be an inducement. Ramses was fond of them, too, although I am not certain the feeling was reciprocated. I had gone off to London that day with less trepidation than I usually felt when leaving Ramses, because it was raining heavily, and I assumed Evelyn would insist that the children remain indoors. I had strictly forbidden Ramses to conduct any chemical experiments whatever, or continue his excavations in the wine cellar, or practice knife-throwing in the house, or show little Amelia his mummified mice, or teach his cousins any Arabic songs. There were a number of other things, I forget them now, but I felt reasonably sure I had covered everything. I was therefore able to pursue my errands with a mind at ease, though the same could not be said about my body. The cold smoke that hangs over London 
had combined with the rain to form a blackish smut that clung to clothing and skin, and the streets were ankle-deep in mud. When I got off the train late that afternoon, I was glad to see the carriage waiting. I had arranged to have most of my purchases shipped, but I was loaded with parcels and my skirts were wet to the knee. The lights of a manor house shone warm and welcoming through the gathering dusk. How joyfully I looked forward to my reunion with all those I loved best, and to lesser but nonetheless pleasant comforts, a hot bath, a change of clothing, and a cup of the beverage that cheers but does not inebriate. Feeling the chill of wet feet and clinging skirts, I reflected that I might instead indulge in the beverage that does inebriate, but only when taken in excessive quantities, which I never do. There is, after all, nothing so effective in warding off a cold than a stiff whisky and soda. Gargery, our excellent butler, had been watching for the carriage. As he assisted me to remove my wet outer garments, he said solicitously, "'May I venture to suggest, madam, that you take something to ward off a cold? I will send one of the footmen upstairs with it at once, if you like.' "'What a splendid idea, Gargery,' I replied. "'I am grateful to you for suggesting it.' I had almost reached my room before I realised that the house was uncommonly quiet. No voices raised in genial debate from my husband's study. No childish laughter. No... Rose! I cried, flinging open my door. Rose, where... Oh, there you are. Your bath is ready, madam, said Rose, from the open door of the bathroom, where she stood wreathed in steam like a kindly genie. She seemed a trifle flushed. It might have been the warmth of the bath water that had brought the pretty colour to her cheeks. But I had suspected another reason. Thank you, Rose. But I was about to ask, Will you wear the crimson tea gown, madam? She hastened to me and began wrenching at the buttons on my dress. Yes, but where... My dear Rose, you are shaking me like a terrier with a rat. A little less enthusiasm, if you please. Yes, madam, but the bath water will be cold. Having divested me of my gown, she began attacking my petticoats. Very well, Rose. What has Ramses done now? It took me a while to get the truth out of her. Rose is childless. No doubt that fact explains her peculiar attachment to Ramses, whom she has known since he was an infant. It is true that he showers her with gifts, bouquets of my prize roses, bunches of prickly wildflowers, small furry animals, hideous gloves, scarves and handbags, selected by himself and paid for out of his pocket money. But even if the gifts were appropriate, which most are not, they hardly compensate for the hours Rose has spent cleaning up after him. I long ago gave up trying to comprehend this streak of irrationality in an otherwise sensible woman. After Rose had stripped me of my garments and popped me into the tub, she deemed that the soothing effect of hot water would soften me enough to hear the truth. In fact, it was not as bad as I had feared. It seems I had neglected to forbid Ramses to take a bath. Rose assured me that the ceiling of Professor Emerson's study was not much damaged, and she thought the carpet would be all the better for a good washing. Ramses had fully intended to turn off the water, and no doubt he would have remembered to do so. Only the cat, Bastet, had caught a mouse, and if he had delayed in rushing to the rodent's rescue, Bastet would have dispatched it. As a result of his prompt action, the mouse was now resting quietly, its wounds dressed in Ramsay's closet. Rose hates mice. Never mind, I said wearily. I don't want to hear any more. I don't want to know what forced Ramsay's to the dire expedient of bathing. I don't want to know what Professor Emerson said when his ceiling began spouting water. Just hand me that glass, Rose, and then go quietly away. The whiskey and soda had been delivered. 
an application of that beverage internally and of hot water externally eventually restored me to my usual spirits. And when I went to the drawing room, trailing my crimson flounces and looking, I fancy, as well as I have ever looked, the smiling faces of my beloved family assured me that all was well. Evelyn wore a gown of the soft azure that intensified the blue of her eyes and set off her golden hair. The gown was already sadly crushed, for children are drawn to my dear friend as bees are drawn to a flower. She had the baby on her lap, and little Amelia beside her in the maternal clasp of her arm. The twins sat at her feet, mashing her skirts. Raddy, my eldest nephew, leaned over the arm of the sofa where his mother sat, and Ramses leaned against Raddy, getting as close to his aunt's ear as was possible. He was, as usual, talking. He broke off when I entered, and I studied him thoughtfully. He was extremely clean. Had I not known the reason, I would have commended him, for the condition is not natural to him. I had determined not to mar the congeniality of the gathering by any reference to earlier unpleasantness, but something in my expression must have made Emerson aware of what I was thinking. He came quickly to me, gave me a hearty kiss, and shoved a glass into my hand. "'How lovely you look, my dearest Peabody! A new gown, eh? It becomes you!' I allowed him to lead me to a chair. "'Thank you, my dear Emerson. I have had this dress for a year, and you have seen it at least a dozen times, but the compliment is appreciated nonetheless. Emerson, too, was extremely clean. His dark hair lay in soft waves, as it did when it had just been washed. I deduced that a quantity of water, and perhaps plaster, had fallen on his head. If he was prepared to overlook the incident, I could do no less. So... I turned to my brother-in-law, who stood leaning against the mantel, watching us with an affectionate smile. "'I saw your friend and rival, Frank Griffiths, today, Walter. He sends his regards and asks me to tell you he is making excellent progress with the Oxyrhynchus papyrus. Walter looks like the scholar he is. The lines in his thin cheeks deepened, and he adjusted his eyeglasses. "'Now, Amelia, dear,' Don't try to stir up competition between me and Frank. He is a splendid linguist and a good friend. I don't envy him his papyrus. Radcliffe has promised me Meroitic inscriptions by the cartload. I can hardly wait. Walter is one of the few people who is allowed to refer to Emerson by his given name, which he detests. He flinched visibly, but said only, So, you stopped by the British Museum, Peabody? Yes. I took a sip of my whiskey. No doubt it will come as a great surprise to you, Emerson, to learn that Budge also proposes to travel to the Sudan this autumn. In fact, he has already left. Uh, hmm, said Emerson. No, indeed. Emerson considers most Egyptologists incompetent bunglers, which they are, by his austere standards. But Wallace Budge, the keeper of Egyptian and Assyrian antiquities at the British Museum, was his particular bete noire. Indeed, Walter repeated. His eyes twinkled. Well, that should make your winter activities even more interesting, Amelia. Keeping those two from one another's throats. Bah, said Emerson. Walter, I resent the implication. How you could suppose me so forgetful of the dignity of my profession and my own self-esteem. I don't intend to come within throat-grasping reach of the rascal. And he had better stay away from me, or I will throttle him. Always the peacemaker, Evelyn attempted to change the subject. Did you hear anything more about Professor Petrie's engagement, Amelia? Is it true that he is soon to be married? I believe so, Evelyn. Everyone is talking about it. Gossiping, you mean, said Emerson, with a snort. To see Petrie, who was always wedded to his profession and had no time for the softer emotions, fall head over heels for a chit of a girl. They say she is a good twenty years younger than he. Now who is engaging in ill-natured gossip, I demanded. By all accounts, she is an excellent young woman, and he is utterly besotted with her. We must think of a suitable wedding present, Emerson. 
A handsome silver epern, perhaps. What the devil would Petrie do with an epern? Emerson asked. The man lives like a savage. He would probably soak potsherds in it. We were discussing the matter when the door opened. I glanced up, expecting to see that Rose had come to take the children away, for it was approaching the dinner hour. But it was Gargery, not Rose, and the butler's face wore the frown that betokened an unwelcome announcement. There is a gentleman to see you, Professor. I informed him that you did not see callers at this time of day, but he is... He must have urgent reasons for disturbing us, I interrupted, seeing my husband's brows draw together. A gentleman, you said, Gargery? The butler inclined his head. Advancing upon Emerson, he offered the salver on which rested a chaste white calling card. <laughs> said Emerson, taking the card. The Honourable Reginald Forthright. Never heard of him. Tell him to go away, Gargery. No, wait, I said. I think you ought to see him, Emerson. Amelia, your insatiable curiosity will be the death of me, Emerson cried. I don't want to see the fellow. I want my whiskey and soda. I want to enjoy the company of my family. I want my dinner. I refuse. The door, which Gargery had closed behind him, burst open. The butler staggered back before the impetuous rush of the newcomer. Hatless, dripping, white-faced, he crossed the room in a series of bounds and stopped swaying before Walter, who stared at him in astonishment. Professor, he cried, I know I intrude. I beg you to forgive me and to hear me. And then, before Walter could recover from his surprise, or any of us could move, the stranger toppled forward and fell prostrate on the hearth rug. Chapter 2 My Son Lives Emerson was the first to break the silence. Get up at once, you clumsy young ruffian, he said irritably. Of all the confounded impudence... For pity's sake, Emerson, I exclaimed, hastening to the side of the fallen man. Can't you see he has fainted? I shudder to think what unimaginable horror can have reduced him to such straits. No, you don't, said Emerson. You revel in unimaginable horrors. Pray control your rampageous imagination. Fainted indeed. He is probably drunk. Fetch some brandy at once, I ordered. With some difficulty, for the unconscious man was heavier than his slight build had led me to expect, I turned him on his back and lifted his head onto my lap. Emerson folded his arms and stood looking on, a sneer wreathing his well-cut lips. It was Ramses who approached with the glass of brandy I had requested. I took it from him, finding, as I had expected, that the outside of the glass was as wet as the inside. I am afraid some was spilled, Ramses explained. Mama, if I may make a suggestion... No, you may not, I replied. But I have read that it is inadvisable to administer brandy or any other liquid to an unconscious man. There is some danger of... Yes, yes, Ramses, I am well aware of that. Do be still. Mr. Forthright did not appear to be in serious condition. His colour was good, and there was no sign of an injury. I estimated his age to be in the early thirties. His features were agreeable rather than handsome, the eyes wide set under arching brows, the lips full and gently curved. His most unusual physical characteristic was the colour of the hair that adorned his upper lip and his head. A bright, unfashionable but nonetheless striking copper, with glints of gold, it curled becomingly upon his temples. I proceeded with my administrations. It was not long before the young man's eyes opened and he gazed with wonder into my face. His first words were, Where am I? On my hearth rug, said Emerson, looming over him. What a damn... A confounded silly question. Explain yourself at once, you presumptuous puppy, before I have you thrown out. A deep blush stained Forthright's cheeks. You... you are Professor Emerson? One of them. 
Emerson indicated Walter, who adjusted his spectacles and coughed deprecatingly. Admittedly, he more nearly resembled the popular picture of a scholar than my husband, whose keen blue eyes and healthy complexion, not to mention his impressive musculature, suggest a man of action rather than thought. Oh, I see. I beg your pardon for the confusion and for my unpardonable intrusion, but I hope when you hear my story you will forgive and assist me. The Professor Emerson I seek is the Egyptologist whose courage and physical prowess are as famous as are his intellectual powers. Um, <coughs> said Emerson. Yes, you have found him. And now, if you will remove yourself from the arms of my wife, at whom you are staring with an intensity that compounds your initial offence... The young man sat up, as if he had been propelled by a spring, stammering apologies. Emerson assisted him to a chair, that is to say, he shoved him into one, and, with a scarcely less heavy hand, helped me to rise. Turning, I saw that Evelyn had gathered the children and was shepherding them from the room. I nodded gratefully at her and was rewarded by one of her sweet smiles. Our unexpected visitor began with a question. Is it true, Professor, that you are planning to travel in the Sudan this year? Where did you hear that? Emerson demanded. Mr. Forthright smiled. Your activities, Professor, will always be a subject of interest, not only to the archaeological community, but to the public at large. As it happens, I am in an indirect manner connected with the former group, you will not have heard my name, but I am sure you are familiar with that of my grandfather, for he is a well-known patron of archaeological subjects, Viscount Blacktar. Good gad! Emerson bellowed. Mr. Forthright started. Uh, I beg your pardon, Professor? Emerson's countenance, ruddy with fury, might have intimidated any man, but his terrible frown was not directed at Mr. Forthright. It was directed at me. I knew it, Emerson said bitterly. Am I never to be free of them? You attract them, Amelia. I don't know how you do it, but it is becoming a pernicious habit. Another cursed aristocrat. Walter was unable to repress a chuckle, and I confess to some amusement on my own part. Emerson sounded for all the world like an infuriated sans-culotte, demanding the guillotine for the hated Aristos. Mr. Forthright cast an uneasy glance at Emerson. I will be as brief as possible, he began. Good, said Emerson. Uh, but I fear I must give you some background if you are to understand my difficulty. Curse it, said Emerson. My, my grandfather had two sons. Curse him, said Emerson. Uh, my father was the younger. His elder brother, who was, of course, the heir, was Willoughby Forth. Willoughby Forth, the explorer, Emerson repeated, in quite a different tone of voice. You are his nephew, but your name... My father married Miss Wright, the only child of a wealthy merchant. At his father-in-law's request, he added the surname of Wright to his own. Since most people, hearing the combined name, assumed it to be a single word, I found it simpler to adopt that version. How accommodating of you, said Emerson. You don't resemble your uncle, Mr. Forthright. He would have made two of you. His name is familiar. I said. Was it he who proved once and for all that Lake Victoria is the source of the White Nile? No. He clung doggedly to the belief that the Luolaba River was part of the Nile, until Stanley proved him wrong by actually sailing down the Luolaba to the Congo, and thence to the Atlantic. Willoughby Forth's nephew smiled sardonically. That, I fear, was the sad pattern of his life— he was always a few months late or a few hundred miles off. It was his greater ambition to go down in history as the discoverer of 
something, anything. An ambition that was never realised. An ambition that cost him his life, Emerson said reflectively, and that of his wife. They disappeared in the Sudan ten years ago. Fourteen years ago, to be precise. Forthright stiffened. Did I hear someone at the door? I heard nothing. Emerson studied him keenly. Am I to expect another uninvited visitor this evening? I fear so. But pray let me continue. You must hear my story before I beg, Mr. Forthright, that you allow me to be the judge of what must or must not be done in my house, said Emerson. I am not a man who enjoys surprises. I like to be prepared for visitors, especially when they are members of the aristocracy. Is it your grandfather whom you expect? Yes. Please, Professor, allow me to explain. Uncle Willoughby was always the favoured son. Not only did he share my grandfather's archaeological and geographical interests, but he had the physical strength and daring his younger brother lacked. My poor, dear father was never strong. I could tell by Emerson's expression that he was about to say something rude, so I took it upon myself to intervene. Get to the point, Mr. Forthright. What? Oh, yes, I beg your pardon. Grandfather has never accepted the fact that his beloved son is dead. He must be, Professor. Some word would have come back long before this. But no word of his death has come either, Emerson said. Forthright made an impatient gesture. How could it? There are no telegraphs in the jungle or the desert wastes. Legally, my uncle and his unfortunate wife could have been declared dead years ago. My grandfather refused to take that step. My father died last year. Aha, said Emerson. Now we come to the crux of it, I fancy. Until your uncle is declared to be dead, you are not legally your grandfather's heir. The young man met his cynical gaze squarely. I would be a hypocrite if I denied that that is one of my concerns, Professor. But believe it or not, it is not my chief concern. Sooner or later, in the inevitable course of time, I will succeed to the title and the estate. There is, unhappily, no other heir. But my grandfather... He broke off with a sharp turn of his head. This time, there was no mistake, the altercation in the hall was loud enough to be heard even through the closed door. Gargery's voice, raised in expostulation, was drowned out by a sound as loud and shrill as the trumpeting of a bull elephant. The door exploded inward with a shuddering crash, and on the threshold stood one of the most formidable figures I have ever seen. The mental image I had formed of the pathetic, grief-stricken old father shattered like glass in the face of reality. Lord Blacktower, for it could be no other than he, was a massive brute of a man with shoulders like a pugilist's and a mane of coarse reddish hair. It was faded and liberally streaked with grey, but once it must have blazed like the setting sun... He seemed far too young and vigorous to be the grandfather of a man in his thirties, until one looked closely at his face. Like a stretch of sun-baked earth, it was seamed with deep-cut lines, a map of violent passions and unhealthy habits. The suddenness of his appearance and the sheer brute dominance of his presence kept all of us silent for several moments. His eyes moved around the room, passing over the men with cool indifference, until they came to rest on me. Sweeping his hat from his head, he bowed with a grace unexpected in so very large a man. Madam, I beg you will accept my apologies for this intrusion. Allow me to introduce myself, Franklin Viscount Blacktower. Do I have the honour of addressing Mrs. Radcliffe Emerson? Uh, yes, I replied. Mrs. Emerson. 
His smile did not improve his looks, for his eyes remained as cold and opaque as Persian turquoise. I have long looked forward to the pleasure of meeting you. Advancing with a ponderous rolling stride, he extended his hand. I gave him mine, bracing myself for a bone-crushing grip. Instead, he raised my fingers to his lips and planted a loud, lingering, damp kiss upon them. Mm, yes, he mumbled. Your photographs quite fail to do you justice, Mrs. Emerson. I fully expected Emerson would object to these proceedings, for the mumbling and kissing went on for a protracted period of time. There was, however, no comment from that source, so I withdrew my hand and invited Lord Blacktower to take a chair. Ignoring the one I had indicated, he sat down on the couch beside me, with a thud that made me and the whole structure vibrate. There was still no reaction from Emerson, or from Mr. Forthright, who had sunk back into the chair from which he had started when his grandfather burst in. "'May I offer you a cup of tea, or a glass of brandy, Lord Blacktower?' I asked. "'You are graciousness itself, dear madam. "'But I have already taken too great advantage of your good nature. "'Allow me only to explain why I venture to burst in upon you so unceremoniously, "'and then I will remove myself, and my grandson, "'whose presence is the cause, if not the excuse, for my rudeness.' He did not look at Mr. Forthright, but went on with scarcely a pause. I intended to approach you and your distinguished husband through the proper channels, learning by chance this afternoon that my grandson had taken it upon himself to anticipate me. I was forced to act quickly. Mrs. Emerson. He leaned forward and placed his hand on my knee. Mrs. Emerson, my son lives. Find him. Bring him back to me. His hand was heavy as stone and cold as ice. I stared at the veins squirming across the skin like fat blue worms, at the tufts of greyish-red hair on his fingers, and still no objection from Emerson. It was unaccountable. Only maternal sympathy for a parent, driven into madness by the loss of a beloved child, kept me from flinging his hand away. "'Lord Blacktower,' I began. "'I know what you are about to say,' his fingers tightened. "'You don't believe me. "'Reginald there has probably told you that I am a senile old man, "'clinging to an impossible hope. "'But I have proof, Mrs. Emerson. "'A message from my son, containing information only he could know. "'I received it a few days ago. "'Find him.' and anything you ask of me will be yours. I won't insult you by offering you money. That would be a waste of your time, I said coldly. He went on as though I had not spoken, though I would consider it an honour to finance your future expeditions on any scale you might desire, or a chair in archaeology for that husband of yours, or a knighthood, Lady Emerson, eh? His accent had coarsened, and his speech, not to mention his hand, had grown increasingly familiar. However, it was not the insult to his wife, but the implied insult to himself, that finally moved Emerson to speak. You are still wasting your time, Lord Blacktower. I don't buy honours or allow anyone else to purchase them for me. "'The old man let out a rumbling roar of laughter. "'I wondered what it would take to rouse you, Professor. "'Every man has his price, you know. "'But yours? Ah, "'I'll do you justice. "'None of the things I've offered would touch you. "'I've got something I fancy will. "'Here, have a look at this.' "'Reaching into his pocket, he drew out an envelope. "'I rearranged my skirts.' I fancied I could still feel the imprint of his hand burning cold against my skin. Emerson took the envelope. It was not sealed. With the same delicacy of touch he used on fragile antiquities, 
he drew from the envelope a long, narrow, flat object. It was cream-coloured and too thick to be ordinary paper, but there was writing on it. I was unable to make out the words. Emerson studied it in silence for a few moments. Then his lip curled. A most impudent and unconvincing forgery. Forgery? That is papyrus, is it not? It is papyrus, Emerson admitted, and it is yellowed and brittle enough to be ancient Egyptian in origin. But the writing is neither ancient nor Egyptian. What sort of nonsense is this? The old man bared his teeth, which resembled the papyrus in colour. Read it, Professor. Read the message aloud. Emerson shrugged. Very well. To the old lion, from the young lion, greetings. Your son and daughter live, but not long, unless help comes soon. Blood calls to blood, old lion. But if that call is not strong enough, seek the treasure of the past in this place where I await you. Of all the childish... Childish, yes. It began when he was a boy, reading romances and tales of adventure. It became a kind of private code. He wrote to no one else in that way, and no living man or woman knew of it, nor knew that his name for me was the Old Lion. He resembled one at that moment, a tired old lion with sagging jowls and eyes sunk in wrinkled sockets. It is still a forgery, Emerson said stubbornly. More ingenious than I had believed, but a forgery nonetheless. Forgive me, Emerson, but you are missing the point, I said. Emerson turned an indignant look upon me, but I went on. Let us assume that the message is indeed from Mr. Willoughby Forth, and that he has been held prisoner, or otherwise detained, all these years. Let us also assume that some daring couple... Uh, that is to say, some daring adventurer were willing to go to his aid. Where would that adventurer go? A man asking for help ought at least give directions. I, said my husband, was about to make that very point, Amelia. The old man grinned. There is something else in the envelope, Professor. Take it out, if you please. The second enclosure was more prosaic than the first, a single sheet of ordinary writing paper folded several times, but its effect on Emerson was remarkable. He stood staring at it with as much consternation as if it had been a death threat, a form of correspondence, I might add, with which he was not unfamiliar. I jumped up and took the paper from his hand. It was grey with age and dust, tattered with much handling, and covered with writing in the English language. The handwriting was as familiar to me as my own. It looks like a page from one of your notebooks, Emerson, I exclaimed. How on earth did this come into your hands, Lord Blacktower? The envelope and its contents were left on the doorstep of my house in Barclay Square. My butler admitted he had half a mind to pitch it into the trash. Fortunately, he did not. It didn't come through the post, Emerson muttered, inspecting the envelope. So it must have been delivered by hand. By whom? Why didn't the messenger identify himself and claim a reward? I don't know, and I don't care, the old man said irritably. The handwriting on the envelope is my son's. So is the writing on the papyrus. What more proof do you want? Anyone who knew your son and had received a letter from him could imitate his handwriting, I said, gently but firmly. To my mind, the page from my husband's notebook is a far more intriguing clue. But I don't understand what bearing it has on Mr. Forth's disappearance. Turn it over, said Lord Blacktower. I did as he directed. At first glance, the faded lines appeared to be random scribbles, like those made by a small child. From Lord Blacktower's throat came a horrible grating sound. I presumed it was a laugh. 
Are you beginning to remember, Professor Emerson? Was it you or my son who sketched the map? Map? I repeated, studying the scrawl more closely. I remember the occasion, Emerson said slowly. And under the present circumstances, taking into consideration the suffering of a bereaved father, I will make an exception to my general policy of refusing to answer impertinent questions from strangers. I made a little sound of protest for Emerson's tone of voice, especially when he mentioned the suffering of a bereaved father, made the speech even ruder than the words themselves convey. Black Tower only grinned. This is not a map, Emerson said. It is a fantasy, a fiction. It can have no possible bearing on your son's fate. Someone is playing a cruel trick on you, Lord Blacktower, or is planning to perpetrate a fraud. That is precisely what I told my grandfather, Professor, Mr. Forthright exclaimed. Don't be a fool, Blacktower snarled. I couldn't be deceived by an imposter. Don't be so sure, Emerson interrupted. I saw Slatin Pasha in 95, after he had escaped from 11 years' starvation and torture by the Khalifa. I didn't recognize him. His own mother wouldn't have known him. However, that wasn't the kind of fraud I had in mind. How much were you prepared to offer me to equip and undertake a rescue expedition? But you refused to be bribed, Professor. I refused, period, Emerson said. Oh, the devil with this. There is no point in my offering you my advice, because you wouldn't take it. As my family will tell you, Lord Blacktower, I am the most patient of men, but my patience is wearing thin. I bid you good evening. The old man heaved himself to his feet. I, too, am a patient man, Professor. I have waited for my son for fourteen years. He lives. I know it. And one day you will admit that I was right, and you, sir were wrong. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Mrs. Emerson. Don't trouble yourself to ring for the servant. I will let myself out. Come, Reginald. He went to the door and closed it quietly behind him. Goodbye, Mr. Forthright, said Emerson. Let me add one last word, Professor. Be quick about it, Emerson said, his eyes flashing. This may be precisely the sort of filthy game you described, but there is another possibility. My grandfather has enemies. No, you astonish me, Emerson exclaimed. If there is no further communication, if he can't find a qualified man to lead such an expedition, he will go himself. You look sceptical, but I assure you I know him well. He is convinced of the authenticity of this message. Believing that... You said one word, and I have let you utter sixty or seventy. Before I let my grandfather risk his life on such a scheme, I will go, Forthright said quickly. Indeed, if I could believe there was the slightest chance... Confound it, Emerson shouted. Must I evict you bodily? No. The young man backed toward the door, with Emerson following... But if you should change your mind, Professor, I insist upon accompanying you. A very pretty speech, upon my word, Emerson declared, splashing whiskey into his glass with such force that it fountained up onto the table. How dare he suggest I might change my mind? I never change my mind. I suspect he is a more acute judge of character than you give him credit for, Walter said. I, too, detected something in your manner. You haven't been completely candid with us, Radcliffe. Emerson winced. Whether at the unpopular appellation or the implied accusation, I cannot tell. He said nothing. I went to the window and drew the curtain aside. The rain had stopped. Mist veiled the lawn, and carriage lamps glowed through the dark. They were obscured as a shapeless bulk heaved itself between them and my vision. It was Lord Blacktower, mounting into his coach. In his caped coat, wrapped round with wisps of fog, his shape was scarcely human. I had the unpleasant impression that I saw not a man or even a beast, 
but some elemental force of darkness. Hearing the door open, I turned to see Evelyn. The cook is threatening to leave your service if dinner is not served instantly, she said with a smile. And Rose is looking for Ramses. He did not come up with the others. Is he... Ah, oh, there you are, my boy. And there he was indeed, rising up from behind the sofa like a genie from a bottle, or a flagrant eavesdropper from his place of concealment. Irritation replaced my eerie forebodings, and as my son obediently hastened toward his aunt, I said sharply, Ramses, what have you got there? Ramses stopped. He looked like the reverse image of a small saint, for the mop of curls crowning his head was jet black, and the face thus framed, though handsome enough in its way, was as swarthy as any Egyptian's. Got Mamma? Oh! With an air of surprised innocence, he glanced at the paper in his hand. It appears to be the leaf from Papa's notebook. I picked it up from the floor. I did not doubt that in the least. Ramses preferred to tell the truth whenever possible. I had placed the paper on the table, so he must have pushed it off onto the floor before he picked it up. After he had handed over the paper and gone through the lengthy process of saying good night, we made our way to the dining room. I had long since given up trying to prevent Emerson from discussing private family matters in front of the servants. In fact, I had come round to his point of view, that it was a cursed, silly, meaningless custom, for the servants always knew everything that was going on anyhow, and their advice was often helpful, since, on the whole, they had better sense than their purported superiors. I fully expected that he would discuss the extraordinary events that had just taken place. Gargery, our butler, obviously shared this anticipation, though he directed the serving of the meal with his usual efficiency. His face was beaming and his eyes alight. He always enjoyed participating in our little adventures, and the peculiar behaviour of our visitors certainly justified the suspicion that another was about to occur. Conceive of my surprise, therefore, when, after having satisfied the first pangs of hunger by polishing off his soup, Emerson patted his lips with his napkin and remarked, "'Inclement weather for this time of year.' "'Hardly unusual, though,' said Walter, innocently. "'I hope the rain will let up. "'You will have a wet journey home otherwise.' "'Quite,' said Walter. "'I cleared my throat. "'Emerson said hastily, "'And what are you giving us tonight, Peabody?' "'Bah, roast saddle of lamb, and mint jelly. "'I am particularly fond of mint jelly. "'A splendid choice.' "'Mrs Bates is giving us the lamb,' I said, "'as Gargery, visibly pouting, began serving the plates. "'You know I leave the menu to her, Emerson. "'I have no time for such things, "'especially now, with so many extra supplies to order. "'Quite, quite,' said Emerson. "'Mint jelly, sir.' said Gargery, in a voice that ought to have frozen that wobbly substance into a solid chunk. Without waiting for an answer, he proceeded to give Emerson approximately half a teaspoonful. Like his brother, Walter was inclined to ignore conventions, not because he necessarily shared Emerson's radical social theories, but because he forgot all else when professional enthusiasm overcame him. "'I say, Radcliffe,' he exclaimed, that bit of papyrus was quite fascinating. If an ancient Egyptian scribe had known how to write English, the result would have looked precisely like that message. I wish I had had a chance to examine it more closely. You may do so after dinner, I said. By a strange coincidence, and in the haste of his departure, Lord Blacktower forgot to take it with him. Or was it a coincidence, Emerson? "'You know as well as I do that it was deliberate,' Emerson snarled. "'Par devant les domestiques, Peabody, as you are always telling me.' "'Bah,' I replied pleasantly. "'Ramses has probably told Rose all about it by now. "'I know you well, my dear Emerson. "'Your countenance is an open book to me.' 
That supposedly meaningless scrawl on the back of the notebook page had meaning for you. I know it. His lordship knew it. Will you take us into your confidence or force us to employ underhanded means to discover the truth? Emerson glowered at me, at Walter, at Evelyn, and at Gargery, who was standing guard over the mint jelly, his nose in the air and wounded dignity in every lineament of his face. Then Emerson's own face cleared and he burst into a hearty laugh. You are incorrigible, my dear Peabody. I won't inquire what particular underhanded methods you had in mind. In fact, there is no reason why I shouldn't tell you what little I know of the matter. And now, Gargery, may I have more mint jelly? This delicacy having been supplied, Emerson went on. I spoke the truth when I told Black Tower that piece of paper could have no bearing on Forth's fate. Yet it gave me an eerie feeling to see it again after all these years, rather like the hollow voice of a dead man echoing from his tomb. Now who is allowing a rampageous imagination to run away with him? I inquired playfully. Get on with it, Emerson, if you please. First said Emerson. We must tell Evelyn what happened after she left with the children. He proceeded to do so, at quite unnecessary length. Gargery found it most interesting, however. A map was it, sir? he asked, giving Emerson more mint jelly. Take that cursed stuff away, Emerson said, studying the green puddle with loathing. Yes, it was a map, of sorts. Of the road to King Solomon's diamond mines, I suppose, said Walter, smiling. Or the emerald mines of Cleopatra. Or the gold mines of Cush. It was a fantasy almost as improbable, Walter. It is coming back to me now, that strange encounter. The last meeting I ever had with Willie Forth. He paused to give Gargery time to remove the plates and serve the next course before resuming. It was the autumn of 1883, the year before I met you, my dearest Peabody, and a year when Walter was not with me. Having no such engaging distractions, I found myself at loose ends one evening in Cairo and decided to visit a cafe. Forth was there. When he saw me, he jumped to his feet and called my name. He was a great bull of a fellow, with a head of wiry black hair that always looked as if it had not seen scissors or brush for weeks. Well, we had a friendly glass or two. He demanded I drink a toast to his bride, for he had just been married. I ragged him a bit about this unexpected news. He was a confirmed old bachelor of forty-odd, and had always insisted no woman would ever tie him down. He only grinned sheepishly and raved about her beauty, innocence and charm like any infatuated schoolboy. Then we got to talking about his plans for the winter. He was cagey at first, but I could see that something besides marital bliss had fired him up. And after another friendly glass or two, he admitted that his ultimate destination was not Aswan, as he had initially told me, but somewhere farther south. I understand you have excavated at Napata, he said casually. I was unable to conceal my surprise and disapproval. The news from the Sudan was extremely disquieting, and Forth had told me he planned to take his wife with him. He brushed my objections aside. The worst of the trouble is in the Kordofan, hundreds of miles from where I mean to go, and General Hicks is on his way there. He'll settle those fellows before we reach Wadi Halfa. Turning to the butler, he explained, Wadi Halfa is at the second cataract, Gargery, several hundred miles south of Aswan. Yes, sir, thank you, sir. And that other place, Napata? Hmm, well, said Emerson, there has been some debate about that. The Kushites, or Nubians, had two capitals. Meroe, the second and later of the two, was near the sixth cataract, just north of Khartoum. 
Its ruins have been visited and identified. We have a fairly good idea of where Napata, the earlier capital, was situated, because of the pyramid cemeteries in the area. But its exact location is uncertain. Well, we all know what happened to Hicks. His army was annihilated by the Mahdi, Gargery, contrary to all expectations except mine. Word of that disaster did not reach Cairo until after Forth had left. All I could tell him that night was that I had visited a site I believed to be Napata, and that, to put it mildly, it was not the spot I would have chosen for a honeymoon. You surely don't mean to take your bride to a primitive, fever-ridden, dangerous place like that, I demanded. Forth was feeling the effects of four or five friendly glasses. He gave me a drunken grin. Farther than that, Emerson, much farther. Merrily, it's even more remote and dangerous than Jebel Barkle. You're mad, Forth. And you're still off the mark, Emerson, Forth leaned forward, planting both elbows on the filthy table and fixed me with burning eyes. I felt like the wedding guest, and indeed, as he went on, I would not have been surprised to see the albatross hung about his neck. What happened to the royalty and nobility of Meroe after the city fell? Where did they go? You've heard the Arab legends about the sons of Kush who marched toward the setting sun, westward through the desert to a secret city. Stories, legends, fictions, I exclaimed. They are no more factual than the tales of Arthur being carried off to the Isle of Avalon by the three queens, or Charlemagne sleeping under the mountain with his knights. All the Homeric legends of Troy set forth. I swore at him. And at Heinrich Schliemann, whose discoveries had encouraged lunatics like my friend. Forth listened, grinning like an ape and fumbling in the pockets of his coat for a pipe, as I thought. Instead, he took out a small box and handed it to me, inviting me with a sweeping gesture to lift the lid. When I did so... Peabody, do you remember the Fellini collection in the Berlin Museum? Caught unawares by the question, I started to shake my head and then exclaimed, The jewellery brought back from Meroe by Fellini half a century ago? Quite. Emerson whipped a pencil from his pocket and began to draw on the tablecloth. Gargery, who was familiar with this habit of Emerson's, and with my reaction to it, deftly inserted a piece of paper under the pencil. Emerson finished his sketch and handed the paper to Gargery, who, after inspecting it closely, handed it round the table like a platter of vegetables. "'What I saw in the box was a gold armlet. Emerson continued. "'The designs, consisting of Uriah, Diamond shapes and lotus buds were inlaid with red and blue enamel. Walter frowned at the paper. I have seen a lithograph of a piece of jewellery resembling this, Radcliffe. In Lepsius's Dinkmailer, Emerson replied. Or perhaps the official guide to the Berlin Museum, 1894 edition. An armlet of the same type with similar decoration was found by Fellini at Meroe. I saw the resemblance at once, and my first reaction was that Forth's armlet must also have come from Meroe. The natives have been plundering the pyramids ever since Fellini's time, hoping to find another treasure trove. Yet the cursed thing was in virtually pristine condition. A few scratches here and there, a few dents... And the enamel was so fresh it might have been newly made. It had to be a modern forgery. But what forger would use gold of such purity it could be bent with one's fingers? I asked Forth where he had got it, and he proceeded to tell me a preposterous story about being offered the piece by a ragged native who offered to lead him to the source of such treasures. A source far in the western deserts in a secret oasis, where there were huge buildings, like the temples of Luxor, 
and a strange race of magicians who wore golden ornaments and performed blood sacrifices to demonic gods. Emerson shook his head. You can imagine how I jeered at this absurd story, all the more so when he told me that the unfortunate native had suffered from a fever to which he succumbed a few days later. My arguments had no effect on Forth. He was drinking quite heavily, and when I finally gave up my attempt to dissuade him from his lunatic plan, I could see he was in no condition to be left alone. Late at night, in that district, he would have been robbed and beaten. So I offered to escort him to his hotel. He agreed, saying he was anxious to introduce me to his wife. She had waited up for him, but she had not anticipated he would bring a stranger with him. She was wrapped in some sort of fluffy white stuff, all trembling with lace and ruffles. Part of her bridal get-up, I suppose. An exquisite creature, looking no more than eighteen. Great misty blue eyes. Hair like a fall of spun gold. Skin white as ivory. And cold. An ice maiden with no more human warmth than a satchel. They made a bizarre contrast forth with his ruddy, beaming face and mane of black hair, his wife all white and silvery pale, beauty and the beast personified. I thought of that flowery white skin of hers, baked and scourged by blowing sand, of her gleaming hair dried by the sun, and by heaven, Peabody, I felt only the regret one might feel at seeing a work of art disfigured. No human pity at all. She would have received none. She would have felt none. No. The pity I felt was for Willie Forth. The idea of taking a frozen statue like that into one's arms, into one's... Um, <clears throat> you understand me, Peabody. I felt myself blushing. Yes, Emerson, I do. Yet one can't help but feel for her. She can have had no idea of what she was about to experience. I tried to tell her. Forth had collapsed onto the bed and lay snoring with both hands clenched over the box that contained the armlet. I spoke to her like a brother, Peabody. I told her she was mad to go. That he was madder to let her. I might have been speaking to a chryselephantine statue. At last she intimated that my presence displeased her, so I left, and I am sorry to say I slammed the door behind me. That was the last I saw of either of them. But the map, Emerson, I said, when did you... Oh, Emerson coughed. That, well, curse it, Peabody, I'd had a few friendly drinks myself, and I'd been reading some of the medieval Arabic writers. The Book of Hidden Pearls? Emerson grinned sheepishly. Confound you, Peabody. You're always a step or two ahead of me. It's that rampageous imagination of yours. But there is often a germ of truth in the most fantastic of legends. I am quite willing to believe that there are unknown oases in the western desert, far to the south of the known oases of Egypt. Wilkinson names three. In his book published in 1835, he had heard about them from the Arabs. The people of Dakla, one of the best-known oases in southern Egypt, tell tales of strangers, tall black men who came out of the south. And El Bekri, who wrote in the 11th century, described a giantess who was captured at Dakhla. She spoke no known language, and when she was released, so that her captors could not track her to her home, she outran them and escaped. Fascinating, Evelyn breathed. But the Book of Hidden Pearls? Ah, there we enter into pure legend. Emerson said, smiling affectionately at her. It is a magical work written in the 15th century, containing stories of buried treasure. One such location 
is in the white city of Zerzura, where the king and queen lie asleep on their thrones. The key to the city is in the beak of a bird carved on the great gate, but you must take care not to wake the king and queen if you want the treasure. That is simply a fairy tale, Walter said critically. Of course it is, but Zerzura is mentioned in other sources. The name probably derives from the Arabic Zaza, meaning sparrow, so Zerzura is the place of the little birds. And there are other stories, other clues. Emerson's face took on the pensive, dreamy look few of his acquaintances are privileged to see. He likes to be thought of as a strictly rational man who sneers at idle fancies. But in reality, the dear fellow is as sensitive and sentimental as women are purported to be. Though in my experience, women are far more practical than men. Are you thinking of Harkoof? Walter asked. It is true that that mystery has never been solved. At least, not to my satisfaction. Where did he go on those expeditions of his to procure the treasures he brought back to Egypt? Golden ivory and the dancing dwarf that so delighted the child king he served. Then there are Queen Hatshepsut's voyages to Punt. Punt doesn't enter into it, Emerson said. It must be somewhere on the Red Sea coast, east of the Nile. As for Harkouf, that was over 4,000 years ago. He may have followed the Darb el Arbayan. There, you see the fascination of such idle speculation? We speculated and had those friendly drinks and drew meaningless lines on a piece of paper. If Forth was fool enough to follow that so-called map, he deserves the unpleasant death that undoubtedly came to him. Enough of this. Peabody, why are you sitting there? Why haven't you risen from your chair to indicate that the ladies wish to retire? This question was meant to provoke me. Emerson knew quite well that the custom to which he referred was never followed in our house. We will all retire, I said. Walter hastened to open the door for me. It is an odd coincidence, though, he said innocently. The dervish uprising had just begun when Mr. Forth disappeared. Now it appears to be almost over, and the message arrives. Walter! Don't be so naive. If fraud is contemplated, the timing is no coincidence. The news of Slatin Pasha's escape after all those years in captivity may well have inspired some criminal mind. He broke off with a choking sound. The blood rushed into his cheeks. I knew what he was thinking. I always know what Emerson is thinking, for the spiritual bond that unites us is strong. The dark shadow of the master criminal, our old nemesis, would always haunt us. Me especially, since I had, much to my astonishment, for I am a modest woman, inspired an intense passion in that warped but brilliant brain. No, Emerson, it cannot be. Remember his promise that never again would he... The promise of a snake like that is worth nothing, Peabody. This is just the sort of scheme. Remember your promise, then, Emerson, that never again would you... Oh, curse it, Emerson muttered. Though she did not, at least I hoped she did not, know whereof we spoke, Evelyn tactfully introduced another subject. Explain to me, dear brother, what it is you hope to accomplish at Meroe. "'and why you can't work in Egypt as you have always done. "'It terrifies me to think of you and Amelia running such risks.' "'Emerson responded, though he kept tugging at his collar "'as if it were choking him. "'To all intents and purposes, ancient Kush is an unknown civilization, Evelyn. "'The only qualified scholar who visited the site was Lepsius, "'and he could do little more than record what was there in 1844.' That is the most important task awaiting us, to make accurate records of the monuments and inscriptions before time and treasure hunters destroy them completely. Especially the inscriptions, Walter said eagerly. 
The script is derived from Egyptian hieroglyphs, but the language has not been translated. When I think of the rate at which the records are vanishing, never to be recovered, I am tempted to come with you. You and Amelia cannot possibly... At this... Evelyn let out a cry of alarm and clutched at Walter's arm as if he were about to depart instantly for Africa. Emerson reassured her in his usual tactful fashion. Walter has grown soft and flabby, Evelyn. He wouldn't last a day in Nubia. A strict course of physical training, that is what you need, Walter. If you work hard at it this winter, I may allow you to accompany us next season. In such animated and pleasant domestic intercourse, the next hour passed. Both men had asked permission to smoke their pipes, permission which was, of course, granted. Evelyn was too kind to refuse anyone she loved, and I would never dream of attempting to prevent Emerson from doing anything he liked in his own drawing-room, though I have been forced upon occasion to request that he postpone a particular activity until a more appropriate degree of privacy could be attained. At last I went to the window to admit a breath of fresh air. The clouds had cleared away and moonlight spread its silvery softness across the lawn. As I stood admiring the beauty of the night, for I am particularly fond of nature, a sharp cracking sound broke the dreaming peace it was followed in rapid succession by a second and a third. I turned. My eyes met those of Emerson. Poachers, said Walter lazily. It's a good thing young Ramses is asleep. He'd be out that door. Emerson, moving with panther-like quickness, was already out that door. I followed, delaying only long enough for a quick explanation. Not poachers, Walter. Those shots came from a pistol. Stay here with Evelyn. Hitching up my crimson flounces, I sped in pursuit of my husband. He had not gone far. I found him on the front lawn, gazing out into the darkness. I see nothing amiss, he remarked. From what direction did the sounds come? We were unable to agree on that question. After a rather brisk discussion, in the course of which Emerson firmly negated my suggestion that we separate in order to search a wider area more quickly, we set out in the direction I had suggested, toward the rose garden and the little wilderness behind it. Though we investigated the area carefully, we found nothing out of the way, and I was about to accede to Emerson's demand that we wait until morning before pursuing the search when the sound of a wheeled vehicle came to our ears. "'That way!' I cried, pointing. "'It is only a farmer's wagon going to market,' Emerson said. "'At this hour?' I started across the lawn toward the belt of trees that bounds our property on the north. The grass was so wet it was impossible for me to attain my usual running speed in fragile evening shoes, and Emerson soon forged ahead, ignoring my demands that he wait for me. When I caught him up, he had passed through the gate in the brick wall, which constitutes a side entrance to the estate, and was standing still, staring down at something on the ground. Turning, he put out his arm and held me back. Stop, Peabody. That's one of my favourite frocks. I would hate to see it ruined. What? I began. But there was no need to finish the question. We were on the edge of the belt of trees. A narrow track used by carts and farm vehicles ran along the side of the wall. On the beaten earth, the pool of liquid was black as ink in the moonlight, which stroked its surface with tremulous silver fingers. But the liquid was not ink. By daylight, it would be another colour entirely the same shade as my bright crimson skirts. Chapter 3. He promised all the ladies many sons. 
With the conspicuous absence of intelligence that marks the profession, our local constabulary refused to believe that murder had been committed. They agreed with me that no living creature could have survived the loss of such a quantity of the vital fluid. All the more reason they declared to assume that the crime had been perpetrated against one of the lower animals and was therefore not a crime, or at least not the crime of murder. When I pointed out that poachers seldom employ hand weapons, they only smiled politely and shook their heads, not at this self-evident fact, but at the idea that a mere female could have distinguished between the different sounds, and inquired even more politely why my hypothetical murderer should have removed the body of his victim. They had me there, for no body had been found, nor even a trail of bloodstains. Clearly the perpetrator had carried it away by means of a cart or wagon, the sound of whose wheels Emerson and I had heard. But I was forced to admit that without a corpus delecti, my case was considerably weakened. Emerson did not support me with the ardour I had every right to expect. He was particularly annoyed by my suggestion that the fatality was in some way connected with the fourth family. I am sure the reader will agree with this conclusion, as any sensible person would. Two mysterious events on the same evening cannot be unrelated, yet it appeared that they were. Inquiries which I insisted upon making resulted in the discovery that both Lord Blacktower and his grandson were in perfect health and at a loss to understand my concern. The Viscount also took pleasure in telling me that no one had approached him demanding money for information or for equipping a rescue expedition. He seemed to think this was proof Emerson's analysis of the message had been mistaken. But to me it made the situation even more baffling. Certainly, if fraud had been intended, further communications were to be expected. But the same was true if the appeal was genuine. How had the message got from wherever it was to London? And why did not the messenger make himself known to the recipient? And what bearing, if any, had the ghastly puddle in the lane upon the matter? As for the documentary evidence, the scrap of papyrus and the page from Ebison's notebook... Closer examination confused the situation even more. The papyrus was ancient. Traces of an earlier text could be seen under the modern writing. This phenomenon was of frequent occurrence in ancient Egypt, for papyrus was expensive and was often erased so that it could be reused. Pieces of ancient papyrus were, I regret to say, easily obtained by any traveller to Egypt, Similarly, the page from Emerson's notebook might have come into the possession of a person or persons unknown. Emerson admitted that he could not remember what had happened to it. Forth might have put it in his pocket, or he might have left it on the café table. The case, such as it was, appeared to have reached a dead end. Even I could think of nothing more to do. I decided, reluctantly, to abandon it especially since other problems were trying Emerson's temper to the utmost. Emerson likes to think that he is the master of his fate and the lord of all he surveys. It is a delusion common to the male sex and accounts for the sputtering fury with which they respond to the slightest interference with their plans, no matter how impractical those plans may be. Being ruled by men, most women are accustomed to irrational behaviour on the part of those who control their destinies. I was therefore not at all surprised when Emerson's plans received their first check. Instead of advancing toward Khartoum, the Egyptian expeditionary force settled into winter quarters at Merawi. Not to be confused with Meroe, which is several hundred miles farther south. Rather than resign himself to the inevitable, as a woman would do, Emerson wasted a great deal of time trying to think of ways to get around it. He also refused to accept the obvious arguments against working in a region where food was scarce and trained workmen were in exceedingly short supply. If we could find something to feed them, 
we would have workers enough, he growled, puffing furiously on his pipe. These stories about congenital laziness of the Sudanese are only European prejudice. I don't see how we can manage it, though. All transport south of Wadi Halfa is controlled by the military. We can hardly commandeer a railway carriage, load it with supplies. He fell silent, his eyes brightening as he considered this idea. Not without being somewhat conspicuous, I replied dryly. You would also have to commandeer an engine to pull the carriage, and wood to stoke the boiler, and an engineer, among other necessities. No, I fear the idea is impractical. We must give it up, Emerson, for this year at least. By next autumn, our brave lads will have taken Khartoum and wiped out the stain of dishonour that has soiled the British flag since we failed to succour the gallant Gordon. Gallant nincompoop, said Emerson. He was sent to evacuate Khartoum, not squat like a toad in a puddle, daring the Mahdi to come and murder him. Well, well, perhaps it is all for the best. Even if the country were pacified, it has suffered greatly. Not a fit place for our boy. Hardy, though he is. Ramses does not enter into it, I replied. He will be at school in Cairo. Where shall we excavate then, Emerson? It is only one place, Peabody. Napata. Napata? Jebel Barkel, near Merawi. I am convinced it is the site of the first capital of Kosh which flourished for six hundred years before the Kushites moved up river to Meroe. Budge is already there, curse him, Emerson added, clenching his teeth so violently on the stem of his pipe that a cracking sound was heard. What he is doing to the pyramids I dare not think. Poor Mr. Budge was at fault because he had had the audacity to be already in the Sudan. It was no use for me to point out that he had only done what Emerson himself would have done, given the opportunity. That is, accept an invitation from the British authorities. Invitation, my... Emerson would roar, employing language that made me clap my hands over my ears. He invited himself. He bullied, pushed and toadied his way into going. Good Gad, Peabody, by the time that blackguard finishes, there won't be one stone left on another in Nubia. And he will have stolen every portable antiquity in the country for his cursed museum. And so on, at considerable length. Though, as a rule, I attempted to defend Mr. Budge against Emerson's more unreasonable complaints, I was a trifle out of sorts with him myself. A dispatch sent through military channels boasted of his making the arduous journey from Cairo to Kerma in only ten and one-half days. I knew too well what the effect of this claim would be on my irascible spouse. Emerson would insist on bettering Budge's record. The first stage from Cairo to Aswan was one we had made many times and I anticipated no particular difficulty there. So it proved, but Aswan, which had been a sleepy little village, was now transformed into a vast depot for military supplies. Though we received every courtesy from Captain Pedley, he was tactless enough to tell Emerson he ought not allow his wife to travel into such a desolate and dangerous region. Allow? Emerson repeated. Allow, did you say? Though scarcely less annoyed, I thought it best to change the subject. One must recognise the limitations of the military mind, as I later pointed out to Emerson. After a certain age, somewhere in the early twenties, I believe, it is virtually impossible to insert any new idea whatever into it. Since travel by boat through the tumultuous rocky rapids of the first cataract is hazardous, we had to leave the steamer at Aswan and take the railroad to Shalol, at the south end of the cataract. There we were fortunate enough to find passage on a paddle-wheeler. The captain turned out to be an old acquaintance of Emerson's. 
A good many of the inhabitants of Nubia turned out to be old acquaintances of Emerson's. At every wretched little village, where the steamer took on wood for the boiler, voices would hail him. Assalamu alaikum, Emerson Effendi. Mahaba, O oh, father of curses. It was flattering, but somewhat embarrassing, especially when the greetings came, as they did upon one occasion, from the painted lips of a female individual inadequately draped in a costume that left little doubt as to her choice of profession. Our quarters on the steamer, though far from the standards of cleanliness upon which I normally insist, were commodious enough, Despite the inconveniences and the awkwardness I have referred to earlier, I greatly enjoyed the trip. The territory south of Aswan was new to me. The rugged grandeur of the scenery and the ruins lining the banks proved a constant source of entertainment. I took copious notes, of course, but since I plan to publish an account elsewhere, I will spare the reader details. One side must be mentioned, however. No one could pass by the majestic temple of Abu Simbel without a word of homage and appreciation. Thanks to my careful planning and the amiable cooperation of Emerson's friend, the captain, we came abreast of this astonishing structure at dawn, on one of the two days each year when the rays of the sun, lifting over the eastern mountains, strike straight through the entrance into the farthest recesses of the sanctuary and rest like a heavenly flame upon the altar. The effect was awe-inspiring, and even after the sun had soared higher and the arrow shaft of golden light had faded, the view held us motionless at the rail of the boat. Four giant statues of Ramses the Second guard the entrance, greeting with inhuman dignity the daily advent of the god to whom the temple was dedicated, as they have done morning after morning for almost three thousand years. Ramses stood beside us at the rail, and his normally impassive countenance showed signs of suppressed emotion as he gazed upon the mightiest work of the monarch whose namesake he was. In fact, he had been named for his uncle Walter. His father had proposed the nickname for him when he was an infant, claiming that the child's imperious manner and single-minded selfishness suggested that most egotistical of pharaohs. The name had stuck, for reasons which should be apparent to all readers of my chronicles. But what, you may ask, was Ramses doing at the rail of the steamer? He should have been in school. He was not in school because the Academy for Young Gentlemen in Cairo had been unable to admit him. That is the word the headmaster used, unable. He claimed they had no room for another boarder. This may have been so. I had no means of proving it was not. I cannot conceive of any other reason why my son should not have been admitted to a school for young gentlemen. I do not speak ironically, though anyone who has read certain of my comments concerning my son may suspect I do. The fact is Ramses had improved considerably in the past few years. Neither that, or I was becoming accustomed to him. It is said that one can become accustomed to anything. He was at this time ten years old, having celebrated his birthday late that summer. Over the past few months he had shot up quite suddenly, as boys do, and I had begun to think he might one day have his father's height, though probably not the latter's splendid physique. His features were still too large for his thin face, but just lately I had discovered a dent or dimple in his chin, like the one that lent Emerson's handsome countenance such charm. Ramses disliked references to this feature as much as his father resented my mentioning his dimple, which he preferred to call a cleft, if he had to refer to it. I am bound to admit that the boy's jet-black curls and olive complexion bore a closer resemblance to a young Arab, of the finest type, than an Anglo-Saxon. But that he was a gentleman, by birth at least, no one could deny. 
a distinct improvement in his manners had occurred, due in large part to my untiring efforts, though the natural effects of maturation also played a part. Most small boys are barbarians. It is a wonder any of them live to grow up. Ramses had lived, to the age of ten at least, and his suicidal tendencies seemed to have decreased. I could therefore contemplate his accompanying us with resignation, if not enthusiasm, especially since I had little choice in the matter. Emerson refused to join me in bringing pressure to bear on the headmaster of the Academy for Young Gentlemen. He had always wanted to take Ramses with us to the Sudan. I put my hand on the boy's shoulder. Well, Ramses, I hope you appreciate the kindness of your parents in providing you with such an opportunity. Impressive, is it not? Ramses' prominent nose quivered critically. Ostentatious and grandiose, compared with the temple of Deir el Bahri. What a dreadful little snob you are, I exclaimed. I do hope the antiquities of Napata would measure up to your exacting standards. He is quite right, though, said Emerson. There is no architectural subtlety or mystery in a temple like that. Only size. The temples of Jebel Barkel, on the other hand. Temples, Emerson? You promised me pyramids. Emerson's eyes remained fixed on the façade of the temple, now fully illumined by the risen sun and presenting a picture of great majesty. Um, to be sure, Peabody, but we are limited in our choice of sites, not only by the cussed military authorities, but by... by... by a certain individual whose name I have sworn not to pronounce... It was I who had requested he abstain from referring to Mr. Budge if he could not do so without swearing. He could not. Unfortunately, I could not prevent others from referring to Budge. He had preceded us, and everyone we met mentioned him, hoping, I suppose, to please us by claiming an acquaintance in common. Ramses distracted Emerson by climbing up on the rail, thus prompting a stern lecture on the dangers of falling overboard. I rewarded my son with an approving smile. There had never been any danger of his falling. He could climb like a monkey. With such distractions and a few animated arguments about archaeological matters, the time passed pleasantly enough until we disembarked at Wadi Halfa. Halfa, as it is now commonly termed, was once a small cluster of mud huts. But in 1885, after the withdrawal of our forces from Khartoum, it was established as the southern frontier of Egypt. It had now become a bustling depot of supplies and arms for the forces farther south. Following the advice of the young military officer whom I consulted, I purchased quantities of tinned food, tents, netting, and other equipment. Emerson and Ramses had wandered off on some expedition of their own. On this occasion, I did not complain of their dereliction, for Emerson does not get on well with military persons, and Captain Buckman was a type of young Englishman who particularly annoyed him. Prominent teeth, no chin to speak of, and a habit of tossing his head when he laughed in a high-pitched whinny. He was a great help to me, though, and full of admiration for Mr. Budge, whom he had met in September. Quite a regular chap, not like your usual archaeologist, if you take my meaning, ma'am. I took his meaning. I also took my leave, with appropriate thanks, and went in search of my errant family. As I had come to expect, Emerson had a number of old acquaintances in Halfa. It was at the home of one of them, Sheikh Mahmoud el Araba, that we were to meet. The house was palatial by Nubian standards, built of mud brick around a high-walled central courtyard. I had braced myself for an argument with the doorkeeper, for these persons often tried to take me to the harem instead of into the presence of the master of the house. But on this occasion the old man had evidently been warned. 
He greeted me with salams and repeated cries of Marhaba, welcome, before escorting me into the salon. Here I found the sheikh, a white-bearded but hearty man, and my husband, seated side by side on the mastaba bench along one wall. They were smoking nargilis, water pipes, and watching the performance of a young female who squirmed around the room to the undulating beat of an orchestra consisting of two drummers and a piper. Her face was veiled. The same could not be said of the rest of her. Emerson sprang to his feet. Peabody, I had not expected you so soon. So I see, I replied, returning the dignified greetings of the sheikh and taking the seat he indicated. The orchestra continued to wail, the girl continued to squirm, and Emerson's high cheekbones took on the colour of a ripe plum. Even the best of men exhibit certain inconsistencies in their attitude toward women. Emerson treated me as an equal. I would have accepted nothing less in matters of the intellect, but it was impossible for him to conquer completely his absurd ideas about the delicate sensibilities of the female sex. The Arabs, for all their deplorable treatment of their own women, showed far more common sense in their treatment of me. Having decided that I ranked as a peculiar variety of female man, they entertained me as they would any masculine friend. When the performance ended, I applauded politely, somewhat to the surprise of the young woman. After expressing my appreciation to the sheikh, I inquired, "'Where is Ramses? We must be on our way, Emerson. I left instructions for the supplies to be delivered to the quay, but without your personal supervision.' "'Yes, quite,' said Emerson. "'You had better fetch Ramses, then. He is being entertained by the ladies, or vice versa.' "'Oh, dear,' I said, hastily rising. "'Yes, I had better fetch him, and,' I added in Arabic, "'I would like to pay my compliments to the ladies of your house.' "'And,' I added to myself, "'I would also have a word with the young woman "'who had, I suppose she would have called it, danced for us. "'I would have felt myself a traitor to my sex "'if I had missed any opportunity "'to lecture the poor oppressed creatures of the harem "'on their rights and privileges.' Though heaven knows we English women were far from having attained the rights due us. An attendant led me through the courtyard, where a fountain trickled feebly under the shade of a few sickly palm trees, and into the part of the house reserved for the women. It was dark and hot as a steam bath, for even the windows opening into the courtyard were covered with pierced shutters lest some bold masculine eye behold the forbidden beauties within. The sheikh had three of the four wives permitted him by Muslim law and a number of female servants, concubines, to put it bluntly. All of them were assembled in a single room, and I heard them giggling and exclaiming in high-pitched voices long before I saw them. I expected the worst, Ramsey's Arabic is extremely fluent and colloquial. But then I realised that his was not among the voices I heard. At least he was not entertaining them by telling vulgar jokes or singing rude songs. When I entered the room, the ladies fell silent, and a little flutter of alarm ran through the group. When they saw who it was, they relaxed, and one, the chief wife, by her attire and her air of command, came forward to greet me. I was used to being swarmed over by the women of the harems. Poor things, they had little enough to amuse them, and a Western woman was a novelty indeed. On this occasion, however, after glancing at me, they turned their attention back to something. Or, as I suspected, someone hidden from me by their bodies. The heat... The gloom, the stench of the strong perfumes used by the women, and the aroma of unwashed bodies those perfumes strove to overcome, were familiar to me. But I seemed to smell some other underlying odour, something sickly sweet and subtly pervasive. 
It may have been that strange scent that had made me forget courtesy. It may have been the uncertainty as to what was happening to my son. I pushed the women aside so I could see. A rug or matting woven in patterns of blue and red-orange, green and umber, had been spread across the floor. On it sat my son, cross-legged, with his cupped hands held out in a peculiarly rigid position. He did not turn his head. Facing him was the strangest figure I had ever seen, and I have seen a great many strange individuals. At first glance, it appeared to be a folded or crumpled mass of dark fabric, with some underlying structure of bone or wood jutting out at odd angles. My reasoning brain identified it as a squatting human figure. My mother's heart felt a thrill of fear bordering on horror when my eyes failed to find a human countenance atop the angular mass. Then the upper portion of the object moved. A face appeared, covered with a heavy veil, and a deep murmurous voice intoned, Silence, silence, the spell is cast. Do not wake the sleeper. The elder wife came to my side. She put a timid hand on my arm and murmured, He is a magician of great power, Sitakim, like yourself. An old man, a holy man. He does the boy honor. You will not tell, my lord. There is no harm in it, but... The old sheikh must be an indulgent master, or the women would not have dared introduce a man, however old or holy, into their quarters. But he would be forced to take notice of such a flagrant violation of decency if someone like myself brought it to his attention. I whispered a reassuring, Kai Matahash, it is good, do not fear. Though, as far as I was concerned, it was not at all good. I had seen such performances in the souks of Cairo. Crystal gazing or scrying is one of the commonest forms of divination. It is all nonsense, of course, what the viewer sees in the crystal ball or pool of water, or, as in this case, liquid held in the palm of the hand, is nothing more than a visual hallucination. But the deluded audience is firmly convinced that the diviner is able to foretell the future and discover hidden treasure. Often a child is employed by the fortune teller in the naive belief that the innocence of youth is more receptive to spiritual influences. I knew that to interrupt the ceremony would be not only rude but dangerous. Ramses was deep in some sort of unholy trance from which he could be roused only by the voice of the magician, who now leaned forward over the boy's cupped hands, mumbling in a voice so low I could not make out the words. I did not blame the poor, bored women for allowing the ceremony, or even the seer, who undoubtedly believed sincerely in his own hocus-pocus. However, I was not about to stand idly by and wait upon the latter's convenience. Very softly, I remarked, As is well known, I, the Sithakim, am also a magician of great power. I call upon this holy man to bring back the soul of the boy to his body, lest the afrits, demons, I have set to protect my son, mistake the holy man's purpose and eat up his heart. The women gasped in delighted horror. There was no immediate reaction from the holy man, but after a moment he straightened and moved his hands in a sweeping gesture. The words he addressed to Ramses were unfamiliar to me. Either he spoke some unknown dialect, or they were meaningless magical gibberish. The result was dramatic. A shudder ran through the stiff frame of Ramses. His hands relaxed, and a dribble of dark liquid poured into the cup the magician held below them. The cup vanished into some hidden pocket in the crumpled robe, and Ramses turned his head. Good afternoon, Mamma. I hope I have not kept you waiting. 
I managed to repress my comments through the long and tedious process of leave-taking, first of the ladies and then of the sheikh, who insisted upon escorting us to the very door of the house, the highest honour he could pay us. Not until we were standing in the dusty street and the door had closed behind us did I let the words burst forth. I was considerably agitated, and Emerson had to ask me to stop and elaborate on the story several times before the full meaning of it dawned on him. "'Of all the confounded nonsense!' he exclaimed. "'What were you thinking of, Ramses, to allow such a thing?' "'It would have been rude to refuse,' said Ramses. "'The ladies had set their hearts on it.' Emerson burst out laughing. You are becoming quite a gallant, my boy. But you must learn that it is not always wise or safe to indulge the ladies. Upon my word, you take this very lightly, Emerson, I exclaimed. I imagine it was curiosity rather than gallantry that induced Ramses to try this experiment, Emerson replied, still chuckling. It is his most conspicuous character trait, and you will never change it. Just be thankful that this adventure, unlike so many earlier ones, turned out to be harmless. I hope you are right, I muttered. Nothing worse than dirty hands, Emerson went on, inspecting the palms Ramses held out. They were brightly stained and still damp. I snatched out a handkerchief and began wiping them. The stuff came off more readily than I had expected, but I caught a whiff of that same odd scent I had smelled before. I threw the handkerchief away. A toothless street beggar pounced on it. As we walked on, Emerson, who suffers from a certain degree of curiosity himself, questioned Ramses about his experience. Ramses said it had been most interesting. He claimed to have been fully conscious throughout and to have heard everything that was said. However, his responses to the questions of the seer were made without his own volition, like hearing another person speak. It was mostly about having babies, he explained seriously. Male babies. He promised all the ladies many sons. They seemed pleased. Huh, I said. The next stage of our journey was made by rail. Along the line laid with such remarkable rapidity from Halfa to Kerma, thus avoiding the rocks of the second and third cataracts. This part of the trip tried even my strength. We had been given the best accommodations available, a battered ramshackle railroad coach affectionately known as Yellow Maria, which had been built for Ismail Pasha. It had come down in the world since then, most of the window glass was missing, and on the sharp curves and steep gradients of the roadbed, it swayed and rattled so violently that one expected it to bounce off the track. The engines were old and in poor repair. Blowing sand and overheating necessitated frequent stops for repairs. By the time we reached our destination, Ramsey's was a pale shade of pea-green, and my muscles were so stiff I could hardly move. Emerson, however, was in fine fettle. Men have it so much easier than women. They can strip down to a point that is impossible for a modest female, even one so unconventional as I. I have always been an advocate of rational dress for women. I was one of the first to imitate the scandalous example of Mrs. Bloomer, and the full knee-length trousers I was accustomed to wear on the dig, anticipated by several years, the bicycling costumes daring English ladies eventually adopted. Fashions in sport and in costume had changed, but I retained my trousers, which I had had made in a variety of cheerful colours that would not show the effects of sand and dust, as did navy blue and black. With the addition of a neat cotton shirtwaist, long-sleeved and collared, of course, a pair of stout boots, a matching jacket, and a wide-brimmed boater, this made up a costume as becoming and modest as it was practical. During the dreadful train ride, I had ventured to unfasten the top two buttons of my shirt and turn up my cuffs. 
Emerson had, of course, abandoned his coat and cravat as soon as we left Cairo. Now his shirt gaped open to the waist, and his sleeves had been rolled above his elbows. He wore no hat. After assisting me to alight from the carriage, he took a deep breath of the steaming, stifling, sand-laden air and exclaimed, "'The last stage! We will soon be there, my darling Peabody! Isn't this splendid?' I had not the strength to do more than glare at him. However, I am nothing if not resilient, and a few hours later I was able to share his enthusiasm. A troop of Sudani soldiers, which included several of Emerson's acquaintances, had removed our luggage and helped us set up our tents. We had declined with thanks the offer of the harassed captain in charge of the encampment to share his cramped quarters after assuring us that there would be places for us on the steamer leaving next day. He bade us farewell and bon voyage with obvious relief. As the sun sank rapidly in the west, Emerson and I strolled hand in hand along the river bank, enjoying the evening breeze and the brilliance of the sunset. The silhouettes of the palm trees stood black and shapely against the glory of gold and crimson. We were not alone. A troop of curious villagers trailed us. Whenever we stopped, they stopped, squatted on the ground and stared with all their might. Emerson always attracts admirers, and I had become more or less used to it, though I did not like it. I hope Ramses is all right, I said, turning to look at the rapidly dimming outline of the tent where he slept. He was most unlike his normal self, hardly a word out of him. "'You said he was not feverish,' Emerson reminded me. "'Stop fussing, Amelia. The train ride was tiring, "'and even a gritty little chap like Ramses must feel its effects.' "'The sun dropped below the horizon, "'and night came on with startling suddenness, "'as it does in those climes. "'Stars sprang out in the cobalt vault of the heavens, "'and Emerson's arm stole around my waist.' It had been a long time since we had enjoyed an opportunity for connubial exchanges of even a modest nature, but I felt bound to protest. They are watching us, Emerson. I feel like some poor animal in a cage. I decline to perform for an audience. Bah, Emerson replied, leading me to a large boulder. Sit down, my dear Peabody, and forget our audience. It is too dark for them to observe our actions, and if they should, they could hardly fail to find them edifying, inspiring even. For instance, this. It certainly inspired me. I forgot the staring spectators until a strengthening glow of silvery light illumined the beloved features so close to mine. The moon had risen. Oh, curse it, I said, removing Emerson's hand from a particularly sensitive area of my person. It was a refreshing interlude, though, Emerson said with a chuckle. Reaching into his pocket, he took out his pipe. Do you mind if I smoke, Peabody? I really did not approve of it, but the soft moonlight and the stench of tobacco smoke recalled tender memories of the days of our courtship, when we faced the sinister mummy in the abandoned tombs of Amarna. No, I don't mind. Do you remember Amarna? And the... The time I set my... Uh, myself on fire by neglecting to knock the ashes out of my pipe before I put it in my pocket? And you let me do it, even though you knew perfectly well... Emerson burst out laughing. Do you remember the first time I ever kissed you? Lying flat on the floor of that cursed tomb, with a maniac shooting at us? It was only the expectation of imminent death that gave me the courage to do it. I thought you detested me. I remember that moment, and many others, I replied with considerable emotion. Believe me, my darling Emerson, 
that I am fully cognizant of the fact that I am the most fortunate of women. From first to last, it has been outstanding. And the best is yet to come, my dearest Peabody. His strong brown hand closed over mine. We sat in silence, watching the moonlight spread silvery ripples across the dark surface of the river. So clear and bright was the illumination that one could see for a considerable distance. The rock formations are extremely regular, I remarked, so much so that one might wonder whether they are not, in fact, the ruins of ancient structures. They may well be, Peabody. So little has been done in the way of excavation here. So much needs to be done. My colleagues, curse them, are more interested in mummies and treasure and impressive monuments than in the slow, tedious acquisition of knowledge. Yet this region is of vital importance, not only for its own sake, but for the understanding of Egyptian culture. Not far from this very spot are the remains of what must have been a fort, or a trading post, or both. Within its massive walls were stored the exotic treasures brought as tribute to the pharaohs of the Egyptian empire. Gold and ostrich feathers, rock crystal and ivory, and leopard skins. He pointed with the stem of his pipe toward the moonlight lying like a white path along the river and across the sand. The caravans went there, Peabody, into the western desert, through the oases, toward the land called Yam in the ancient records. One such caravan route may have gone west from Elephantine, Aswan as it is today. A series of wadis run westward from this very region. They are dried up canyons today, but they were cut by water 3,000 years ago. He fell silent. Gazing at his stern, strong profile, I felt a sympathetic thrill, for he seemed to be looking not across distance, but across time itself. No wonder he felt a kinship with the bold men who had braved the wilderness so many centuries before. He too possessed the unique combination of courage and imagination that leads the noblest sons and daughters of humanity to risk all for the sake of knowledge. With all due modesty, I believe I may claim that I possess those qualities myself. The bond of affection that unites me and my dear Emerson left me no doubt of the direction in which his thoughts were tending. Into those distances, so deceptively cool and silver-white in the moonlight, had gone Willoughby forth, and his beautiful young bride, never to return. However, in addition to courage, imagination, etc., I also possess a great deal of common sense. For a time I had, I admit it, entertained a romantic notion of going in search of the missing explorer. But now I had seen with my own eyes the dreadful desolation of the western desert. I had felt the burning heat of the day and the deadly chill of darkness. It was impossible that anyone could have survived in that arid waste for fourteen long years. Willoughby Forth and his wife were dead, and I had no intention of following them, or allowing Emerson to do so. A shiver passed through my frame. The night air was cold. Our audience had vanished, as silently as shadows. It is late, I said softly. Shall we? By all means. Emerson jumped to his feet. At that moment... The quiet air was rent by a weird, undulating cry. I started. Emerson laughed and took my hand. It is only a jackal, Peabody. Hurry. I feel a sudden, urgent need for something only you can supply. Oh, Emerson, I began. And I said no more, because he was pulling me along at such a pace I lost my breath. Our tents had been placed in a small grove of tamarisk trees. Our boxes and bags were piled around them. 
Theft is almost unknown among these so-called primitive people, and Emerson's reputation was enough to deter the most hardened of burglars. I was startled, therefore, to see something moving, a slight white shape slipping through the trees with an unpleasantly furtive motion. Emerson's night vision is not as keen as mine, and perhaps he was preoccupied with the subject he had mentioned. Not until I shouted, Halt! Who goes there? Or something to that effect, did he behold the apparition. For so it appeared, pale and silently gliding. As one man, figuratively speaking, we leapt upon it and bore it to the ground. An all-too-familiar voice exclaimed in plaintive protest. With a loud oath, Emerson struggled to his feet and raised the fallen form to its feet. It was Ramsay's, looking quite ghostly in the white native robe he wore as a nightshirt. "'Are you injured, my boy?' Emerson asked in faltering accents. "'Have I hurt you?' Ramsay's blinked at him. "'Not intentionally, Papa, I am sure. "'Fortunately, the ground is soft. "'May I venture to ask why you and Mamma knocked me down?' "'A reasonable question,' Emerson admitted. "'Why did we, Peabody?' "'Having had the breath knocked out of me by the fall, "'I was unable to reply at once. "'Observing my state, Emerson considerately assisted me to rise.' but he took advantage of my enforced silence to continue. I hope you understand, Peabody, that the question was not meant to imply criticism, but only inquiry. I reacted instinctively, as I hope I will always do, my dear, when you have need of my assistance. Did you see or hear something I failed to observe that prompted such impetuous activity? Normally, I would have resented this cowardly attempt to put the blame on me. So typical of the male sex, from Adam on down. But to be honest, I was as bewildered as he. No, Emerson, I confess I did not. I too reacted instinctively, and I am at a loss to explain why. I had the strangest feeling, a premonition of danger, of... Never mind. "'Emerson said hastily. "'I know those premonitions of yours, Peabody, "'and with all respect I prefer not to discuss them.' "'Well, but it was only natural "'that seeing someone prowling around our stores "'I should assume the worst. "'Ramses ought to have been asleep. "'Ramses, what were you... "'Oh!' "'The answer seemed self-evident, "'but it was not the one Ramses gave.' You called me, Mamma. You called me to come, and of course I obeyed. I did not call you, Ramses. But I heard your voice. You were dreaming, Emerson said. What a touching thing, eh? Peabody, dreaming of his Mamma, and even in sleep, obedient to her slightest command. Come along, my boy. I will tuck you in. With a meaningful glance at me, he pushed Ramses into the tent and followed after. I knew he would sit by the boy until he had fallen asleep. Emerson is somewhat self-conscious about being overheard, especially by Ramses, when he and I are actively demonstrating the deep affection we feel for one another. Instead of retiring to prepare for this activity, I lingered in the shadows of the trees, gazing all around. Moonlight sifted through the leaves and formed strange silvery hieroglyphs upon the ground. The night was not silent. Sounds of activity came from the direction of the military base, where the barges were being loaded for the morning's departure. And from across the river, lonely as the cry of a lost and wandering spirit, came the mournful call of a jackal. Four days later, after an uncomfortable but uneventful voyage, we saw a ruddy mountain loom over the tops of the palm trees. It was Jebel Barkle, the holy mountain of the Nubian kingdom. We had reached our destination.
Chapter 4. Stone Houses of the Kings If I have not done so already, I should make it clear that Napata is not a city, but an entire region. In modern times, several towns and villages occupy the site. Marawi, or Meroe, was the best known. It is a confusing name, resembling so closely that of Meroe, the second of the ancient capital cities of Kush, which is much farther south. Across from Marawi, on the opposite bank of the Nile, was the headquarters of the frontier field force of the Egyptian army, near the small village of Sanam Abu Dom. The encampment stretched along the river for over a mile, tents neatly aligned in a manner that clearly betrayed the presence of British organisation. Emerson was unimpressed by this demonstration of efficiency. Curse them, he growled, surveying the scene with a scowl. They have put their cursed camp smack on top of a ruined temple. There were column bases and carved blocks here in 82. You weren't planning to excavate here, I reminded him. The pyramids, Emerson. Where are the pyramids? The steamer edged in toward the quay. All over the place, Emerson replied, somewhat vaguely. The main cemeteries are at Nuri, several miles upstream from here, and Kuru, on the opposite bank. There are three groups of pyramids near Jebel Barkal itself, as well as the remains of the great temple of Amun. The sandstone mass of Mount Barkal was an impressive sight. It is, as we later determined, only a little over 300 feet high, but because it rises so abruptly from the flat plain, it looks higher. Late afternoon sunlight turned the rock a soft crimson and cast fantastic shadows, like the weathered remains of monumental statues across the face. With some difficulty, I persuaded Emerson that it would be courteous, not to say expedient, to announce ourselves to the military authorities. What do we need them for? he demanded. Mustafa, is everything arranged? Mustafa flashed me a broad grin. He had been the first to greet us when we disembarked, and his followers had promptly set to work unloading our baggage. Emerson had introduced him as Sheikh Mustafa Abd Rabu, but he certainly lacked the dignity one associates with that title. He was no taller than I and thin as a skeleton. His dirty, ragged robe flapped wildly about his body as he performed a series of respectful bows to Emerson, to me, to Ramses, and again to Emerson. His wrinkled face showed the mixture of races that distinguishes this region. The Nubians themselves are of the brown race, with wavy black hair and sharply cut features. But from time immemorial, they have intermarried with Arabs and with the black peoples of Central Africa. I could not see Mustafa's hair, for it was covered by an extravagant turban, once white in colour, but white no longer. I returned Mustafa's smile. It was impossible to be aloof. He seemed so very respectful and so very glad to see us. However, I felt bound to express some reservations. Where are they taking our luggage? I asked, indicating the men who were already trotting away, heavily laden, and with an energy one does not expect to find in warmer climes. Mustafa has found a house for us, Emerson replied. Mustafa beamed and nodded. He was so very agreeable. I hated to cast cold water on the scheme, but I had the direst suspicions of what Mustafa would consider a suitable house. No man of any race or nationality has the least notion of cleanliness. Humming in the tuneless baritone expressive of high good humour, Emerson led me along the path toward the village. From a distance it looked quite charming, surrounded by palm trees and boasting a number of houses built of mud brick. Other huts, commonly known as tuhuls, were built of palm branches and leaves interwoven on a wooden framework. Mustafa, trotting along beside us, kept up a running commentary, amusingly like that of a tourist guide. That large, impressive house was occupied by General Rundle. The pair of tuhuls near it was the headquarters of the intelligence service. That hut had belonged to the Italian military attaché. And then to the British Museum, gentlemen. 
said Emerson, setting a faster pace. Is Mr. Budge still there? I asked. That is what we must determine, Emerson growled. I am determined to stay as far away from Budge as I possibly can. I will not settle on a site until I find out where he is working. You know me, Peabody. I go to great lengths in order to avoid controversy and confrontations. Hmm, I said. One unexpected and welcome feature of the village was a small market operated by Greek merchants. The mercantile instincts of these fellows never cease to amaze me. They are as bold as they are businesslike, moving into an area right on the heels of the fighting men. I was delighted to find that I would be able to procure tinned food and soda water, fresh-baked bread, soap, and all kinds of pots and cutlery. Emerson found several old acquaintances here, and while he was engaged in friendly banter with one of them, I had leisure to look around me. I hope I am no ignorant tourist. I had become accustomed to the wide diversity of racial and national types that are to be found in Cairo, but I had never seen such a variety as in this remote corner of the world. The complexions ranged from the white of the English soldier, more sickly yellow than white, and often bright red with heat, through all the shades of brown, tan and olive to a shining blue-black. Handsome, hawk-faced Bedouin rubbed elbows with Sudani women, draped in bright-coloured cottons. Bisharin tribesmen, whose hair was oiled and braided into small, tight plaits, mingled with ladies of the stricter Muslim sects, hidden by dusty black draperies that left only their eyes exposed. Particularly interesting to me were a pair of tall, handsome men jingling with ornaments and topped with hair the size, colour and consistency of black mops. They were Bagara, from the distant province of Kordofan, the earliest and most fanatic of the Mahdi's followers. This extravagant and characteristic hairstyle had won them the affectionate nickname of Fuzzy Wuzzies from the British troops whom they had fought with such desperate and often successful ferocity. I have never been able to understand how men can feel affection for individuals who are intent on massacring them in a variety of unpleasant ways, but it is an undeniable fact that they can and do. Witness the immortal verses of Mr. Kipling... So here's to you, Fuzzy Wuzzy, at your home in the Sudan. You're a poor, benighted heathen, but a first-class fighting man. One can only accept this as another example of the peculiar emotional aberrations of the male sex. And the variety of languages. I understood Greek and Arabic, and had learnt a little Nubian, but most of the babble was in dialects I could not identify, much less understand. Emerson finally finished exchanging tall stories with his friend and turned to me. Yusuf says he can find some workers for us. We had better go on and... Ramses, where the devil has he got to? Peabody, you were supposed to keep an eye on him. I could have pointed out that it was impossible to keep track of Ramses by keeping one eye on him. The task required one's total attention and a firm hand on the collar. Before I could do so, Yusuf said in Arabic, The young Effendi went that way. Muttering, Emerson plunged off in the direction Yusuf had indicated, and I followed. We soon found the miscreant. He was squatting in front of one of the booths, engaged in animated conversation with a man wrapped in a voluminous robe or mantle, a fold of which had been drawn over his head to protect it from the sun. Emerson bellowed, Ramses! Whereupon Ramses jumped up and turned to face us. In his hand he held a short wooden skewer, upon which were impaled chunks of meat, whose origin I could not and did not care to determine. He waved it at me, swallowed the mouthful he had been chewing, and began, Mama and Papa, I have just found a most interesting... So I see, said Emerson. Assalamu alaikum, friend. The man had also risen, 
with a slow dignity that verged on arrogance. Instead of touching brow, breast and lips in the traditional Arabic greeting, he inclined his head slightly and lifted his hands in a curious gesture. "'Greetings, Emerson Effendi, and to the lady of your house, good health and life.' "'You speak English?' I exclaimed. "'A few words, lady.' He shrugged out of the mantle, which was nothing more than a long strip of cloth, and laid the folds across his shoulders like a shawl. Under it he wore only a pair of loose, knee-length trousers, which displayed to excellent advantage his lean, athletic form and sinewy limbs. On his feet were red leather sandals with long, upward-curving toes. Such sandals were a mark of distinction among the Nubians, most of whom went barefoot. But this man was no ordinary Nubian, though his skin was a dark reddish-brown. His chiselled, regular features bore a sudden resemblance to those of the Bagara, but his black hair was cut close to his head. "'He speaks a most interesting dialect, which is unfamiliar to me,' Ramsay said. "'I could not resist asking him where—' "'We will discuss your inability to resist interesting dialects later, Ramses. I said, and throw away that... It was too late. The skewer was bare. The tall man repeated his gesture. I go now. Farewell. Inclining his head, he addressed a brief speech to Ramses in a language that was unfamiliar to me. Ramses, however, had the audacity to nod, as if he had understood it. What did he say? I demanded, taking hold of Ramses. "'Don't tell me you learned enough of the language in five minutes to—' "'You are about to contradict yourself, Amelia,' said Emerson, "'watching with furrowed brow the dignified yet brisk retreat of Ramsay's new acquaintance. "'If he has not learnt enough of the language to understand what was said, he can't tell you.' Uh, "'What did he say, Ramsay's?' "'Ramsay's shrugged. "'looking as enigmatic as any Arab master of that annoying gesture. "'I am sorry, Papa. "'I am sorry, Mamma, that I wandered off. "'I will not do it again.' "'Come along, come along,' said Emerson, "'before I could express the incredulity this promise naturally provoked. "'We have delayed too long and lost our guide. "'However, we need only continue along the path, "'on the other side of the market, Yusuf said.' I say, Peabody, one could hardly blame Ramses for being intrigued. I have never heard that dialect, and yet a word or two in the last speech was oddly familiar. He is not a Begara, then? Definitely not. I know something of that speech. Some of the people of the Upper White Nile are tall and well-built. The Dinka and Shiluk, for example. He may be from that region. Ah, well, we had better get on. Ramses, stay close to your mamma. The accommodations Yusuf had found were about what I had expected, that is, uninhabitable by humans. There were certainly rats in the palm leaf roof, and the insect life was varied and aggressive. I requested the men to pitch our tents, tactfully explaining that we would reserve the hut for storage, and then, finally, I got Emerson to agree to call on the authorities. We took Ramses with us, though he did not want to come, claiming he preferred to stay with the men and improve his knowledge of Nubian dialects. However, Ramses perked up when Emerson announced his intention of calling on Slatin Pasha, who was assisting the intelligence department. I myself looked forward to meeting this astonishing man, whose adventures had become the stuff of legend. Rudolf Karl von Slatin was Austrian by birth, but like a number of European and English military men, he had spent most of his life in the East. When the Mahdi overran the Sudan, Slatin was serving as governor of Darfur, the province to the west of Khartoum. Though he fought gallantly against overwhelming odds, he was finally forced to surrender, and for eleven years he was held prisoner under conditions so appalling that only courage and will could have kept him alive. His most terrible experience occurred after the capture of Khartoum, when, as he sat in chains upon the ground, 
a party of Mahdist soldiers approached him, carrying some object wrapped in a cloth. Gloating, the leader unwrapped the cloth to display the head of Slatin's friend and leader, General Gordon. He finally made good his escape, and those who saw him shortly afterwards said he looked like a withered old man of eighty. Imagine then my surprise when we were shown into the presence of a stout, hearty, red-cheeked gentleman who rose politely from his chair to bow over my hand. He and Emerson greeted one another with the familiarity of old acquaintances, and Slatin asked how he could help us. We were warned of your coming, but frankly, I could hardly believe. Why not? Emerson demanded. You ought to know that when I say I will do something, I do it. As for Mrs. Emerson, she is even more bold, uh, determined than I. I have heard a great deal about Mrs. Emerson, Slatin said, smiling, and about this young man. Assalamu alaikum, Master Ramses. Ramses promptly replied, O alaikum es salam wa rahmet ala wa rabakatu, kef halak? And with you be peace and God's mercy and blessing. How is your health? And went on in equally fluent Arabic, But my own eyes inform me, sir, that it is excellent. I am surprised to see how very stout you are after the privations you endured at the hands of the followers of the Mahdi. Ramses! I exclaimed. Slatin bellowed with laughter. Don't scold him, Mrs. Emerson. I am proud of my girth, for every pound represents a triumph of survival. I would very much like to hear of your adventures, Ramses said. One day, perhaps... At the moment, I am fully occupied gathering reports from men who have returned from enemy territory. Intelligence, he added, addressing Ramses, whose fixed stare he probably took for boyish admiration, is the nerve network of any army. Before we begin the next stage of the campaign, we must find out all we can about the strength and disposition of the Khalifa's forces. If that's your excuse for going into winter quarters instead of continuing to Khartoum, began Emerson. Our excuse is that we wish to save lives, Professor. I don't want to lose a single brave man through stupidity or lack of preparation, <clears throat> said Emerson, who could hardly deny the sense of this. Well then, to business. You are a busy man and so am I. Upon inquiry, Slatin told us that Mr. Budge had already investigated the pyramid fields of Nuri, Kuru, Tankasi, and Zuma, and was now working at Jabal Barkal. There is or was a temple of considerable size there, Slatin said. Mr. Budge believes it was built by the pharaoh Pianchi. Mr. Budge doesn't know what he is talking about. Emerson interrupted. He turned to me. Good gad, Peabody, can you believe it? Four separate cemeteries in a few months. And now he is ransacking the temple, scooping up objects for his blood. His precious museum. Curse it. We must go there at once. I'll run him off before he can do any more damage or my name. Now, Emerson, remember your promise, I said in some alarm. You said you intended to stay away from Mr. Budge. But curse it, Peabody. Pyramids, Emerson. You promised me pyramids. So I did, Emerson grumbled. Very well, Peabody. Where shall it be? Slatin had followed the exchange with open-mouthed interest. You make the decisions, Mrs. Emerson? Emerson's brow darkened. He is a trifle sensitive about being considered henpecked. Before he could comment, I said smoothly, My husband and I have discussed the subject at length. He is making a courteous gesture, that is all. We had agreed on Nuri Emerson, had we not? In fact, the decision was not a difficult one. The only thing that could have kept me from Nuri was learning that Budge was there. 
Norway had a number of advantages. In the first place, it was ten miles away from the military base. That made it inconvenient from the point of view of fetching supplies, but the distance reduced the chances of unpleasant encounters with Mr. Budge and with the army. In the second place, the reports I had read, by Lepsius and others, made me suspect that the Nuri tombs were the oldest, and hence the most interesting, dating, as they might, from the period of the Nubian conquest of Egypt in 730 B.C. They were also more solidly built, being of cut stone throughout, instead of a mere outer layer of stone over a core of loose rubble. "'It makes no difference to me,' Emerson said, moodily. It was therefore decided that we would leave the following morning, which gave me the rest of the afternoon to shop and make arrangements for transport. Slatin informed us that the trip across the desert by camel required approximately two hours, but he recommended that we go by water instead, even though it would take longer. Camels were very hard to find, owing to the devastation wrought by the rebels and the fact that the army had first call on them. After I had appealed to him as a gentleman and a scholar, he promised to do all he could to help us. Men are very susceptible to flattery, especially when it is accompanied by simpers and fluttering lashes. Fortunately, Emerson was still brooding on the sins of Mr. Budge, and did not interfere. In fact, it was after noon the next day before we got under way. Washing the camels took longer than I had anticipated. Where Yusuf had found them, I did not ask, but they were a sorry-looking group of animals, which had obviously never been under the care of the officer in charge of the military camels. I had had a most interesting chat with this gentleman. He operated a kind of hospital for ailing animals outside the camp, and I was pleased to find that his views on the care of animals agreed with mine. I had had the same problem with donkeys while in Egypt. The poor beasts were shamefully overloaded and neglected, so I had made it a policy to wash the donkeys and their filthy saddle cloths as soon as they came under my care. Captain Griffith was good enough to give me some of the lotions and medicines he used, and most efficacious they proved. However, camels, like other animals, including human beings, are not always aware of what is good for them, and the ones Yusuf supplied did not take kindly to being washed. I had become fairly expert at dealing with donkeys, but washing a camel is a much more complicated procedure owing in part to the greater size of the latter animal, and in part to its extremely irascible disposition. After some futile experiments, which left everyone except the camel quite wet, I finally worked out a relatively effective procedure. I stood upon a temporary platform of heaped-up sand and stone blocks, with my bucket of water and lye soap, and my long-handled brush, while six of the men endeavoured to restrain the camel by means of ropes attached to its limbs and neck. It would have been hard to say which made the most racket, the camel or the men holding it, for despite my best endeavours, some of the soapy water splashed onto them. However, this was all to the good, for some of them needed washing too. I must add that the procedure would have gone more smoothly had Emerson condescended to help me instead of collapsing in helpless mirth. The pyramids of Nuri stand on a plateau a mile and a half from the river bank. The sun was sinking westward when we came within sight of them, and their shadows formed grotesque outlines across the barren ground. My heart sank with the sun. I had studied the work of Lepsius, and I ought to have been prepared for the dismal reality, but hope will ever triumph over fact in my imagination. Some of the pyramids still stood relatively intact, but they were pathetic substitutes for the great stone tombs of Giza and Dashur. Most were only tumbled piles of stone, with no sign of a pyramid shape. The whole area was strewn with fallen blocks and heaps of debris. It would take weeks, perhaps months, of arduous labour to make sense of the plan, even if we had had the necessary number of workers. I had hoped to find a tomb chapel or other structure that could be converted into a residence, but my sand and sun-strained eyes searched in vain for any such convenience. 
The temperature was approximately 100 degrees Fahrenheit. The camel's jolting gait had reduced my muscles to jelly, and blowing sand had scoured the skin from my face and seeped into every crevice of my clothing. I turned a look of bitter reproach, for my throat was too parched for speech, on my husband, who had ignored the sensible advice of the military authorities and insisted on travelling by camel instead of waiting until we could hire a boat. Impervious to my distress, Emerson urged his camel to kneel. Dismounting with the agility of a boy half his age, his face beaming, he hastened to me and addressed the camel upon which I perched. Adaya Yan, come along now, you heard me. Adaya Yan, I say. The cursed camel, which had grumbled and protested every order I had given it, promptly obeyed Emerson. Those among my readers who are acquainted with the habits of camels know that they lower the front end first. Since they have extraordinarily long limbs, this procedure tilts their bodies to a considerable degree. Stiff and exhausted, caught unawares by the quickness of Emerson and the camel, I slid down the slope and fell to the ground. Emerson picked me up and dusted me off. "'Quite all right, are you, Peabody?' he asked cheerfully. "'We'll pitch our tents there, between those two southernmost pyramids, don't you think? "'Quite. Come along, Peabody, don't dawdle. It'll be dark soon. "'Mohammed, Ahmed, Ramses!' "'Spurred by his enthusiasm and his friendly curses, "'and no doubt by the desire for food, rest and water, "'the men began to unload the camels. "'I leaned against mine, which had lowered its back section and lay upon the sand. It turned its head to look at me. I cleared my throat. Don't even think of it, I said hoarsely. The camel coughed in the irritating way they have and looked away. Some water from the small canteen attached to my belt restored me to my usual self, and I hastened to assist Emerson. After I had pointed out that he had picked the wrong place for the camp and found a better one, matters went smoothly. By the time the sun had sunk below the western hills, I was able to retire to the privacy of a tent and remove my sandy, perspiration-soaked garments. The relief was indescribable. When I emerged, I found Emerson and Ramses sitting cross-legged on a bit of carpet. A small fire crackled merrily, some distance away was the fiery glow of a larger fire, and I could hear the cheerful voices of the men and smell dinner cooking. Emerson quickly jumped up and led me to a chair, placing a glass in my hand. The cool night breeze stirred the damp tendrils of my hair. The vault of heaven blazed with stars that cast a mystical glow along the sides of the pyramid. Feeling like a queen enthroned, Surrounded by kneeling courtiers, I sipped my whiskey and opened my senses to the allure of the desert wastes. And when Emerson sighed deeply and remarked, Ah, my dear Peabody, life cannot hold any greater charm than this. I was forced to agree that he was right. We began next morning to make key plans of the pyramids. A certain amount of excavation was necessary to establish, as far as was possible, the original dimensions. But our main focus, as Emerson insisted, was that of recording. Since my dear Emerson's real passion is digging things up, this was a sign of his genuine concern for scholarship over treasure hunting. After comparing the plans of Lepsius, drawn in 1845, with what remained, I was shocked to find how much the monuments had deteriorated in half a century. Finding traces of recent and hasty excavation at the base of the best preserved of the pyramids, Emerson blamed all of the depredation on Budge. But as I pointed out, even Budge could not have done so much damage in a few hours. Time and the treasure-hunting instincts of the local villagers must be partially responsible. From these villages, scattered along the riverbank, we procured our workers, and being old hands at organising excavations, we soon had a routine worked out. 
the men were divided into three groups, under the command of Emerson, myself, and Ramses. I must admit that Ramses was a great help, though I soon got tired of hearing Emerson congratulate himself on insisting the boy come with us. Ramses, of course, was in his element, and it was rather amusing to hear his shrill voice shouting out orders in his extremely colloquial Arabic and increasingly fluent Nubian. His linguistic abilities impressed the men, who had been inclined at first to treat him with the same amused tolerance they showed their own progeny. By the end of the work week, we had a pretty fair idea of the general plan of the site. A pyramid of considerable size must once have dominated the area. It had completely collapsed, and additional work would be necessary to determine its original dimensions. In front of it, in a rough semicircle, were four smaller pyramids, with another row of ten pyramids to the southeast. Lepsius's original plan showed a number of smaller, shapeless masses of stone clustered west and north of the Great Pyramid, and scattered at random among the others. We found ten such mounds not shown on his map. At that point, we were forced to break off work for the inevitable day of rest. Our men were Muslims. Most of the Hanafi sect. Their holy day was, of course, Friday. Emerson was all for continuing the work without them, pointing out with perfect truth that the surveying itself required no more than three people. However, I persuaded him that we also deserved, if not a day of rest, at least a brief period spent at the camp and the nearby market. We needed supplies, more camels, and, if possible, more workers. We had offered to let our men leave on the Thursday evening, but they refused with thanks and with a great shuffling of feet and sidelong glances. They were afraid of gin and ghosts, which, as all men knew, came out in the dusk. So the following morning they all scattered to their villages and we set out for the camp. In the relative cool of the morning the ride was pleasant enough, and as we drew near Sanam Abudom, the view of the great mountain across the river became increasingly impressive. I was particularly struck by several oddly shaped rock formations that resembled the great statues of Ramses II at Abu Simbel. Emerson, who had been staring at the mountain with greed writ clearly across his handsome countenance, muttered, "'That is the greatest temple of Nubia, Peabody. Excavation there would undoubtedly produce invaluable historical material. Since we are at loose ends today—' "'We are not at loose ends. I have a great deal to do,' I said firmly. "'Furthermore, Mr. Budge is working at Jebel Barkle, and you swore to me you would stay away from him.' "'Bah!' said Emerson. "'as I expected he would. "'Pleased to have had my stratagem of keeping Emerson and Mr. Budge apart succeed, "'I was extremely annoyed to find that I had overlooked one fact. "'Mr. Budge's workmen, too, were enjoying their day of rest, "'and Mr. Budge had decided to pay a visit to his friends at the camp. "'Fortunately, Emerson was not with me when I made this discovery. "'He and Ramses had gone off to the village.' ostensibly for the purpose of trying to hire more men, though, knowing their habits, I had the direst suspicions of what they would actually do. It had been left to me to strengthen our ties with the military establishment. I, therefore, rode directly to the camel hospital, my humorous term for it, since the beast I bestrode had an eye infection concerning which I was anxious to consult Captain Griffith. After a delightful and useful conversation, he informed me that General Rundle, having heard of my arrival, had invited me to join him and some of the other officers at luncheon. "'And the professor, too, of course,' he added. "'Oh, I have not the slightest idea where Emerson may be at this time,' I replied. "'No doubt he is lunching with a dervish or a Greek shopkeeper or a Bedouin sheikh.' "'so I will be happy to accept the General's invitation.' "'I tucked the tube of ointment he had given me "'into one of the pouches at my belt. "'Captain Griffith studied this accessory curiously. "'Pardon me, Mrs. Emerson, but you seem to be somewhat uh, encumbered. "'Would you care to leave your uh, accoutrement here? "'It will be quite safe, I assure you.' 
My dear captain, I would as soon think of going about without my, uh, my hat as without my belt, I replied, taking the arm he offered. It is a trifle noisy, I confess. Emerson is always complaining about how I jangle and clank when I walk. But every object has proved not only useful, but, upon occasion, essential to survival. A compass, a small canteen, a notebook and pencil, a knife, a waterproof box containing matches and candles. Yes, I see, the young man said, his eyes shining with interest. Why waterproof, may I ask? I proceeded to tell him about the time Emerson and I had been flung into the flooded burial chamber of a pyramid, and then, as he seemed to be genuinely fascinated, went on to explain my theories of appropriate attire for excavation. One of these days, I declared, women will boldly use up your trousers, Captain. That is to say, not yours in particular. We enjoyed a hearty laugh over this, and the captain assured me that my meaning had been quite clear. I have no designs on them myself, I went on. These full, divided skirts are more flattering to a female figure, and yet they allow perfect freedom of movement. Furthermore, I suspect that the flow of air through their folds renders them more comfortable in a hot climate than those close-fitting nether garments of yours. He quite agreed with me. "'and in such interesting conversation the brief walk seemed even briefer. "'The general occupied a mansion, two rooms and a walled courtyard, "'plus a separate shed which served as a kitchen, "'built of mud brick instead of the usual interwoven branches. "'Emerson is always going on about the decadence of military officers "'who have to have their personal servants wherever they go.' But after the random efforts of our camp cook, whose regular occupation was that of camel driver, I was looking forward to a decent meal prepared by a trained servant. My pleasure received only a slight check when I saw Mr. Budge among the men who rose to greet me. "'I believe you know, Mr. Budge,' General Rundle said, after he had introduced the others." "'Yes, yes, we are old friends,' said Mr. Budge, "'beaming all over his round red face "'and transferring his glass to his left hand "'in order to give me a damp handshake. "'And where have you left the professor, Mrs. Emerson? "'You are making great discoveries at Nuri, I understand?' "'The grin that accompanied the last sentence "'explained his good humour. "'having appropriated the best site for himself "'and having made certain that there was nothing of obvious value at ours. "'He could afford to gloat. "'I replied with perfect courtesy, of course. "'We took our places at the table. "'I was naturally seated next to General Rundle. "'He was an amiable man, but his conversational efforts did not tax me unduly. "'I was able to observe that Budge kept shooting glances at me.' and something in his look aroused the direst of suspicions. It was as if he knew something I did not know, and if it amused Budge, it was certain not to amuse me. Sure enough, as the last course was being cleared away, and a lull fell upon the conversation, Budge addressed me directly. "'I do hope, Mrs. Emerson, that you and young Ramses aren't planning to go with the Professor when he sets off in search of the lost oasis.' "'I beg your pardon?' I gasped. "'Do try to dissuade him from such a fruitless and dangerous quest,' Budge said, "'pursing his lips in the most hypocritical look of concern "'I have ever seen on a human countenance. "'A fine fellow, the Professor, in his way, "'but given to these little fancies, eh?' "'Quite right, ma'am,' the General rumbled. "'No such place, you know. "'Native tales and idle rumours. "'Never thought the Professor would be so gullible.' "'I assure you, General,' I assured him, "'that gullible is not the word for Professor Emerson. "'May I ask, Mr. Budge, "'where you heard this piece of idle and inaccurate gossip?' "'I assure you, ma'am, it is not idle gossip. "'My informant was a certain Major Sir Richard Bassington, "'who arrived yesterday on the paddle-wheeler from Kerma, "'and he got it direct from the source.' "'Mr. Reginald Forthright, grandson of Lord Blacktower. 
Major Bassington met him at Wadi Halfa some days ago. He was looking for transport south without success. I should hope not, General Rundle exclaimed. Don't want a lot of civilians hanging about. Uh, present company accepted, of course. Who is this fellow, and what puts this particular bee in his bonnet? Budge proceeded to explain, at quite unnecessary length. The name of Willoughby Forth made an impression. Several of the older officers had heard of him, and General Rundle appeared to know something of his history. Sad case, very, he mumbled, shaking his head. Hopeless, though, quite hopeless. The damned... Excuse me, ma'am. The confounded dervishes must have got him. Can't imagine why that old reprobate Black Tower would allow his grandson to go herring off on such a ridiculous jaunt. Forthright seemed very determined, Budge said smoothly. He had a message from Professor Emerson, inviting him to join in the expedition. Dear me, Mrs. Emerson, you look quite thunderstruck. I hope I have not been indiscreet. Rallying, I said firmly, I am only surprised at the folly of people who invent such stories and the greater folly of those who credit them. General, I have greatly enjoyed your hospitality. I won't detain you and your officers any longer from the labours that await you. With a last mocking salutation, Budge strutted off in the company of some of the younger officers, and I took my leave. The reader can well imagine the bitterness of spirit that filled me as I hastened on toward the souk, where Emerson and I had agreed to meet. My husband, my other half, the man who had sworn his eternal devotion and to whom I had given mine. Emerson had deceived me. If he had really asked young Mr. Forthright to join him, he must be planning to pursue the quest he had so often derided as folly. And if he had not consulted me, he must be planning to go without me. It was treachery of the vilest and most contemptible kind. Never would I have believed Emerson could be capable of such betrayal. The rich, malodorously mingled sense of the market assaulted my nostrils. It is said that the olfactory sense is the quickest to adapt. Certainly I had found that within a day or so after arriving in Egypt, I no longer noticed the distinctive odours of the country, which many Europeans find distasteful. I cannot claim that I breathed them in with the same pleasure I would have found in the aroma of a rose or a lilac, but they brought back delightful memories and were thereby rendered tolerable. Today, however, the stench made me feel a trifle ill, compounded as it was of rotting vegetation, dried camel dung, and sweating unwashed human bodies. I rather regretted having eaten quite so much. I traversed the souk from end to end without seeing any sign of my husband and son. Retracing my steps, I settled myself on a bench in front of one of the more prosperous establishments and prepared to purchase foodstuffs. The Greek shopkeepers do not engage in the long exchange of courtesies that precedes any purchase in the souks of Cairo, but I expected I would have to do some bargaining, and so it proved rice, dates, tinned vegetables and some water jars. Of the coarse, porous type that permits cooling by evaporation had been acquired when the shopkeeper broke off his discussion and began a series of extravagant bows. Turning, I saw the familiar form of my husband approaching. He was bareheaded, as usual, and his waving dark locks shone with bronze highlights. His smiling face, the strong brown throat, bared by the open collar of his shirt, the muscular forearms, also bared, had their usual softening effect. After all, I thought, perhaps he had not deceived me. The story I had heard had been third-hand. It might have been distorted, especially by Budge, who was always eager to think the worst of Emerson. I did not see Ramses, but I assumed he was there, his slighter form hidden by the crowd, for Emerson would not have looked so pleased if he had managed to lose the boy. 
However, it would have been hard to overlook the individual who followed my husband at a respectful distance. The folds of his mantle shadowed his features, but his height and lithe movements made his identity unmistakable. "'My dear Peabody,' said Emerson. "'Good afternoon, Emerson,' I replied. "'And where is... Oh, there you are, Ramses. Don't try to hide behind your father. You are even dirtier than I expected you would be. But I can't do anything about that now. What is that brown stain all down your shirt front? Ramses chose to ignore the direct question in favour of the accusation. I was not hiding, Mamma. I was talking with Mr. Kemet here. He has taught me a number of useful phrases in his language, including, you may tell me later, Ramses... The brown stain appeared to be the residue of some kind of food or drink, something sticky to judge by the number of flies that clung to it. I transferred my attention to Ramsay's tutor, who replied with one of his curious gestures of greeting. So your name is Kemet, is it? He has agreed to work for us, Emerson said happily, and bring two others of his tribe. Isn't that splendid? Very. And where do your people live, Mr. Um, uh, Kemet? It is a tragic story, said Ramses, squatting with a supple ease no English lad should have demonstrated. His village was one of many destroyed by the dervishes. They cut down the date palms, killed the men and boys, and dishonoured Ramses. I see that, as always, you have made good use of your time, Peabody, Emerson said quickly. Are we ready to go back to Nuri? No. I want to buy some trinkets, beads, mirrors, and the like, as gifts for the men to take their wives. You know I always try to become friendly with the women, in the hope of instructing them in the rights and privileges to which their sex is morally entitled. Yes, Peabody, I do know, Emerson said. And while I am in full sympathy with the justice of that cause, I do feel, as I have had occasion to mention before, my dear, that your chances of bringing about any lasting change... Well, but that is by the by. Shall we finish making our purchases and be on our way? Followed by porters carrying our goods, we made our way to another booth. Ramses chose to honour me with his company. "'You would like Kemet's people, Mamma," he remarked. "'Their women are highly respected, except by the dervishes, "'who, as I told you, dishonoured... "'Kindly refrain from referring to the subject again, Ramses. "'You don't know what you are talking about.' "'However, I had an uneasy feeling that he did know. "'Like all men, Emerson grows very impatient "'over the necessary deliberations of shopping.' If it were left to him, he would simply point to the first object of its kind he saw and order a dozen. His grumbling and fidgeting were checked, however, when I had the pleasure of telling him that I had got the loan of five more camels from Captain Griffith. "'How the devil did you do that?' he asked admiringly. "'These cursed military men are British officers and gentlemen, my dear.' I persuaded them that since the animals in question are not yet fit for the arduous trips the Camel Corps makes, they can just as well recuperate at our camp as here. Captain Griffith was kind enough to express full confidence in my veterinary skills. <coughs> said Emerson. But he said it very softly. We picked up the camels and a supply of medication for them and loaded our purchases. The weight of them was negligible compared to the loads camels are accustomed to carry, and I was careful to see that it was done properly, placing pads over the healing sores on the beasts' backs and sides and adjusting the saddles to protect them. I was surprised to see how quick Kemet was to understand the reasoning behind these procedures and how adept at carrying them out. "'He seems quite an intelligent individual,' I said to Emerson, as we rode side by side out of the village. Perhaps he can be taught some of the excavation techniques, as you did with the men de Vazille. How I miss our friends, dear old Abdullah and his son, and grandsons and nephews. I was thinking the same thing, Puybody. Kemet is clearly a mentally superior individual. 
if his fellow tribesmen are as capable. Ha! Speak of the devil! Two men had appeared from among the palm trees so suddenly and silently that they might have materialized out of thin air. They were attired in the same short trousers and long mantles. Kemet advanced to meet them. After a brief conversation, he came back to Emerson. They will come. They speak no English, but they will work. They are faithful. We mounted Kemet's friends on two of the camels, which they bestrode with a facility that indicated considerable familiarity with that means of transport, and resumed our journey. The gait of the camel does not permit comfortable conversation. I resolved to wait until Emerson and I were alone before raising the subject of Reginald Forthright and my husband's unacceptable behaviour. However, when the desired condition of privacy was at last attained, other considerations soon intervened, and when they had been concluded, to the satisfaction of both parties, I am bound to confess that Reginald Forthright was the last subject on my mind. Kemet and his two attendants proved to be all that he had claimed, and more. They not only worked tirelessly and carefully at any task assigned them, following directions to the letter, but they all, Kemet especially, proved astonishingly quick at learning the methods of excavation we used. Naturally, we rewarded them by giving them increased responsibility and respect, though I hope I need not tell the reader that we treated all our men with the same courtesy we would have accorded English servants. They were not popular with the villagers, whose insular parochialism made them view even members of nearby tribes as strangers. But the trouble I half expected did not occur. Kemet's crew kept aloof from the others. They built themselves a little tuchel some distance away from the men's camp and retired there as soon as the working day was over. We usually began work at an early hour, after only a cup of tea, and then paused for breakfast in mid-morning. It was while we were at this meal, on the day after our return from the camp, that I found an opportunity of speaking with Emerson about Mr. Forthright. He had mentioned Mr. Budge, remarking, in his bluff manner, "'I caught a glimpse of a familiar fat form strutting around camp yesterday, in the company of some of the officers. "'Did you happen to run into him, Peabody?' "'Indeed I did,' said I. "'He and I had the honour of lunching with General Rundle. "'You were invited, Emerson.' "'They couldn't invite me because they couldn't find me,' Emerson said smugly. "'I had a notion some such thing would happen. "'That is why I kept out of the way. "'And you see, Peabody, how well it turned out. "'It's difficult enough to be civil to a group of military blockheads. "'Budge would have been too much for me.' "'Bragging and boasting as usual, I suppose. "'To some extent. "'But it was not his bragging that would have been too much for you. "'What then?' "'Emerson's countenance darkened. "'Did he have the effrontery to admire you, Peabody? "'By heaven, if he so much as touched your sleeve. "'Oh, come, Emerson, you must get over this notion.' "'flattering though it may be, "'that every man I meet falls madly in love with me. "'Mr. Budge has never shown the slightest indication of doing so. "'He has not the delicacy of taste to appreciate you,' Emerson agreed. "'So what did he do, Peabody?' "'He was kind enough to inform me and the officers "'that Mr. Reginald Forthright is on his way here.' "'having been invited by you to join an expedition in search of the lost oasis. "'Fortunately, Emerson had finished his tea. "'Otherwise, I am convinced he would have choked. "'I will spare the reader a description of the broken, incoherent outcries that escaped his lips.' With his accustomed quickness, he had immediately grasped that the result of Budge's statement must be to make him an object of ridicule, and this seemed to be the major theme of his complaints. Interspersed with the curses which have made Emerson famous along the length of the Nile Valley, 
His comments rose to a pitch that was audible at some distance. The men turned to stare, and Kemet, who was waiting for instructions, opened his eyes very wide, the first sign of emotion I had seen on his composed countenance. I suggested that Emerson moderate his voice. He fell silent, and I went on. When last heard of, Mr. Forthright had got as far as Wadi Halfa. I had not expected the young man would have such determination. He must have had strong encouragement to proceed, don't you think? I do not engage in idle speculation concerning the motives of individuals with whom I am barely acquainted, Emerson replied. Then you did not invite... Curse it, Amelia! Emerson caught himself. It creates a bad impression for leaders of an expedition to quarrel openly before the men, or for the parents of a child like Ramses to disagree. He went on in a more moderate voice. I certainly did not encourage Mr. Forthright to come to Nubia. Quite the reverse. Ah, huh. so you did communicate with him before we left England. Emerson's cheeks turned a handsome mahogany shade, and the dimple in his chin quivered ominously. And you, Peabody, weren't you moved to send a sympathetic message to the bereaved old father? It was a shrewd hit. I believe my countenance remained relatively unmoved, but Emerson knows me too well to be deceived. His tight lips relaxed, and a humorous gleam brightened the brilliant blue of his eyes. Cards on the table, Peabody. If this young idiot is about to descend upon us, we must know precisely where we stand. I did write to Forthright. I assured him that we would make inquiries, and that if... I underlined the word twice, Peabody. If we discovered anything that substantiated the possibility of Forth's survival, we would communicate with him and his grandfather at once. I failed to see what was wrong with that or how he could possibly have construed it as a promise or an invitation. I said essentially the same thing, I admitted, to Lord Blacktower. Ramses had been uncharacteristically silent up to this point, his wide dark eyes moving from my face to that of his father as we spoke. Now he cleared his throat. Perhaps Mr. Forthright has received additional information... It would be difficult for him to pass it on to us through the usual channels. The telegraph is reserved for the military, and our whereabouts have been uncertain. Humph, <laughs> said Emerson, thoughtfully. Well, we can only wait and see, I remarked. There is no way of heading Mr. Forth right off, so we had better get as much work as possible accomplished before he arrives. Emerson scowled at me. His arrival will not affect my activities in the slightest, Peabody. How many times must I repeat that I have no intention of going off on a wild goose chase? But if it were not a wild goose chase, Papa, Ramses asked, one could not abandon a friend if there was any hope of rescue. Emerson had risen. Fingering the cleft in his chin, he looked down at his son. <sighs> I am glad to find, Ramses, that your principles are those of an English... that is, of a gentleman. I would move heaven and earth to save Forth or his wife, if I truly believed either of them still lived. I don't believe it, and it would take overpowering evidence to convince me I am wrong. So much for that. Now, Kerrit, I want to do some digging around the second of the pyramids in line. This one... On rolling his plan, he indicated the structure in question. Lepsius shows a chapel on the southeast side. There are no signs of it now, but the cursed scavengers can't have carried away every cursed stone. There must be some traces left. Confound it, we need to find some inscriptional material, if only to identify the builders of these structures. Why do you lecture the poor fellow, Emerson? I inquired softly. He doesn't understand a word you are saying. Emerson's lips curved in an enigmatic smile. No? Did you understand, Kemet? You want to know who made the stone houses. 
They were the great kings and queens. But they are gone. They are not here. Arms folded across his broad chest, he intoned the words like a priest reciting a mortuary formula. Where have they gone, Kemet? Emerson asked. They are with the god. Kemet's hand moved in a curiously fluid gesture, from the horizon to the vault of the sky, now pale with heat. I pray that is so, said Emerson courteously. Well, my friend, let us get on with it. Our work will make their names live again. And in that, as you know, was their hope of immortality. They went off together, and I thought, not for the first time, what an impressive pair they made, and Emerson not the lesser of the two. Ramses, I said absently, for part of my attention was concentrated on the graceful and athletic movements of my spouse's admirable form, "'As soon as you have finished at number six, "'I want you to move your crew to the largest pyramid and join me.' "'But Papa said... "'Never mind what Papa said. "'He has succumbed to his lust. Um, "'He has postponed his surveying in favour of excavation. "'He cannot complain if I do the same. "'The largest pyramid surely belongs to one of the great kings. "'Pianchi, or Tahaka, or Shabaka.' The superstructure has completely collapsed, but there must be a burial chamber underneath. Ramses stroked his chin. For a moment he looked uncannily like his father, though the resemblance was one of gesture and expression rather than physical likeness. Yes, Mamma. A few days later, my crew had moved several tons of stone without finding any trace of the entrance to the burial chamber, and Emerson had shifted his crew from the pyramids of the southeast row to a smaller, half-fallen structure behind them. Shortly after sunrise on the Wednesday, I was electrified by a cry that echoed weirdly across the sandy waste. I at once hastened to the scene and found Emerson hip-deep in his excavation trench. "'Eureka!' he cried in greeting. "'At last! I think we've hit on the chapel, Peabody!' "'Congratulations, my dear,' I replied. "'Get the rest of the men over here at once, Peabody. "'I want to deepen and widen the trench.' "'But, Emerson, I have not yet—' "'Emerson wiped the sand from his perspiring face with his sleeve "'and gave me a comradely grin. "'My dear, I know you are aching to find some beastly, "'collapsing tunnel into which you can crawl, "'at the risk of life and limb, "'but it is imperative that we clear this area as soon as possible.' As soon as the locals get wind of our discovery, gossip and exaggeration will transform the find into a treasure of gold and gems, and every human rodent in the neighbourhood will start burrowing. You are right, Emerson, I said, sighing. I will, of course, do as you ask. It took several hours to enlarge the trench so as to expose fully the stones he had found and to take careful notes of their precise location. As we measured and sketched while the sun beat down and the sand filled our mouths and nostrils, I would have given a good deal to have a camera. I had proposed bringing one, but Emerson had vetoed the idea, pointing out that the cursed things were cumbersome and unreliable, except in the hands of a trained photographer, which we did not have, and that the efficient use of them required other equipment, which was not easy to procure, clean water, chemicals and the like. Unfortunately, one of the men turned up a few scraps of gold foil. I say unfortunately, for there is nothing that arouses the treasure-hunting instincts and the, alas, concomitant willingness to commit violence for its possession more quickly than the aureus metal. Shining like the sun, soft enough to be easily worked, incorruptible, since time immemorial it has aroused in men a lust passing the love of women— not to mention their fellow men. The very name of Nubia is derived from the ancient Egyptian word for gold. It was for gold beyond all other treasures that the pharaohs sent traders and armies into the land of Kush. I would not be at all surprised to find that it was for gold that Cain committed the first murder. It happened a very long time ago, 
and holy writ, though no doubt divinely inspired, is a trifle careless about details. God is not a historian. There was undoubtedly a great deal of gold in Nubia at one time, but as Emerson remarked, studying the pitiful scrap in his big brown hand, there didn't seem to be a lot left. However, I felt it incumbent upon me to take over the task of sifting the soil removed from the trench, and a tedious, hot task it was. The sun was far down the west, and the shadows were lengthening, and I was looking forward to a sponge bath and a change of clothing, and perhaps a small whisky and soda, when one of our less industrious workers, who spent more time leaning on his shovel than he did using it, cried out in surprise. "'Have you stabbed your foot again with your shovel, careless one?' I inquired, sarcastically. "'No, Sitakim, no. There is a camel coming, and a man upon the camel, and the camel is running, and the man is about to fall off the camel, I believe. For look, Sitakim, he sits the camel as no man who wishes to remain upright sits upon—' But I heard no more, for I had seen what he had seen, and had realized that for once his appraisal of the situation was fairly accurate.' The rider was not sitting on the camel. He was listing dangerously from side to side. Hastening to meet him, I addressed the camel with an emphatic, Ada ya yon, confound you. The camel stopped. I whacked it with my parasol, but before it could kneel, supposing that it had intended to do so, the rider slid from the saddle and fell unconscious at my feet. The rider was, of course, Mr. Reginald Forthright. I had anticipated this, as I am sure the reader must have done. Chapter 5 He is the Man Good gad, said Emerson. I wonder if the fellow makes a habit of introducing himself in this fashion, or if we have a particularly unfortunate effect on his nerves. Peabody, I absolutely forbid you to touch him. It may well be that your unnecessarily demonstrative attentions last time inspired this. Don't be absurd, my dear. With a strange sensation of deja vu, I knelt beside the young man. He was lying on his back this time, in a particularly graceful attitude, but what a change from the well-dressed, neatly groomed individual who had fallen upon our hearth rug a few weeks earlier. His suit had been cut by an excellent tailor, but it was crumpled and stained. Sunburn had scorched his cheeks and peeled the skin from his nose. His hat, a fashionable but inappropriate tweed cap, had fallen from his head. From under the sweat-darkened curls on his brow, a thin trickle of blood traced a path across one cheek. Emerson had been the first on the scene, but the others soon followed, and curious spectators ringed round us as I dampened my handkerchief from the canteen at my belt and wiped the young man's flushed face. The response was prompt. As soon as consciousness returned, a flush of embarrassment further reddened Mr. Forthright's cheeks, and he began stammering apologies. Emerson cut them short. "'If you are stupid enough to wear wool clothing in this climate and go racing around in the hot sun, you must expect to be overcome by the heat.' "'It was not the heat that caused my collapse,' Forthright exclaimed. "'I was struck on the head by a stone, or some other missile. "'Another struck my camel, which bolted, and... "'Good heavens!' He sat up, catching at my shoulder for support, and levelled an accusing finger. "'There is my assailant. That man there!' He was pointing at Kemet. "'Nonsense!' Emerson said. "'Kemet has been working at my side all afternoon. Do you often suffer from hallucinations, Mr. Forthright?' "'Then it was a man very like him,' Forthright said stubbornly. "'Tall, dark-skinned. "'As are most of the male inhabitants of this region,' Emerson leaned over him, and with ruthless efficiency parted the curls on his brow. Forthright flinched and bit his lip. Hm, said Emerson. "'There is no swelling, only a small nick in the scalp. "'No stone caused this injury, Mr. Forthright. "'It was a sharp-edged object, like a knife.' 
What difference does that make, Emerson? I demanded. Mr. Forthright was obviously attacked, though not by Kemet, who, as you have said, was with us at the time. I suggest we retire to the shade and partake of some liquid refreshment while we discuss the situation. Mr. Forthright has a good deal of explaining to do. That is certainly true, said Emerson, his brows lowering. But I have no intention of stopping the work early on his account. Take him away, Peabody, and see if you can get any sense out of him. Beckoning the men to follow, he stalked off, still complaining. What the devil are we going to do with him? He can't go back to the camp alone. He'd get himself lost and fall off the cursed camel again and knock himself unconscious and die of exposure or thirst or both, and it would be on my... The words died into an unintelligible but still audible grumble. He is right, you know, I remarked, assisting forthright to rise. It was extremely foolish of you to start out in search of us alone. I was not alone, forthright replied gently. My servants were with me. It is not their fault that I so far outstripped them. They were attempting to follow when I last saw them, and I expect... They would be here before long. That must be them now, said Ramses. They, not them, I corrected. Ramses, what the de Why are you still here? Papa told you to get back to work. I beg your pardon, Mamma, but I did not hear Papa address a direct order to me. Admittedly, the general tenor of his comments suggested that he wished the work to resume, but in view of his failure to make a specific... Never mind, I said. Yes, Mamma. I had thought I might start a fire to boil water for tea. What a thoughtful lad, said Forthright, smiling at the boy. It is easy to see that he is devoted to his dear Mamma. Hmm. Yes, I said studying my son with mixed emotions. Like his father, he seized every excuse to remove his clothing, and since by hook or crook, design or accident, rather, he managed to ruin his nice little Norfolk suits, no matter how many of them I brought along, I was forced to allow him to rely to some extent on locally available attire. At this time, he was wearing the trousers of one of his suits and a pair of boots. But from the waist up... He might have passed for an Egyptian youth. Upon his black curls, he had clapped a cap woven in bright red, yellow and green patterns. And his coarse cotton shirt was one I had fashioned from a native robe by cutting off several feet of the length. Well, I said, so long as you are here, Ramses, you may as well make yourself useful. Go and meet Mr. Forthright's servants and take them somewhere. "'anywhere that is suitable for a temporary campsite, uh, "'so long as it is some distance from... "'From the tent of Papa and yourself,' said Ramses. "'Quite. "'I am afraid you will have to rough it tonight, Mr. Forthright. "'We have no extra tents or cots. "'We were not expecting guests. "'But, of course, I brought my own equipment and supplies, Mrs. Emerson," "'said the young man, adding with a little laugh... You had no way of knowing when I might arrive, so I could hardly expect you to provide for me. His eyes were as candid as those of Ramsay's. More so, in fact. When you might arrive, I repeated. Quite so. We have a good deal to talk about, Mr. Forthright. Follow me, if you please. The shades of night had fallen before Emerson called a halt to the excavation and dismissed the men. The last half hour of work had been punctuated with curses and exclamations of pain, as individuals fell into or over various obstacles, for it was really too dark by then to see what one was doing. Emerson had gone on beyond the usual time in order to prove, well, one wonders precisely what. But that is the way of the masculine sex and a woman can only accept these minor aberrations in what is, in many ways, a thoroughly satisfactory part of the human race. Mr. Forthright and I were sitting in front of the tent, enjoying the crackle and colour of our little fire, 
when Emerson brushed past us with a mumble of greeting and vanished into the tent. I had thoughtfully lit a lantern for his convenience. He promptly kicked it over and proceeded with whatever he was doing in utter darkness and relative silence. Only the splash of water and an occasional swear word betokened his presence. However, when he emerged at last, with his black hair curling on his brow and a clean shirt clinging to the muscular breadth of his shoulders, he was obviously in a better mood, for he gave me a surreptitious caress in passing and actually nodded at Mr. Forthright. Our evening ablutions were a great deal of trouble because every drop of water had to be fetched from the Nile, over a mile away, and filtered before it could be used— but I felt they were a necessity rather than a luxury, raising the spirits even as they cleansed the body. I am sure I need not say that they were my idea. Left to himself, Emerson would not have changed his shirt from the beginning of the week to its end. If, that is, he wore a shirt at all. "'We have been waiting for you, my dear,' I said pleasantly. Late as it is, I believe there is time for a sip of our usual beverage. We should drink a toast to Mr. Forthright and the perils he has survived. Emerson filled the glasses and passed them around, ignoring the hand Ramses had extended. Ramses never gave up hope that Emerson would absent-mindedly include him in the evening ritual. Not so much, I think, because he liked the taste of whiskey as because it represented maturity and equal status with his parents. "'And what perils has Mr. Forthright survived?' Emerson asked sarcastically. "'Only the ordinary dangers of travel in this region,' the young man replied modestly. "'Mrs. Emerson has convinced me that the attack this afternoon was one of them. "'A disaffected follower of the late and unlamented Mahdi, perhaps.' "'There are a good many disaffected persons in the area,' said Emerson. "'Myself among them. "'No doubt you have explained your presence to the satisfaction of Mrs. Emerson. "'She is a kind-hearted individual with a peculiar weakness for romantic young idiots. "'You will find me harder to win over, Mr. Forthright.' "'I don't blame you for being annoyed, Professor,' Forthright said. "'As soon as I arrived at Salam Abu Dom, I found that Mr. Budge's version of my mission had spread throughout the camp. It really is too bad. I had not imagined a man of his reputation would be so ill-natured. But perhaps he was only misinformed. He was not misinformed, Emerson growled. Well, you may be sure I immediately set the matter straight. On my honor, Professor... He or his informant completely misinterpreted my remarks and my motives. I have no intention of persuading you to risk your life for a hopeless cause. I simply wanted to be on the spot in case... You had said, you know, that if any further information came to light... The explanation which had begun so glibly faltered into silence. Then Mr. Forthright said simply... If there is a risk to be taken, I am the one to take it. You have heard nothing, learnt nothing. No, said Emerson. I see. The young man sighed. My grandfather has become very frail. It is hope alone that keeps him alive, I believe. I began, Mr. Forthright, I beg, Mrs. Emerson, that you will do me the honour to call me Reginald, or Reggie, if you prefer. That is what my friends call me, and I hope I may number you among them. You may indeed, I said warmly. Emerson, Reggie has undergone considerable discomfort, not to say peril, in order to pursue this quest, or convince himself that it is hopeless, and all for the sake of his poor old grandfather. Proof of his son's death would be exceedingly painful to Lord Blacktower, but it would be less painful than the agonising uncertainty that has tormented him. Hope deferred can fester and grow. Yes, yes, Emerson said. So how do you intend to pursue this quest, Mr. Forthright? Darkness was complete. 
A shining net of stars spanned the deep vault of heaven, and in the west a silvery glow outlined the ragged crest of the hills. It flooded the landscape in pallid light as the half-grown moon lifted slowly into view. From the cook-fire a voice rose in poignant melody. "'How beautiful this is,' Reggie said softly. "'To have experienced such a moment makes the journey worthwhile. "'Travel broadens the mind,' it is said. "'It has certainly broadened mine. "'I understand now what drew my uncle to these wild yet magical regions.' <coughs> said Emerson. It is one thing to sit comfortably in the cool of the evening with a glass of whiskey in one's hand and a servant preparing dinner. You wouldn't find it quite so magical if you were lost in the desert with an empty canteen and the sun broiling you like a chicken on a spit and your tongue as dry as a scrap of leather. You haven't answered my question, Mr. Forthright. Oh, the young man started. I beg your pardon, Professor. There are refugees arriving daily, I am told, from the areas which have been held by the dervishes. The officers of the intelligence department who question them have promised me they will ask about captives held in remote places. That seems harmless enough, Emerson muttered. And while I wait for news, I will take up the study and practice of archaeology, Reggie went on gaily. Can you use another pair of hands, Professor? I have some knowledge of surveying, but I will wield a spade like the humblest native, if that is what you want. This handsome offer was welcomed by Emerson with less enthusiasm than it merited, but after voicing the expected, by me, reservations concerning lack of experience and absence of a long-term commitment, he unbent so far as to produce his plan of the site. The ensuing explanation soon took on the length of a lecture, which was interrupted only by the appearance of the cook summoning us to the evening meal. As soon as it was consumed, Reggie expressed his intention of retiring, pleading fatigue, and we soon followed suit, for our working day began at sunrise. As we prepared for bed, I awaited with considerable interest Emerson's comments. He said nothing, however, so, after he had put out the light and reclined at my side, I ventured to introduce the subject myself. Reggie's assistance will be helpful, don't you think? No, said Emerson. We should have realised that Mr. Budge would put the worst possible interpretation on his presence in Nubia. I thought his reasons for coming were both sensible and admirable, <coughs> said Emerson. "'Who do you suppose it was who threw the rock at him?' "'It could not have been a rock that struck him.' "'I agree. You were quite right, my dear. "'A knife, a spear, an arrow?' "'Oh, an arrow, by all means,' said Emerson, "'goaded at last into sarcasm. "'The bowmen of Kosh formed one of the crack units of the Egyptian army. "'No doubt the ghost of one of them mistook forthright for an ancient Nubian.' The bow has not been employed in this region for over a thousand years. A knife or a spear, then? Piffle, Peabody. He probably fainted. It seems to be a habit of his. Fell off the camel and landed on his head. Naturally, he would be embarrassed to admit it. But then there would have been a bruise, Emerson. Emerson requested that we end the discussion and reinforced the request by a series of gestures that rendered further conversation on my part inappropriate, if not impossible. Despite a somewhat disturbed night, Emerson was up betimes the following morning. I was awakened by his precipitate departure from our tent and by his stentorian voice summoning the men to work. Knowing full well that his primary aim was to rouse Reggie and test that unfortunate young man's powers of endurance to the limit, I lingered over my cup of tea, enjoying the exquisite blush of the eastern sky as the stars faded, yielding their lesser light to the glorious lord of day. 
The morning air was cool enough to make a wool shirt welcome. But by early afternoon, when Emerson called a temporary halt, we had all shed as many garments as modesty permitted. Reggie had held up better than I expected. To be sure, he had very little to show for his morning's work. "'It will take a while to familiarise yourself with the terrain and with our methods,' I said. Reggie laughed. "'You are too kind, Mrs. Emerson. The truth is, I was too fascinated by what you and the Professor are doing to concentrate on my own tasks. Tell me,' and he went on to pepper me with questions. "'What did we hope to find? Why were we digging so slowly and laboriously, by hand, instead of battering our way into the pyramids?' If he really wanted information, he got more than he bargained for. Emerson simply rolled his eyes and shrugged, an indication that he found Reggie's state of ignorance too abysmal to be capable of improvement. But Ramsay's was always ready to lecture. The goal of proper excavation, Mr. Forthright, is not treasure but knowledge. Any scrap of material, no matter how insignificant, may supply an essential clue to our understanding of the past. Our primary purpose here is to establish the original plan and, if possible, the relative chronology und so weiter, as the Germans say. After a while, Reggie threw up his hands, laughing heartily. That's enough for one day, Master Ramses. I don't think I am cut out for archaeology, after all. But I am ready to resume work whenever you say, Professor. We don't work during the hottest part of the day, I informed him. You had better rest while you can. If you are ready to retire to your tent, I will accompany you. I may be able to make a few suggestions that will render your situation more comfortable. My real aim was to meet his servants and ascertain how they were getting on with the other men and to inspect his camels. I took it for granted that they would be in need of attention. The campsite was some distance from ours, to the north of the ruins of the largest pyramid. Compared to our own modest quarters, Reggie's were positively palatial. The tent was large enough to accommodate several people and every possible comfort had been supplied from rugs upon the sandy floor to a folding bathtub. Good heavens, I exclaimed. What, no champagne glasses? Not even champagne, said Reggie with a laugh. However, brandy travels well, I believe. I hope you and the professor will join me in a glass after dinner tonight. The camels were in need of my attention, which was not surprising considering the loads they had carried, Reggie's servants looked on with ill-concealed derision as I applied ointment to the festering sores on the poor beast's sides, but their grins disappeared when I addressed them in forcible and idiomatic Arabic. There were four of them, three Nubians and an Egyptian, a native of the Thebaid, who answered, like about half his countrymen, to the name of Ahmet. When I asked him what he was doing so far from home, he said... The Effendi offered much money, Sit. What is a poor man to do? Reggie decided he did not need a rest and followed me back to my tent. He was as cheerful and eager to please as a large, clumsy dog, so I allowed him to help me with the accounts. The men were to be paid that evening. We kept separate pay sheets for each individual, since the amount they earned depended upon the number of hours worked, plus extra for each important discovery. By paying the fair market value for artefacts, we remove the incentive to theft, I explained, adding wryly, unfortunately, thus far, we have had to pay very little extra. The site does appear to have been thoroughly ransacked, Reggie agreed, with a disparaging glance at the tumbled piles of stone that had once been pyramids. How much longer will you stay here if nothing of value turns up? You still don't understand, Reggie. It is knowledge, not treasure, we seek. At the rate we are going, it will take the entire season to finish here. I see. Well, this appears to be the last memorandum, Mrs. Emerson. The men will be off to their villages this evening, I presume. Do you and the professor stay here, or are you going to the encampment? 
after considerable discussion and a good deal of profane and fruitless argument, Emerson had finally agreed to let the men leave early, so they could reach their homes before dark, providing they returned the following evening. I explained this to Reggie, adding that I had planned to visit the market in Sanam Abu Dom next day to purchase fresh vegetables and bread. But if you are going, Reggie, you could shop for me and save me the trip. A shadow crossed the young man's smiling face. I must go, Mrs. Emerson. Having beheld the vast and threatening face of the desert, I begin to realize how fruitless my quest must prove. But... Yes, of course. I will give you a list this evening, then. I suggest you wait until morning. Travel after dark is fraught with perils. You need not argue that, Reggie replied. His hand went to the neat bandage I had applied to the cut on his brow, and he glanced over his shoulder at Kemet, who was resting in the shade nearby. I suppose it could not have been that fellow who attacked me. But I swear to you, Mrs. Emerson... It was a man so like him it might have been his twin. What do you know of him? His village, which was destroyed by the dervishes, is south of here. He was not more precise. As you know, Western notions of distance and geography are unknown to these people. You trust him, then? Reggie's voice had dropped to a whisper. You need not lower your voice. He only understands a few words of English. As for trusting him, why should I not? He and his friends have worked faithfully and diligently. Why is he staring at us? Reggie demanded. He is looking, not staring. Come now, Reggie, admit that your suspicions of Kemet are unjust and unfounded. You couldn't have got a good look at your assailant, since by your own account you didn't realise anything was wrong until the missile struck you. After a few more hours of work, Emerson called a halt and summoned the men to the table where I sat ready to hand out their wages. Curse it, he remarked, taking a seat at my side. We must think of another arrangement, Peabody. They are so anxious to get away. They haven't done a blood blooming thing all afternoon. The only alternative is to return to our original plan of letting them leave early Friday morning, I replied. Then they will have to return Friday night, Emerson declared. Otherwise, they won't be here until mid-morning on Saturday and will complain that they are too tired after their long walk to put in a good day's work. At least the men did not linger to argue about the amount of their pay. They were anxious to be safe at home before the dread demons of darkness came out of hiding. As they dispersed, I closed the account book and remarked, Supper tonight will be out of tins, gentlemen. Cooking is not an activity at which I excel, or in which I care to do so. My servant Ahmed is an excellent cook, Reggie said. It was one of the skills for which I selected him. Perhaps you will all do me the honour of being my guests at dinner this evening. I accepted with proper expressions of appreciation. After Reggie had gone off to his tent... Emerson remarked sourly, "'It wouldn't surprise me to see him turn out in full evening kit. "'I warn you, Amelia, if he does, I will go and dine with Kemet.' "'Mr. Forthright brought a considerable quantity of luggage,' said Ramses, "'sitting cross-legged at my feet. "'In addition to a revolver, he has two rifles and quantities of ammunition, "'as well as—' "'He probably plans to do some hunting,' I replied.' thinking it best not to ask Ramses how he knew of these facts. "'Should that be the case, I will feel myself obliged to remonstrate,' said Ramses, in his stateliest manner. "'Just so you don't run into the line of fire, as you have been known to do,' I said sternly. "'You spend far too much time interfering in other people's business, Ramses. Come and give me a hand.' There are several hours of daylight left, and I want to have a closer look at those small piles of debris south of number four. I suspect they may have been queen's tombs, for even in Kush, where women enjoyed considerable power, the ladies were short-changed in the matter of pyramids. Emerson decided to join us, and we spent a most enjoyable hour poking around the rubble and arguing about where the burial chamber might be. Ramses, of course, had to disagree with me, 
and his father. We cannot assume, he claimed, that because the burial chambers in Egyptian pyramids were for the most part under the superstructure, that such was the case here. Remember Fellini's description of the chamber in which he found the jewellery that is now in the Berlin Museum. Impossible, I exclaimed. Lepsius agrees with me that Fellini must have made a mistake. He was no archaeologist. But he was there, said Ramses. Herr Lepsius was not. And with all due respect, Mamma. <clears throat> yes, Emerson said quickly. But, my boy, even if Fellini did find a burial chamber in the upper portions of one pyramid, that could have been an exception to the general rule. His attempt at compromise failed, as such efforts generally do. Nonsense, I exclaimed. That is not the point, Papa, if you will excuse me, said Ramses. The debate continued to rage as we walked back to our tents. Few families, I ventured to assert, share so many agreeable interests as ours, and the freedom and candour with which we communicate our opinions to one another only adds to our mutual pleasure. I had brought along one good frock, just in case, for one never knows when one may encounter persons of a superior social status. It was a simple evening dress of O'Donnell's spotted net, the bodice cut low and square, the skirt flounced, with pink silk roses trimming the flounces and the short puffed sleeves. By allowing Emerson the privilege, which he much enjoys, of buttoning me into the frock, I managed to persuade him to wear a jacket and change his boots for proper shoes. But he refused to wear a cravat, claiming that he had taken up archaeology as a career primarily because a cravat was not part of the official costume for that profession. However, as I had to admit when he pressed me, Emerson's personal appearance is so striking that the absence of a particular article of clothing does not diminish the effect in the least. I then went in search of Ramses, for it was safe to assume he would wash only the parts of him that showed. As I trailed my O'Donnell flounces across the sandy ground, wincing as pebbles pressed through the thin soles of my evening slippers, I could almost have wished that Emerson had not placed the boy's little tent so far from our own, his reasons for doing so were excellent, however, and on the whole the advantages far outweighed the disadvantages. Even in the light of what happened soon afterward, I maintain that opinion. Ramses had not washed even the parts that showed. He was perched on a camp stool in front of the packing case that served as desk and table combined. It was littered with scraps of paper, and he was busily scribbling in the battered cloth-bound notebook that accompanied him everywhere. He greeted me with his usual punctilious courtesy, more becoming a grave old gentleman than a little boy, and begged for another minute of delay so that he could finish his notes. "'Oh, very well,' I said. "'But you must hurry. It is rude to be late when one is invited to dine. "'What notes are those that are so important?' A dictionary of the dialect spoken by Kemet and his friends. The spelling is of necessity phonetic. I am using the system derived from... Never mind, Ramses. Just make haste. Looking over his shoulder, I saw that he had arranged the vocabulary by parts of speech, leaving several pages for each. None of the words was familiar to me, but then my knowledge of the Nubian dialects was extremely limited. I was happy to observe that Kemet's instruction had not included any words to which I could take exception, with the possible exception of a few nouns applying to certain portions of human anatomy. When Ramses had finished, he offered me his camp stool, which I took outside, lowering the tent flap as I left. Several years earlier, Ramses had requested the privilege of privacy when he performed his ablutions or changed his clothing. I was perfectly happy to accede to this request, for washing small, dirty, squirming boys had never been a favourite amusement of mine. The nursery maid in charge of Ramses at the time had made no objection either. I had asked Emerson to join us when he was ready, so I was content to wait. The sunset was particularly brilliant that evening. 
a blaze of golden crimson that contrasted exquisitely with the deepening azure of the zenith. Against this tapestry of living light, the jagged contours of the pyramids stood out in dark outline. And as any thoughtful individual might do, I mused upon the vanity of human aspiration and the brevity of human passions. Once this tumbled wilderness had been a holy place, adorned with every beautiful and good thing, as the ancients expressed it. Chapels built of carved and painted stone served each stately monument. White-robed priests hastened about their duties, bearing offerings of food and treasure to be placed upon the altars of the royal dead. As the shadows deepened and the night crept across the sky, I heard the soft rush of beating wings. Was it the human-headed soul-bird, the bar of some long-vanished pharaoh, returning to partake of food and drink from his chapel? No, it was only a bat. The poor bar would have starved long ages ago if it had depended on the offerings of its priests. These poetic thoughts were rudely swept away by Emerson blundering toward me. He can move as quickly and quietly as a cat when he chooses. On this occasion he did not choose, because he was not in the humour for a social engagement. I must say that he seldom is. Is that you, Peabody? he called. It is so dark I can scarcely see where I am going. Why didn't you bring a lantern? I inquired. We won't need it. The moon will be up soon said Emerson, with one of those bursts of striking illogic of which men constantly accuse women. Where's Ramses? If we must do this, let's get it over with. I am ready, Papa, said Ramses, lifting the flap of the tent. I took pains to make myself as tidy as possible, given the circumstances, which are not conducive to the easy attainment of that condition. I trust, Mamma, that my appearance is satisfactory. Since he was only visible as a dark shape against the darker interior of the tent, I was hardly in a position to make a valid judgment. I suggested that he light a lantern, not so much because I wanted to inspect him, further delay would have driven Emerson wild, but because night had fallen and the roughness of the ground made walking difficult, particularly for a lady wearing thin-soled shoes. So equipped, we set out. At my request, Emerson gave me his arm. He likes me to lean on his arm, and since Ramses preceded us with the light, he was able to make a few gestures of an affectionate nature, which further soothed his temper. So much so that he made only one rude remark when he saw the elegant arrangements Reggie had made for our reception. Candles graced the table, which was covered with a cloth of gay printed cotton, this must have been purchased at the souk, for I had seen others like it there. The pottery dishes had come from the same source, but I felt sure the wine had not. Even the enterprising Greek merchants had not imported expensive German hock. The carpet on which the table had been placed was a beautiful antique oriental, its deep wine-red background strewn with woven flowers and birds. I could only admire the taste that had chosen the best of the local crafts and the kindly care that had taken so much trouble for guests. People make fun of the British for maintaining formal standards in the wild, but I am of the school that believes such efforts have a beneficial effect not only upon the participants, but upon the observers. Ahmed's cooking lived up to his master's claims, and the wine was excellent. Emerson unbent so far as to take a glass, but he refused the brandy Reggie offered at the conclusion of the meal, despite the latter's urging. Out of politeness, I joined the young man, and was pleased to observe that he was as abstemious as I, restricting himself to a single glass of brandy. "'It will keep,' he said, with a smile, as Ahmed carried the bottle away. "'But perhaps I should share it with my men.' a special treat on the eve of their holiday. Emerson shook his head, and I said emphatically, On no account, Reggie. Liquor is one of the curses the white man has introduced into this country. The military authorities, quite rightly, keep a strict control over the amount of alcohol that is brought in. 
It would be doing these poor people a disservice to introduce them to drunkenness. That is no doubt correct, Mamma," said Ramses, before Reggie could reply. But does not that view smack somewhat of condescension? Alcoholic beverages were not unknown before Europeans came here. The ancient Egyptians were particularly fond of both beer and wine. Even young children... Beer and wine are not as harmful as spirits, I said, frowning at my son. And all of them are harmful to young children. Emerson was beginning to fidget, so I thanked Reggie for his hospitality, and we started back toward our tents. The moon had risen. It was only halfway to the full, but its light was bright enough to make the lantern unnecessary. The soft, silvery rays of the goddess of the night cast their spell of magic and romance. The wine may have had a certain effect as well. Emerson's pace quickened and I was not reluctant to be hurried along. We left Ramses at his tent, with affectionate, though somewhat abbreviated good nights, and made haste to reach our own. There is nothing like strenuous physical exercise to induce healthful slumber. I slept soundly that night. It was no ordinary, audible noise that roused me, but something I took to be a voice penetrating my dreams with the shrill insistence of a cry for help. It summoned me with that imperative instinct which nestles deep within a mother's breast, oft-tried though it may have been. I tried to answer. My voice died in my throat. I attempted to rise. My limbs were weighted down. The weight shifted, and Emerson, cursing sleepily, rose to hands and knees. He was gone before I could stop him, but I took comfort in the fact that he was wrapped in one of the loose native robes, the sudden drop in temperature during the night having apparently prompted this departure from custom. My own nightgown was voluminous enough to be modest, if not exactly suitable for walking abroad. I paused only long enough to slip my feet into my boots and snatch up my parasol before rushing in pursuit of my husband. The source of the disturbance was, as I might have expected, near the tent of Ramses, where I saw a singular tableau. One body lay prone upon the ground, another stood over it, fists on hips. A third, smaller form, sat pallid and immobile as a limestone statue, several feet away. Peabody! Emerson bellowed. I put my hands over my ears. I am just behind you, Emerson. You needn't shout. What has happened? The most extraordinary thing, Peabody. Look here. He's done it again. This is ridiculous. It's one thing to collapse at the slightest provocation, or none at all. I was becoming accustomed to that. But to wake people up in the middle of the night. It is not a faint this time, Emerson. He is wounded, bleeding, it was not until my fingers actually touched the sticky wetness that I realized the truth. Like Emerson, Reggie wore a native robe, but his was dark blue in color. Light, Emerson, I exclaimed. I must have light. Ramses, fetch the lantern. Ramses, did you hear me? I will light the lantern, Emerson said. The poor lad is a trifle dazed still, after having been wakened so abruptly. I went to Ramses. Even when I bent over him, he seemed to be unaware of my presence. I took him by the shoulders and shook him, insisting that he speak to me. And I must say, it made rather a change for me to ask Ramses to talk, instead of trying to get him to stop. He blinked at me then, and said slowly, I think I was dreaming, Mamma, but I came when you called. The chill that seized my limbs was not the product of the cold night air. I did not call you, Ramses. Not until just now. You called me. How very odd. Ramses stroked his chin thoughtfully. Hmm. We must discuss this situation, Mamma, and compare our impressions of what occurred. Is that Mr. Forthright lying there on the ground? Yes. "'and he is in more need of my attentions than you seem to be,' I replied, "'considerably relieved to find that Ramses was himself again. "'Bring the lantern here, Emerson.' 
Emerson let out a startled exclamation when the lamplight illumined the fallen man. I beg your pardon, Peabody. I thought you were up to your usual... Um, <coughs> he does seem to have bled rather profusely. Is he dead? No, nor likely to die unless the wound becomes infected. I turned Reggie onto his back and opened the robe to expose an arm and shoulder more admirably muscled than one might have expected. It is not so bad as I feared. The bleeding seems to have stopped, and... Good heavens, here is the weapon that wounded him. It was under his body. I picked it up by the haft and handed it to Emerson. Curiouser and curiouser, he muttered. This is no native knife, Peabody. It is good Sheffield steel and bears the mark of an English maker. Could he have fallen on it? Never mind that now, Emerson. He ought to be carried to his tent where I can tend to him properly. Where the dev... The deuce are his servants. How could they sleep through such a racket? Drunk, perhaps, Emerson began. Then a voice from the darkness said quietly, I am here, lady. I carry him. So it happened that the first sight to meet Reggie's eyes was the tall form of Kemet, advancing into the circle of lamplight. A sharp cry burst from the lips of the wounded man. Murderer! Assassin! Have you returned to finish me off? Mr. Forthright, you are becoming a bore, Emerson said impatiently. My thanks, Kemet. I can manage him. He lifted the young man into his mighty arms. Reggie's head fell back against Emerson's shoulder. He had lost consciousness again. I had to agree with my husband. Reggie was becoming a bit of a bore, especially on the subject of Kemet. What had he been doing so far from his own camp in the middle of the night? On hands and knees, his nose so close to the ground that he resembled a hunting dog on the trail of a rabbit, Ramses was examining the spot hideously stained with blood, where Reggie had lain. "'Get up from there, Ramses,' I said in disgust. "'Your morbid curiosity is repugnant. Either return to your cot or come with me.' As I had expected, Ramses chose to come with me. When we reached Reggie's tent, Ahmed was there, rubbing his eyes in an ostentatious and unconvincing fashion. "'Did you call, Effendi?' he asked. "'I certainly did.' said Emerson, who certainly had, his shouts having made the welkin ring. Confound you, Ahmed! Are you blind as well as deaf? Can't you see your master is injured? Ahmed gave a theatrical start. Wallahi el Azam! It is the young Effendi! What has happened, O father of curses? Emerson proceeded to prove his claim to that title, to such effect that Ahmed soon had the lamps lit and his master's couch prepared. Reggie had brought a well-equipped medical kit. It did not take long for me to clean the wound and bandage it. It was hardly more than a shallow cut and did not even require stitching. A little brandy soon restored Reggie to his senses, and his first words were an apology for having caused me so much trouble. "'What the devil were you doing outside my son's tent in the middle of the night?' Emerson demanded. "'Taking a walk.' Reggie replied faintly. I could not sleep. I know not why. I thought some exercise might do me good. As I drew near the boy's tent, I saw... I saw... Don't talk any more, I said. You need to rest. No, I must tell you. His hand groped for mine. You must believe me. I saw the tent flap open and a pale, ghostly form appear... It gave me quite a start until I realised it must be Master Ramses. Naturally, I assumed he was... He felt the need... Yes, go on, I said. I was about to withdraw when I saw another form, dark as a shadow, tall as a young tree, glide toward the boy. Ramses went slowly toward it. They met, and the dark shape stretched out its arms to grasp the boy. The gesture broke through my paralysis of surprise. Realising that danger threatened Ramses, I rushed to his aid. 
needless to say, I had no weapon. I grappled with the man, for a man it was, with muscles like bands of rope, who fought with the ferocity of a wild beast. The effort of speech had exhausted him. His voice faltered, and he said feebly, I remember nothing more. Guard the boy. He... I put my finger on his lips. No more, Reggie. You are exhausted by shock and loss of blood. Have no fear. We will watch over Ramses. May the grateful thanks of his devoted parents console you for your injuries, and may you sleep in peace, knowing that you... <clears throat> said Emerson forcibly. If you want him to rest, Amelia, why don't you stop talking? It seemed a reasonable suggestion. I instructed Ahmed to watch over his master and call me at once if any change in his condition occurred. As we retraced our steps, I suggested to Emerson that Ramses had better spend the rest of the night with us. We may as well, said Emerson. There is not enough of the night left for... Ramses, what have you got to say for yourself? Quite a good deal, Papa, said Ramses. I thought as much. Well? Ramses took a deep breath. To begin with, I have no recollection whatever of leaving my tent. I saw no mysterious dark form. I saw no struggle. Ha! Emerson exclaimed. Then forthright lied. Not necessarily, Papa. He may have exaggerated the ferocity of the struggle. I have observed that men do when they are attempting to prove their valour. What woke me was a summons, as I thought, a voice calling my name with considerable urgency. I took it to be Mamma's voice and responded. But I have no clear memory of anything beyond that until Mamma took me by the shoulders and shook me. We had reached our tent. I got out the extra blankets and made a sort of nest for Ramses beside our sleeping mats. But when I would have settled him on them, he resisted. One more thing, Mamma. When you saw me searching the ground... I suppose you were playing detective? A very silly habit of yours, Ramses. You are only a little boy, after all. You should have left that to Mamma and Papa. It occurred to me that if the assailant had left any clue... He might return and remove it before morning, said Ramses. Criminals are not so careless as to leave incriminating evidence lying about, Ramses. You have been reading too many romances. No doubt that is generally the case, Mamma. But this criminal did leave evidence. I presume it was torn from his head in the struggle. From the folds of his voluminous white nightgown, he produced an object that he offered for my inspection. It was a cap of a type with which I was very familiar, though this example was a good deal cleaner than most of the ones I had seen on the heads of Egyptians. It was not a popular item of dress in Nubia, where most men preferred a turban. <clears throat> said Emerson, inspecting it. The pattern resembles some I have seen in Luxor. Could Forthright's assailant have been his own servant? He's an insolent sort of fellow. Reggie would surely have recognised him, I said, shaking my head. None of our men wear such a thing, but a clever malefactor might assume an object of attire as a disguise, or... Here I stopped and gazed with a wild surmise upon my son who returned my stare with an expression so limpid-eyed and innocent it was practically tantamount to a confession. The art of disguise was one of Ramsay's hobbies. He was somewhat restricted in the practice of it since his size limited him to imitating only the juvenile portion of the population. But I had a nasty feeling that as his height increased, so would his expertise. Ramses, I began, but before I could proceed, Ramses produced another strange object. I also found this near the scene of the crime, Mamma. To my mind, it is even more provocative than the cap. Emerson let out a muffled exclamation and snatched the thing from the boy's hand. At first glance, I could see nothing to explain the concentrated attention with which he regarded it. 
It was a shaft of what appeared to be reed, only a few inches long. The jagged end suggested it had been broken off a longer object. The other extremity ended in a bit of wood, to which was attached a blunt, rounded stone shaped like a miniature club. At the point where the wood joined the reed, a band of pierced decoration ornamented the shaft and, one presumed, helped to hold the two together. "'What on earth?' I exclaimed. Emerson shook his head, not in denial, but in dazed disbelief. "'It is an arrow, or part of one.' "'There is no point,' I objected. "'This is the point, or pile, as it is called in archery.' Emerson's fingernail flicked the rounded stone. "'It is attached to this piece of wood, which is, in turn, tanged to the shaft. "'Footed, in other words. "'The point is blunt, because it was designed to stun, not to kill. "'I see.' "'I leaned over to examine the object more closely, noting the delicacy of the decoration. "'It reminds me of something, but I can't remember where I saw it. "'No? Then I will refresh your memory.' Emerson's eyes remained fixed on the broken arrow. The hunting scenes and the Theban tombs. That is where you saw such an arrow. This is identical with the weapons used by the nobles of ancient Egypt when they hunted fowl in the marshes. Identical, Peabody. Except that it cannot be more than a few years old. Chapter 6 the Ghost of a Bowman of Kosh Long after I had sought my couch, Emerson sat silent in the lamplight, turning the broken shaft over and over in his hands with the absorbed fascination of a connoisseur inspecting the rarest of gems. He had thrown off his robe. Shadows moulded the broad bands of muscles on his breast and arms. Shadows sculpted his strong cheekbones and intellectual brow and deepened the dimple, or cleft as he prefers to call it, in his manly chin. It was a sight to stir the strongest sensations, and since I was forced by circumstances to repress them, they left a lasting imprint upon my heart. Well, of course, I knew what he was thinking, even though he had refused to discuss the matter. For one thing, he was afraid I would remind him of his careless jest concerning Reggie's earlier injury. The ghost of one of the bowmen of Kush, he had said. And here, before our very eyes, was a fragment of an arrow that might have been carried by one of those very archers. Mayhap the bow had not been used in this area for a thousand years. I was willing to take Emerson's word for that. But one of the ancient names for Kush was Land of the Bow. And Commander of the Bowmen of Kush was a military title of the late Egyptian Empire. I fell asleep at last, and when I awoke I was alone. An unnatural silence prevailed. No shouted commands, no sound of the tuneless singing with which the men lightened their labours. Then I remembered that it was the day of rest, and that the men were gone. Still, it was strange that Emerson had taken pains not to waken me. Stranger still that Ramses had managed to leave the tent without making a racket of some kind. A hideous foreboding seized me, and I hastened to rise. For once my foreboding portended nothing in particular. I found Emerson seated in a chair before the tent, calmly drinking tea. He greeted me with a cheerful good morning and the hope that I had slept well. "'Better than you,' I said, remembering my last glimpse of him the night before, "'and noting the shadows of sleeplessness that darkened his eye-sockets. "'Where is Ramses? How is Reggie getting on? Why didn't you wake me earlier? "'What—' "'The situation is under control, Peabody. "'I will make you a cup of tea while you change into more suitable attire. "'Really, Emerson, Mr. Forthright will be joining us shortly.' His injury was less severe than you believed. Curious, isn't it, that his injuries always are less severe than you believed them to be. I don't blame you for exposing yourself to him last night in that fetching but flimsy garment. 
I make all due allowances for your understandable state of agitation, but a repetition of the error might be taken amiss. By you, you mean? By me, my dear Peabody. Torn between annoyance and amusement, I retired and followed his suggestion. When I returned, I found them all assembled, Ramsay squatting on the rug, Reggie seated in a chair next to Emerson. He leapt to his feet with an alacrity that went far to support Emerson's assessment of his condition, and insisted on offering me a chair before he reassumed his own. "'It is a great relief to see you looking so well,' I exclaimed, taking the cup Emerson handed me. "'You had lost a great deal of blood.' "'Obviously the blood was not his,' said Emerson. "'Lack of sleep always makes him short-tempered.' "'Quite right,' Reggie agreed. "'As I told you, I grappled with the fellow. "'A most courageous act,' said Emerson. "'For you were unarmed, were you not? "'A man going for a peaceful moonlight stroll "'does not ordinarily carry a weapon.' "'No, not ordinarily. "'I, um... "'Is the knife yours, forthright?' Emerson whipped it out of his pocket and brandished it under Reggie's nose. No, that is... For heaven's sake, Emerson, stop interrupting him, I exclaimed. How can he explain what happened when you won't let him finish a sentence? Emerson glowered at me. The implications of my questions must be obvious to you, Amelia, and to Mr. Forthright, if he... They are indeed obvious, Emerson. It is your tone to which I object... You do not ask, you interrogate like, Curse it, Amelia! A burst of hearty laughter from Reggie ended the discussion. Please don't quarrel on my account, my friends. I understand what the professor is getting at, and I don't blame him for having doubts. As he says, a man bent on a peaceful errand does not go armed. I might claim that a sensible man would go armed in this region... But had I feared encountering a wild animal or wilder man, I would have strapped on my revolver or carried a rifle. Precisely, Emerson growled. It did not occur to me to take such a precaution, Reggie continued. It happened just as I told you. Seeing the shadowy figure about to seize the boy, I flung myself upon him. He drew a knife. We struggled for possession of it, and after being wounded slightly, I got it away from him. To be honest, I don't remember clearly what happened afterward, but I have a vague recollection of striking a blow and hearing a muffled cry before unconsciousness overcame me. There was a brief silence. Then a voice murmured, Yet who would have thought the old man had so much blood in him? Emerson nodded. Well put, Ramses. Your mamma will no doubt be happy to hear you quote from a more literary source than your favourite thrillers. There was a great deal of blood. And your retainer has disappeared, said Reggie. What? I exclaimed. Kemet has gone? He and both his men, Emerson said. Another silence ensued, longer and more fraught with emotion. Finally, Emerson squared his shoulders and addressed the group in the voice that never ceased to thrill me, the voice of a leader of men. Let us consider this situation coolly and rationally, without prejudice. Something deucedly peculiar is going on. I started to speak. Emerson turned his burning blue gaze upon me. I will invite your comments, my dear Peabody, when I have finished... Until then, I beg you, all of you, will permit me to speak without interruption. Suddenly, my dear Emerson, I murmured. <clears throat> said Emerson. Very well. When Lord Blacktower called upon us with his preposterous story, I reacted as any sensible individual would, with incredulity. That very night, an odd incident occurred. You know of it, Mr. Forthright. No comment, please. A simple nod will suffice. Thank you. At the time, I was unable to see any connection between this incident and Lord Blacktower's proposal. 
for the reason that no such connection was apparent. Nothing else untoward occurred until we reached Nubia. You may recall, Peabody, the curious incident of Ramses walking in his sleep. He went on hastily before I could reply. One such event might be dismissed as meaningless. A second similar event, such as occurred last night, raises certain doubts. Again, Ramses claims to have heard a voice call him. He remembers responding to the call, but has no recollection of anything else. Any attempt to concoct a theory that would weave these bizarre events into a connected narrative would be no more than idle fiction. The blazing blue eyes turned toward me, and such was their hypnotic effect that I made no attempt at rebuttal. However, Emerson went on, one of the objects found at the scene of the crime last night is, to say the least, remarkable. This fragment, he took it from his pocket, with the air of a conjurer pulling a rabbit from his hat, and waved it before us. This scrap of broken arrow changes the entire affair. I will stake my reputation, which is not inconsiderable, on the fact that nothing remotely like it is manufactured today by any known tribe of Nubia, Egypt, or the surrounding deserts. He paused for effect. This was a mistake, as he immediately realised. Before he could resume, Ramses said, With all respect, Papa, I believe we all with the possible exception of Mr. Forthright, have followed your reasoning and anticipated your conclusion. If this arrow was not shaped by any known people, then it must have been made by some member of a group hitherto unknown. It is the second such unique artefact you have encountered. The armlet shown you by Mr. Forth fourteen years ago was the first. Good heavens! The words burst from Reggie's throat. What are you getting at? You cannot mean... Curse it, Emerson shouted. Be still, all of you. You have interrupted the reasoned discourse. Well, now, my dear, you were going on at quite unnecessary length, I said, soothingly. It is obvious, isn't it? This bit of arrow was broken off during the struggle last night. It must have been carried by Reggie's assailant, who was caught in the very act of luring Ramses out of his bed. For the second time since we arrived in Nubia... Why he wants Ramses, I cannot imagine. That is to say, I do not know. But one might reasonably conclude that abduction rather than physical assault was his aim, for he had plenty of time to attack the boy on both occasions. As to why he wishes to kidnap Ramses... Excuse me, Amelia, said Emerson softly. His face was crimson, and his voice shook with repressed emotion. Did I hear you say something about going on at unnecessary length? You are right to remind me, Emerson. I was about to commit the same error. I brandished my teacup and raised my voice to a thrilling pitch. Let us cut through the cobwebs of speculation with the sharp sword of common sense. The lost civilization Willoughby Forth set out to find is a reality. He and let us hope his wife, are prisoners of this mysterious people. One or more of them has pursued us from the wilds of Kent to the barren deserts of Nubia. Their occult powers, unknown to modern science, have enslaved Ramses, and even now... But here my audience cut me short with a chorus of comment. Dominating the other voices was the deep, infectious laughter of my spouse. Not until his whoops of mirth had subsided could any other sound be heard, and that sound, as one might have expected, was the voice of Ramses. Mamma, I beg your pardon, but I must take exception to the word enslaved, which is not only exaggerated and unsubstantiated, but derogatory, implying as it does... Never mind, Ramses, said Emerson wiping the tears of amusement from his eyes with the back of his manly hand. Emerson never has a clean handkerchief. Your mamma did not mean, I am sure, to insult you. Her imagination... I do not see that imagination enters into it, I said loudly, 
if either of you can come up with a better explanation for the strange events of the past. Ramses and Emerson spoke at once, then fell silent, and Reggie remarked, as if to himself, Conversation with the Emerson family is stimulating, to say the least. May I say a word? He went on without giving any of us an opportunity to reply. I take it, Professor, that you disagree with Mrs. Emerson's conclusions. What? Emerson stared at him in surprise. No, not at all. But, sir, my amusement derived not from Mrs. Emerson's deductions, but from her manner of expressing them, Emerson said. I can think of other explanations, but hers is certainly the most probable. Reggie shook his head dazedly. I don't understand. It is difficult for an ordinary intelligence to follow the quickness of Mrs. Emerson's thought, Emerson said kindly. And she does. Oh, yes, my dear, you do. She does exaggerate. There is no question of occult powers here. Ramsay's odd behaviour is easily explained on the grounds of a post-hypnotic suggestion instilled by the conjurer whom we encountered in Halfa. If we assume, as we now have reason to do, that the message from Willoughby Forth was genuine... It must have been brought to England by a member of the group that holds him prisoner. For otherwise, the messenger would have identified himself and explained how the paper came into his hands. That same mysterious messenger may have shed the blood we found at our gate. But if he was wounded, who shot him and why? Can we conclude that there are two different groups of people involved, one hostile to the other? The conjurer in Halfa and the presence in camp last night of a man carrying an arrow of an antique and unknown pattern indicate that some member of one of the postulated groups has followed us from England for purposes, uh, for purposes impossible to explain at this time. Nonsense, I exclaimed. The purpose is obvious. It is to prevent us from setting out to rescue Willoughby Forth and his poor wife. Cuss it, Amelia. There you go again, Emerson cried. That purpose would have been more readily achieved by leaving us strictly alone. They, whoever they are, cannot suppose we will sit calmly by while they lure our son into their clutches. You have a point there, Emerson, I admitted. Then may we conclude that they want us to set out to rescue the fourths? Cast if I know, said Emerson, candidly. A brief discussion followed this noble admission of fallibility. Pondering, we sipped our cooling tea. Finally, Reggie asked timidly, What are you going to do, Professor? Emerson set his cup in the saucer with a decisive thump. Something must be done. Quite. I said, with equal decisiveness. But what? Reggie demanded. Hmm. Emerson fingered the cleft in his chin. Well, I am certainly not going to set out on some harebrained expedition into the desert. We might try to hypnotise Ramses again, I suggested. He may know more than he is aware of. Ramses uncurled himself from his squatting position and rose to his feet. With all respect, Mamma, I would rather not be hypnotized again. From my reading on the subject, I feel it is a dangerous activity when practiced by one who is untrained in its techniques. If you are referring to me, Ramses, I began. Weren't you referring to yourself? Emerson inquired, his eyes twinkling. He put a friendly hand on Ramsay's shoulder. Sit down, my son. I won't let Mamma hypnotize you. Thank you, Papa. Ramsay sank down, keeping a rather wary eye on me. I have given the matter considerable thought, and I can say with some certainty that the voice I thought I heard, and that I assumed to be that of Mamma, was no more than my own interpretation of a wordless but urgent demand. I heard it as a single word. Come. Come? Where? Emerson asked softly. 
Ramsay's narrow shoulders lifted in the ineffable Arabic shrug, but his normally imperturbable countenance showed more than a trace of perturbation. There. His outflung arm indicated the western desert, barren under the steaming sun. A shudder ran through my limbs. Ramses, I exclaimed, I insist that you... No, no, Emerson said. No hypnotism, Amelia. I agree with Ramses that it might do more harm than good. It appears that something must be done, however. We can't have Ramses trotting around the desert or guard him every second. His eyes were fixed on the far horizon, where sand faded into sky, and the longing in his mind was as clear to me as if he had shouted it aloud. The lure of the unknown and of discovery, it called to that sensitive and brilliant spirit as strongly as the unknown force called his son. Had he been alone, with no fears for my safety or that of Ramsay's, he would have set out on the greatest adventure of his life. I remained respectfully silent in the presence of that noble forbearance, and because I was trying to think how best to express my own opinions on the subject. An expedition must be mounted, Emerson said at last, but not by me and not without careful preparation. Unpleasant as the prospect may be, I will consult with Slatin Pasha and the military authorities at the camp. They won't believe you, Emerson, I cried. The evidence is too complex for their limited minds to comprehend. Oh, my dear, they will mock you. Think how Budge will laugh. Emerson's lips writhed with fury. It must be done, Peabody. There is no other course. If it were only a question of searching for our hypothetical lost culture, we could wait a year, plan a proper expedition, gather supplies and sufficient manpower. But Forth and his wife may be in deadly danger. Delay could prove fatal. But... But, Reggie gasped, Professor, this is a complete volte face. In England, you laughed at me. You refused my grandfather's request. What has changed your mind? This. Emerson picked up the broken arrow. To you, it may seem a fragile reed on which to risk men's lives. It is useless to explain. You would not understand. His eyes met mine. It was one of those thrilling moments of absolute communication that so often occurs with my dear Emerson and myself. But you, that silent message said, you understand me, Peabody? And of course I did. I see, Reggie said, though it was evident he did not. Well then, you are right, Professor. An expedition must be mounted, and certainly not by you. Not while you bear the responsibility for these precious lives, and not by the military authorities, who will never be convinced to act in time if they act at all. Rising to his feet, he stood straight and tall, his hair blazing in the sunlight. You will assist me with advice, I hope. Help me acquire the necessary camels, servants, supplies. Sit down, you young idiot, Emerson growled. What melodrama! You are incapable of leading such an expedition, and in any case, you could not set forth this instant. I added my entreaties to Emerson's. My husband is right, Reggie. We have a great deal to discuss before any action is taken. As Emerson has said, this broken arrow is of paramount importance. Was it snapped off during the struggle between you and your assailant last night? Could you have mistaken some other man of the same height and build for Kemet? I cannot believe it was he, and yet his disappearance does cast doubt about his... A high-pitched cry from Reggie stopped me. He leapt to his feet, eyes popping, and fumbled for the revolver at his belt. Without stirring from his chair, Emerson stretched out a long arm and clamped his fingers over Reggie's wrist. Reggie let out an oath. I turned. Behind me stood our missing servant. Kemet folded his arms. Why does the white man scream like a woman? 
I could not blame Reggie for being startled by Kemet's sudden reappearance, and my reply was a trifle acerbic. "'The day you hear me utter a sound like that, Kemet, you will be justified in making such an insulting comparison.' Mr. Forthright was surprised, and so are we all. We believed you had left us. "'You see it is not so, lady. "'Where are your friends?' "'It is the day of rest,' said Kemet. "'The corners of his thin lips compressed as they did "'when he had said all he intended to say. "'So I did not ask where and how his friends spent their free time. "'Besides, as Emerson would have pointed out, "'it was none of my business. "'Very well,' I said. "'I apologise for my unjust suspicion, Kemet. "'Go and enjoy your day of rest.' "'Kemet bowed and walked away. "'Ramses rose to his feet and was following when I called him back. "'From now on, young man,' I said sternly, "'you are not to be out of my sight or that of your papa. "'We have no reason to think that Kemet is involved in our difficulties, "'but until we know who is, you must not go off alone with any one. "'Quite right, Peabody,' said Emerson. "'And that prohibition includes you, Mr. Forthright.' "'Devil take it, you are far too quick to attack people. "'If I let loose of your arm, will you sit down and behave yourself?' "'Certainly, Professor,' Reggie said. "'He passed his free hand across his perspiring brow. "'I apologise. "'The way he appeared, like a genie from a bottle. "'You think me rash, but I swear to you, "'that man knows more than he is saying. "'I cannot imagine why you trust him as you do.' "'I don't trust anyone,' said Emerson with a snap of his teeth. "'Now let us stop wasting time and get back to business. "'I hope you were not serious when you announced your intention "'of going off to look for your uncle.' "'He released Reggie's arm. "'The young man rubbed it, wincing. "'Quite serious, Professor. "'I am only ashamed that it took me so long to decide. "'I intend to leave immediately for the military camp.' to ask the advice of Slatin Pasha and begin gathering the necessary supplies. Emerson took out his pipe and tobacco pouch. It might be wise to ascertain first where you intend to go. You don't even have the purported map your grandfather received. He left it with me, and I never returned it. A smile spread across the young man's face. My grandfather took a copy of it, Professor, and I, in turn, took a copy of his. I have it with me, and I rather suspect you have the original here. Am I right? Emerson concentrated on filling his pipe. Not until he had completed the exercise and lit the thing did he speak. Touché, Mr. Forthright. Let's have a look at yours, then. Reggie took a folded paper from his pocketbook and spread it out on the packing case that served as a table. The paper was thin but tough onion skin, upon which the newly drawn lines stood out with far greater clarity than they had upon the original. I append a copy of the map in order to facilitate the reader's understanding of the ensuing description, but I feel it necessary to warn said reader that certain details have been deliberately altered or omitted. The reasons for this will become apparent as my narrative proceeds. Along the right-hand edge of the paper, a sweeping loop indicated the great bend of the Nile. Two points along the river were labelled with initials only, GB and M, a dotted line that roughly paralleled the straight northern section of the river had been marked Darb L A, and another line running southwest from the southernmost part of the loop bore the identification Wadi L M. Near the left-hand margin of the page, a roughly shaped arrow accompanied the word Darfur. These features were known to me from modern maps. GB stood for Jebel Barkel, the great mountain across the river from our present location. M could only be the ancient Meroe. The Wadi El Melik, or Milk, one of the canyon-like depressions cut by watercourses long since vanished struck off from the river into the southwestern desert. 
The other scrawled set of initials must indicate a portion of the fabled Forty Days Road, Darb el Arbayin. The caravan route from Egypt, followed by the gallant traders of the ancient Egyptian kingdom. And Darfur, of course, was that western province of Nubia, which had been the terminus of the caravan route. The other lines and markings on the paper could be found on no known map. Some had been traced by Emerson over a decade earlier, and he now proceeded to explain the reasoning that had produced certain of them. There must have been an overland route between Napata and Meroe, he said, indicating the line that connected the dots marked M and GB. My own excavations at the latter site, hasty though they were, indicate that it was already a city of some importance when Napata was the royal seat. To go between the two by water would take considerable time and necessitate traversing the fifth cataract. The country was less arid at that time. Agreed, Emerson, agreed, I exclaimed. You need not justify your reasoning. But what is this line leading southwest from Meroe toward the Wadi el Melik? Pure hypothesis, said Emerson somberly. I am convinced that caravans travelled from Meroe and from Napata to the fertile oases of Darfur. Traces of ancient remains have been found along certain desert routes and in Darfur itself. The first part of this line, he pointed with the stem of his pipe, is based on some of those finds. I assumed that the routes from Meroe and Napata met at a certain point, possibly near or along the Wadi el Melik, and followed a common path farther westward. If the last survivors of the royal house of Kush fled Meroe when the city fell, they would, one presumes, have followed that road, since only along it could they depend on finding wells and water holes. And yet... His voice trailed off as he bent his frowning gaze upon the map. Someone had obviously disagreed with his reasoning for the line that struck off at an angle, almost due south from Jebel Barkel, had been added to his original sketch in the same thick black ink used to write the message on the scrap of papyrus Lord Blacktower had shown us. It was divided into segments, each marked by a Roman numeral, from one nearest the river to thirteen, at the point where the line ended in a curious little picture-drawing. At intervals along this route were scrawled numbers, not Roman, but the ordinary Arabic numerals in common usage, and several odd little signs that resembled ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs. I lost no time in proclaiming the obvious conclusions. The numbers along the route must indicate travel time, don't you think, Emerson? Thirteen days in all, from Napata to... The Holy Mountain, said Ramses. But that is what Jebel Barkle means. That is where we are now, from the Holy Mountain to the Holy Mountain. You interrupted me, Ramses, I said. And what is more, I beg your pardon, Mamma. Excitement overcame me. But why hieroglyphs? I demanded. Not only for the Holy Mountain, but here. This is ancient Egyptian for water, and here again the sign for... "'Obelisks, are they? Or towers, perhaps?' "'Or pillars,' said Ramses. "'They are not very expertly drawn. "'I believe Mr. Forth had some knowledge of the hieroglyphs. "'He may have chosen to employ signs known only to a few, "'in case his map fell into the wrong hands.' "'Emerson brooded over the paper. "'His pipe had gone out. "'Reggie took his own from his pocket, filled it, "'and offered Emerson a match. "'Thank you.' "'Emerson said, abstractedly. "'This is a much clearer copy than the original. "'You are certain of these Arabic numbers, forthright? "'For they appear to be compass readings, "'and any error in transcribing them could be literally deadly.' "'Reggie assured him he had copied the numbers exactly. "'I will admit to the reader in confidence "'that I had not realised the numbers might be compass readings.' The excitement that had set my heart pounding earlier was nothing to the thrill I felt at this announcement. 
for those numbers meant that the map was more than an idle fantasy. Someone had followed that trail. Someone had inscribed those numerals. And where one had gone, others could follow. It took three days to assemble Reggie's expedition. This was a remarkable achievement, and it would have taken much longer had it not been for Emerson's energetic help. And the fact that at the end of that time we had hired every willing man and every healthy camel. The group was small, dangerously small for such a trip, but there were simply no more beasts to be had. Emerson mentioned this depressing fact more than once, but his warnings had no effect on Reggie. The young man's dedication and courage moved me greatly, and surprised me too, if I must be candid. Evidently, it took him a while to make up his mind, but once he had made a decision, he stuck to it. Though Emerson never said so to Reggie, he was also favourably impressed. He admitted as much to me the night before Reggie's scheduled departure, as we reclined in our tent engaged in conversation. Conversation being the only thing in which we could engage, since Ramses now shared our sleeping accommodations. Emerson had reacted to this situation more calmly than I had expected. The only sign of perturbation he displayed was to smoke his wretched pipe incessantly. I never thought he'd stick to it, were Emerson's precise words. Blasted young idiot! I am tempted to cripple him a little, to keep him from carrying out this hair-brained scheme. Is it really very dangerous, Emerson? Don't ask stupid questions, Peabody. You know how it maddens me when you pretend to be an ordinary empty-headed female. Of course it is dangerous. A fit of coughing prevented me from replying. Emerson was smoking, and the atmosphere in the tent was rather thick. After a moment, Emerson went on. Forgive me, Peabody. My temper is a trifle short these days. I know, my dear. I too feel the pangs of remorse. For if we had not forgotten ourselves in the heat of enthusiasm and had maintained our original scepticism about Mr. Forth's quest for the lost civilization, Reggie might not have decided as he did. One might even say that he is taking this step to prevent us from risking our lives in the attempt. There could be no nobler... Oh, do be quiet, Peabody, Emerson shouted. How dare you say I feel remorse? I feel none. I did everything I could to dissuade him. I put my hand over his lips. You will wake Ramses. Ramses is not asleep, Emerson mumbled. I don't think he ever sleeps. Are you asleep, Ramses? No, Papa. The event of the morrow must induce in any thoughtful person the most serious reflections of wonder, doubt and inquiry. Yet every possible precaution against disaster has been taken, has it not? Emerson did not reply, for he was occupied in nibbling gently on my fingers. The sensations thus produced were quite remarkable, and indicated how effectively a talented and imaginative individual can overcome the limitations posed by the presence of a small, unsleeping child. "'Yes, indeed, Ramses,' I replied somewhat abstractedly. "'Mr. Forthright has sworn to turn back immediately "'if he does not find the first of the landmarks indicated on the map, "'and his camels are the best. "'Is something wrong, Mamma? Ramses asked in alarm. "'I will not describe what Emerson was doing. "'It has no part in this narrative.' "'No, Ramses,' I said. "'Quite the contrary. "'That is, stop worrying and go to sleep.' "'But of course he did not. "'And after Emerson had gone as far as he could go "'without attracting Ramses' attention, "'he had to leave off. "'Long after his steady breathing betokened his surrender to Morpheus, "'I lay awake, staring up at the dark canopy of canvas above me, and asking myself the same question Ramses had asked. Had every possible precaution been taken? Only time would tell. 
The caravan was supposed to set forth at dawn. But nothing ever happens on schedule in the east. It was nearer midday when Reggie at last mounted his camel. It lurched to its feet in the awkward way these beasts have. Reggie swayed and clutched the pummel with both hands. Emerson, standing beside me, let out a sigh. He'll fall off before he has got a mile. Hush, I murmured. Don't discourage him. At least the camel was in good condition. It was one of the prized white racing maharis, beloved of the Bedouin, and how Emerson had persuaded its owner to part with it, I dared not ask. The other beasts were the best of the ones I had been tending. The military authorities had flatly refused to lend any of theirs, but after seeing how effective my medications had proved, several of the local sheikhs had brought their animals to me for attention, and exorbitant payments had induced them to hire the beasts out to Reggie. Four of them were loaded with food and water. The latter, of course, was the most vital commodity. It was carried in goatskins, each containing slightly over two gallons. Four servants accompanied Reggie. Three were local men. The fourth was Daoud, one of Reggie's Nubian servants. He was a singularly unprepossessing fellow, with a huge, dirty black beard and a cast in one eye. But I could forgive him his looks because of his loyalty to his master. The other servants had flatly refused to go. Reggie carefully took one hand from the saddle and lifted his hat. The sunlight cast his features into strong relief and woke golden highlights from the smooth, oiled surface of his auburn hair. Farewell, Mrs. Emerson. Professor, my young friend Ramses. If we do not meet again... I let out a cry of distress. Don't harbour such thoughts, Reggie. Keep a stout heart and faith in the presence that protects the valiant. I will remember you in my prayers. Fat lot of good that will do, growled Emerson. Don't forget what you promised forthright. If the cursed map is accurate, you should find the first landmark, the Twin Towers, at the end of your third day of travel. You can give it another day if you like. You have food and water enough for at least ten days, but then you must turn back. Failure to find the first landmark will prove the map isn't to be trusted. If you do find it, you won't, but if you do, you will send a messenger back to us at once. Yes, Professor, Reggie said. We've been over that a number of times. I gave you my word, and even if I were inclined to break it, which I would never do, I hope I am sensible enough to know the risks attendant upon... He has been with us too long, said Emerson to me. He is beginning to sound like Ramses. Very well, forthright. If you are determined to go, why the devil don't you go? This speech rather spoiled the emotional tone of our leave-taking, and a further pall was cast upon the occasion by Reggie's Egyptian servant, who broke into a weird keening wail, like a paid mourner at a funeral, as his master rode away. Emerson had to shake him to make him stop. The sun was high overhead, and the moving figures cast no visible shadows. Slowly they dwindled, until they vanished into a haze of heat and blowing sand. I had never seen Emerson drive the men as he did during the following days. We were short-handed, thanks to the fact that we had sent two of our most dependable men with Reggie, and the fact that Kemet's friends never returned from their day of rest. When I questioned him about them, Kemet only shook his head. They were strangers in a strange land. They have returned to their wives and children. Perhaps they will come again. Oh, bah, said Emerson, there being very little else to say. It was not uncommon for local workers to tire of labour or fall victim to Hameway, but we had thought Kemet's men to be of stronger metal. Ramses began badgering us to let him return to his own tent, claiming that, A, Emerson's snoring kept him awake, and, B, it was unlikely he would be 
called, as he put it, a game. The first claim was untrue, Emerson seldom snored, and the second was utterly without foundation. As a compromise, Emerson had Ramsay's tent moved near to ours and occupied it himself. "'I may as well, Peabody,' he remarked gloomily. "'Being in such close proximity to you, without being able to act upon my feelings, has a deleterious effect on my health.' This is a paraphrase of Emerson's speech. The actual words he used were more direct and thus inappropriate for the eyes of the reading public. Fortunately for Emerson's health, mental and physical, we made a discovery that distracted him temporarily. It would have been a momentous event in any season and at any site, for the identification of a hitherto anonymous monument is of consuming importance. Here, after days of dull surveying and fruitless digging, it was as exciting as a tomb chamber full of treasure. The object itself was not impressive, only a weathered slab of stone, but Emerson at once identified it as the lintel of a small pylon gateway. It was buried deep in sand, which had to be cleared away from its surface and its surroundings, for Emerson refused to move it. In fact, he declared his intention of covering it up again as soon as he had finished studying it and recording the position in which it had been found. Kneeling in the narrow trench, he carefully brushed away the last layer of sand from the surface. The men gathered around, as breathless with anticipation as we. If the worn marks on the stone proved to be hieroglyphs, the discovery would mean a sizable bonus for the lucky finder. Unable to endure the suspense any longer, I lay flat on the edge of the trench and looked down. This movement sent a shower of sand onto the stone and the bowed bare head of my husband. He looked up, frowning. If you want to bury me alive, Peabody, go right on squirming. I beg your pardon, my dear, I said. I will be careful. Well, are they... is it... They are, and it is, a royal titulary. The curved ends of the cartouches are quite clear. He strove to speak calmly, but his voice quivered with emotion, and his long, sensitive fingers brushed the stone as tenderly as a caress. Congratulations, my dear Emerson, I exclaimed. Can you read the names? As I am sure I need not explain to my learned readers, the kings of Egypt and of Kosh had several names and titles. Official monuments always carried at least two of them. I'll have to do a rubbing and wait until the sun is at a better angle before I can be certain, Emerson replied. This local sandstone is so cursed soft it has weathered badly. But I think... Leaning close, he blew gently on one section... I see an N sign with two tall, narrow signs below. The first appears to be a reed leaf. Following are two long, narrow signs, and then a pair of rush plants. Yes, I think I can hazard a guess. The signs match the ones given by Lepsius for King Nastassen. Emotion overcame me. I leapt to my feet and let out a hurrah. Emerson replied with a volley of bad language. Evidently my sudden movement had precipitated some amount of sand into the trench. And the men began to cheer and dance around. I turned to Kemet, who, as usual, stood aloof from the others, watching their display with an ironic smile. Please, Kemet, fetch the thin paper and the magic drawing sticks, I ordered. And one of the lamps. Kemet turned his wide, dark eyes on me. Mustard, he repeated. He pronounced it differently, but I understood. Yes, is it not exciting? This is the first pyramid we have been able to identify with its owner. The first anyone has identified. Kemet murmured something in his own language. I thought I recognised one of the words from the vocabulary list Ramses had made. It meant omen or portent. 
I hope so, I said, smiling. I hope it is a portent of more such discoveries. Hurry, Kemet, the sand is unstable, and I don't like the professor to stay down there any longer than is necessary. Well, we managed to clear the stone and record the inscription. It was, as Emerson had thought, the titulary of King Nastarsen, Kaangre, one of the last rulers of the Merowitic dynasty. A stela belonging to this monarch had been obtained by Lepsius for the Berlin Museum. On it, Nastarsen claimed he had been given the crown by the god Armen and described various military operations against an invader from the north who may have been the Persian king Cambyses. It was a truly thrilling discovery and kept us busy for several days, but at the end of that time, even the hope of further finds could not distract me from my worries about poor Reggie. Emerson's discovery had been made on the sixth day after the young man's departure. It was on that evening we might first have expected to see him if the map proved to be an ignis fatuous, and he turned back, as he had promised. Darkness came with no sign of him. We did not mention him that evening. Even Ramsay is displaying a tactful reticence I would not have expected from him. After all, I told myself, this was the earliest moment at which we might have expected him. Any number of causes might have delayed him or his messenger. But after two more days had passed without word, I began to fear the worst. Emerson put on a good show of unconcern, but every now and then, when he thought I was not looking at him, I saw the bronzed mask of control crack into lines I had never seen on that beloved face. On the evening of the eighth day, I left camp, drawn out into the desert as if by a magnet. The western sky blazed with violent shades of copper and amethyst. The last glowing rim of the sun clung to the horizon as if reluctant to leave the realms of the living for the dark abode of night. The brilliance of the sunset was caused by particles of blowing sand. I thought of the violent storms that could bury men and camels in the space of an hour. The worst of it was we might never know their fate. A rescue expedition would be folly, for if they had wandered off their course by as little as a mile, they might as well be halfway across the globe. The sunset colours faded, not only because the sun was sinking, but because tears dimmed my eyes. I let them fall. Their release would relieve my heartache. I became aware of a presence, not by any sound or movement, but by some more mysterious sense. Turning my head, I saw Kemet. You weep, lady, he said. Is it for the fiery-haired youth? For him and the other brave men who may have perished with him, I replied. Then spare your tears, lady. They are safe. Safe, I exclaimed. Then a message has come. No, but I speak the truth. You speak words of kindness, Kemet, and I appreciate your attempt to cheer me, but how can you possibly know their fate? The gods have told me. He stood straight as a lance, his stalwart figure limbed black against the fiery sky, and his voice and manner carried a conviction that assured me he at least believed what he had said. It would have been rude as well as unkind to point out I had heard nothing from my God, and that I regarded that source as somewhat more reliable than his. Thank you, my friend, I said, and render my thanks to your gods for their kind assurance. I think we had best return now. It is getting... Kemet, what is it? For he had stiffened like a thoroughbred hound, scenting an invisible prey. I sprang to my feet and stood beside him, but though I strained my sight to the utmost, I saw nothing in the direction in which he stared so intently. Something comes, said Kemet. He was fifty feet away before I could gather my wits and follow him. He could run like a deer. By the time I caught him up, he was kneeling beside a prostrate figure. 
The brief twilight of the desert darkened the air as I too fell to my knees beside the body. But I saw immediately that the fallen form was, for once, not Reggie's. The dark robe and turban were those of an Arab. Kemet's eyes were better than mine. It is the servant of the fire-haired one, he said. Daoud the Nubian? Help me turn him over. Is he... He breathes, said Kemet briefly. I unhooked the canteen from my belt and unscrewed the top. In my agitation, I spilled more water on his face than into his parted lips. But no doubt the result was all to the good. Almost at once, the man stirred and moaned and licked his lips. Oh, he gasped. Water for the love of Allah. I allowed him only a sip. Not too much. It will make you ill. Rest easy. You are safe. Where is your master? The only answer was a tremulous whisper, in which I caught only the word water. In my agitation, I actually shook the poor fellow. You have had enough for now. Does your master follow? Where are the others? The... Black night covered his face and form, but his voice was stronger. I dribbled a little more water into his mouth, and he went on. They found us, the wild men of the desert. We fought. They were too many. Kemet's breath caught in a startled hiss. Wild men, he repeated. Too many, I repeated. Yet you escaped, leaving your master to die? He sent me, the man protested, for help. They were too many. Some they killed, but not the master. He is a prisoner of the wild men of the desert. Chapter 7. Lost in the Sea of Sand Slavers, said Slatin Pasha. The buzzing of a chorus of flies droned a dismal accompaniment to his words as he went on. We have done our best to stop that vile trade, but our efforts have only driven the ghouls who trade in human flesh farther from their customary roots. It must have been some such group who attacked Mr. Forthright. What does it matter who they were? I demanded. The question is, what are the authorities going to do about it? We were in Slatin Pasha's Tuchul at the military camp. Outside, a crowd of people squatted patiently on the mats, waiting for his attention. But he had given our problem precedence. The distinguished soldier coughed and looked away. We will, of course, mention the matter to any patrols that go in that region. I told you this was a waste of time, Peabody, said Emerson, rising. Wait, Professor, Slatin Pasha begged. Don't misjudge me. I would do anything within my power to assist this unfortunate young man. But you of all people should understand the difficulties. We are preparing for a major campaign, and we need every man. Mr. Forthright was warned that his search was both dangerous and futile. Yet he persisted in going. I would not, even if I could, persuade the Sirdar to endanger more lives. I administered a gentle kick to the shins of my spouse in order to forestall the contemptuous response I saw hovering upon his lips. Slatin Pasha did not deserve our contempt. No man knew better than he the tortures of slavery among savage people. His distress and his helplessness were equally plain to see. Once outside the Tuhul, we turned toward the market. The flies were particularly bad that day. They clustered like patches of black rot on every piece of fruit and formed a whining cloud around the food stalls. I will leave you to make the necessary purchases, I said to Emerson while I beg an additional supply of camel ointment and other medications from Captain Griffith. I started to walk away, but Emerson caught me by the shoulder and spun me around. His eyes sparkled wickedly, and his cheeks were flushed with rising temper. 
Yeah, wait, Peabody. What the devil are you doing? You have plenty of the cursed medicine. You got a fresh supply last time we came here. Only enough for a week, I replied. It is important to have an adequate amount, Emerson. Our lives may depend on the good health of the camels. The hand that held me tightened until it felt as if the fingers were digging into the bone. The eyes that looked deep into mine glowed like the purest blue water. Though the crowd of the Sukh jostled us on every hand, we might have been alone in the desert waste, no one seeing, no one hearing. I won't let you come, Peabody, said Emerson. Your tone lacks conviction, my dear Emerson. You know you can't prevent me. Emerson let out a groan so deep and heartfelt that a passing woman robed in dusty black forgot the modesty of her sex and turned a startled look upon the suffering foreigner. I know I can't, Peabody. Please, my dearest, I beg you. I implore you. Think of Ramses. I trust, said my son coolly, that no such consideration will affect your decision, Mamma. I fail to see that we have any other course than the one Papa has evidently decided upon, and it would be as impossible for me to remain behind as for Mamma to be parted from Papa. I am sure I need not trouble you with an expression of excessive emotion in order to convince you both that my feelings are as profound and as sincere as... I took it upon myself to stop him, since I knew he would go on talking until his breath gave out. Pedantic little wretch, I said, attempting to conceal my own emotion. How dare you appeal to affection in order to have your own way? It is out of the question, Ramses. You cannot come with us. Us, said Emerson. Us, now see here, Peabody. That is settled, Emerson. Whither thou goest, I fully intend to go, and I won't entertain any further debate on the subject. As for young Master Ramses... "'What alternative do you propose, Mamma? inquired that individual. "'I stared at him, at a loss for words. "'He stared unblinkingly back at me. "'Never before had he looked so much like his father. "'His eyes were deep brown instead of brilliant blue, "'but they held the same saturnine expression "'I had often seen in Emerson's "'when he backed me into a verbal corner.' for well, the alternatives were, to say the least, limited. Ramses could not be left alone at the excavation site, or in the army camp. Even if we could persuade the authorities to send him back to Cairo via military transport, which was impossible, I could not believe that a full army corps, much less a single officer, could control him. If I could get his solemn promise not to run away... But even as the idea occurred to me, I realized its futility. In a matter as serious as this, Ramses would not equivocate or prevaricate. He would simply refuse to give me his word. And then what? I felt fairly certain the army would not agree to putting him in irons. Curse it, I said. Damnation, said Emerson. Ramses, wisely, said nothing at all. A certain amount of equivocation on my part was necessary before we were able to start out. We had to borrow some of the army camels I had been tending, for no others were to be had at any price. This meant that our expedition had to be kept a secret from the military authorities. They might not have attempted to stop us from going, but they certainly would have objected to our unauthorized use of their property. Manpower, too, was in short supply. The most reliable of the workers had been sent with Reggie, and their failure to return quite understandably acted as a deterrent to other volunteers. Yet we persevered, as duty directed us, until we made a discovery that might well have marked the end of our endeavours. When Emerson went to look for Willoughby Forth's map, it was nowhere to be found. "'I tell you, Peabody, I put it in this portfolio!' Emerson roared, scattering the contents of the portfolio all over the tent. "'Don't tell me I am mistaken. I am never mistaken about such things.' 
years spent stumbling through the pitfalls of matrimony had taught me that it would be ill-advised to deny this ridiculous statement. In silence, I stooped to pick up the papers, and Emerson continued. It must be found, Peabody, though it is a frail reed upon which to risk our lives. It is better than nothing. Dowd has agreed to guide us, I said hesitantly. He's no more use as a guide than Ramsay's there. Less, in fact, Emerson added quickly, as Ramsay started to protest. If he were a Bedouin, familiar with the desert, that would be one thing. But he told me he has lived all his life in Halfa. No, we must have the map. We dare not set forth without it. I started to reply, but something stopped me, like an invisible hand placed over my lips. I can truthfully claim that I seldom suffer from indecision. Such, however, was the case now. Before I could make up my mind, Ramses emitted the small cough that usually preceded a statement of whose reception he was not entirely certain. Fortunately, Papa, there is a copy of the map at hand. I took the liberty of tracing it before we left England. Emerson dropped the papers I had handed him and spun around to face his son. His face shone with delight. Splendid, Ramses. Run and fetch it at once. It is the last thing we need. We will set forth at dawn. With a sigh, I stooped to collect the papers again. The die was cast, our fate determined, but not by me. I, too, had a copy of the map. The night before he left us, Reggie had handed me a little packet of papers, requesting me in manly but faltering tones to refrain from mentioning it or opening it until after his departure. I knew what it must contain, and my own voice was a trifle unsteady, as I assured him he could trust me to carry out his wishes, in the unhappy event that such action should prove necessary. When I did open the packet, I found what I had expected, Reggie's last will and testament, written in his own hand. There were also two letters, one addressed to his grandfather and the other to Slatin Pasha, a copy of the map was attached to this last document. I assumed the letter itself expressed Reggie's hope that the military authorities would carry on his quest if he fell by the way. Neither of the letters was sealed. I thought this a particularly delicate and gentlemanly touch on Reggie's part. Naturally, I would never dream of reading such private communications... But under the present circumstances, there was no honourable reason why I should have hesitated to admit I possessed a copy of the map. Why did I hesitate? I knew the answer as well as the reader must. Without the map, we dared not set forth. To supply the commodity that might doom us all to death was a responsibility I had lacked the fortitude to assume. The first pale hint of sunrise touched the eastern sky as we prepared for departure. I had anointed the camel's healing sores and forced a dose of the cordial, my own invention compounded of strengthening herbs and a modicum of brandy, down their throats. Emerson had expressed doubts about the brandy, but the camels seemed to like it. The baggage, carefully balanced and padded, had been loaded upon their backs, I placed my booted foot upon the foreleg of my kneeling steed and swung myself into the saddle. Ramses was already mounted, perched like a monkey atop a pile of baggage. Emerson followed suit. We were ready. I turned to survey the little expedition. Little it was, only a dozen camels, only five riders in addition to ourselves. One of them was Kemet. He had been the first to volunteer. In fact, he was the only one to volunteer. The others had only agreed after the payment of extravagant bribes. They were all silent. There was none of the cheerful talk or song or laughter with which they were wont to meet the day. The cold grey light cast a corpse-like pallor upon their gloomy faces and those of the friends and family members who had come to bid them farewell. Emerson flung up his hand. 
his deep voice rolled out across the empty waste. We depart with the blessing of God. My salami. The formal answer came in a ragged chorus. Nishuf wishak fikhir. May you be fortunate at our next meeting. I detected a certain lack of conviction in the voices, however, and a woman's voice broke into soprano lamentation. Emerson drowned her out with a sonorous rendition of an Arabic song and urged his camel to a trot. Gritting my teeth, for the motion of a trotting camel is the most painful thing on this earth, I followed his lead. In a cloud of sand, accompanied by song, we thundered away. As soon as we were out of sight of the others, Emerson allowed his camel to slow to a walk. I drew up beside him. Are we going in the right direction, Emerson? No. Emerson glanced at the compass and turned his beast slightly to the right. That was purely for effect, Peabody. A stirring departure, wasn't it? Yes, indeed, my dear. And it has had the desired effect. One of the men had continued the song. When will she say to me, young man, come and let us intoxicate ourselves? And the others were humming along. The cool of morning gave way to warmth and then to excessive heat. We paused to rest during the hottest part of the day in the shade of a rock outcropping. Deserts vary as people do. The great sand sea of the Sahara, with its sterile golden dunes, was far to the north. Here the underlying skin of the planet was sandstone, not limestone, and the flat surface was broken by rocks and gullies that marked the course of ancient waterways. Late in the afternoon we set out again. Only when approaching darkness made travel impossible did we stop to make camp. We had seen no sign of anyone who might have preceded us. Not even the bones of fallen men and camels that form grisly guideposts along such well-travelled routes as the Darb el Arbain. We are off all the known caravan routes, Emerson said when I mentioned this later as we sat around the campfire. The nearest part of the Darb el Arbain is hundreds of miles west of here. There is no known route between it and this part of Nubia. Still, I had hoped to find some sign of Forthright's passage, the dead ashes of a fire, discarded tins, or even the tracks of camels. The stars blazed like gems in a sky as cold as airless space. A chill breeze ruffled my hair. We sat in reflective silence until the moon rose, casting strange shadows across the silvered sands. The next day was a repetition of the first, except that the terrain became even more arid and forbidding. In that waste any object would have stood out like a beacon. Tracks, which Emerson identified as those of an antelope, were as plain as if they had been printed on the sand but we saw no signs of man. That evening, one of the camels showed signs of distress, so I gave it an extra dose of my cordial. In spite of this, it died during the night. I was not surprised. It had been the weakest of the lot. Leaving the poor creature lying where it had fallen, we pushed on. By the afternoon of the third day, the uncomfortable temperature changes from unbearable heat by day to freezing cold by night, and our failure to find any traces of Reggie's caravan were beginning to tell on even the hardiest. Sifting sand had rubbed our skins raw. Those unaccustomed to riding were stiff and sore. The men rode in sullen silence. An ugly haze veiling the sun did not lessen the heat, but awoke dire forebodings of sandstorm. I found myself falling into a kind of stupor as the camel plodded onward. It was hard to tell which ached more, my head or certain portions of my abused anatomy. I was aroused from my semi-slumber by a shout. Dazed and dizzy, I echoed it in fainter tones. But what is it? Emerson was too elated to note my enfeebled state. Look, Peabody, there they are. By heaven, the lunatic was right after all. 
At first, the objects he indicated seemed only another mirage, quivering as if viewed through water. They took on solider dimensions as we urged our beasts to a faster gait, and before long we had reached them. A pair of tall, rocky columns, like the twin obelisks marked on Mr. Forth's map. They formed part of a larger group of tumbled stones, rising above their lesser fellows like crudely shaped pillars, or the gateposts of a ruined doorway. It was a structure of some kind, Emerson declared a short time later. The discovery had enlivened him. He looked as fresh and cheerful as if he had spent the day roaming English meadows. I can't find any traces of reliefs or inscriptions, but they may have been worn away by blowing sand. We'll make camp here, Peabody, though it is early. I want to do a bit of digging. In this activity, he got scant help from the men. Groaning and protesting, they demanded an extra ration of water before they would consent to do anything at all. And they worked slowly and reluctantly. Only Kemet, looking more than ever like a bronze statue, pitched in with his usual zeal. At the end of an hour, Emerson was rewarded by a few scraps of stone and pottery, and another shapeless, ugly lump that brought a cry of rapture to his lips. Iron Peabody! An iron knife blade! It is meroitic beyond a doubt! They were here! They passed this way! Good God, this is incredible! I inspected the corroded lump doubtfully. How do you know it wasn't lost by a modern explorer or wandering Bedouin? There are occasional rains in this region, in summer, but it would take centuries, nay millennia, to reduce cold iron to this state. The Kushites worked iron. I have seen the black slag heaps around Meroe, like the ones at Birmingham and Sheffield. Turning to the men who squatted on the sand, looking like piles of dirty laundry, he shouted cheerfully, Rest, my friends, we must make an early start. He appeared not to notice the sullen looks with which they obeyed him. It would never have occurred to Emerson that he could not command any group who worked for him. Nor under ordinary circumstances would any such doubt have entered my mind. But these circumstances were far from normal, and the discovery that had enraptured Emerson had precisely the opposite effect on the men. We had water for only about ten days, According to the map, seven or eight days of travel would bring us to a source of that vital fluid. But if the map had proved to be untrustworthy, common sense would decree that we turn back while we still had a sufficient supply for the return journey. The men had hoped we would not find the first landmark and decide to give up. Well, I could sympathize with their point of view, but I felt a stirring of unease as I saw the ugly look one of them gave my unconscious husband. Daoud's willingness to return into the desert that had almost cost him his life had surprised and pleased me. He was a man of considerable stamina, for his recovery from his ordeal had been quicker than I had expected. However, he had turned sullen when Emerson rejected his advice on the route we should follow, and after repeated criticism from Daoud, Emerson had lost his temper. I am guided by the marks on the paper and the needle of the magic clock. That is the compass. If your master followed your lead, it is no wonder we have found no trace of him. He added a few well-chosen expletives that put an end to Dawood's complaints. At least he did not complain to Emerson, but I had an uneasy feeling that he was undermining the confidence of the other men. Still, we had two more days before we reached the point of no return, and there were no overt signs of rebellion when we set out the next morning, even though during the night another camel had passed on to wherever camels go. There were enough left to mount all the men, and I took care to renew their medication. The fifth day dawned hazy and still. The rising sun resembled a swollen, blood-red balloon. The sandstorm passed to the south of our path, but the outlying skirts of it filled the air with fine grit that rubbed skin raw and clogged breathing. 
One of the camels collapsed shortly after we set forth after the midday rest period. Less than an hour later, a second dropped. If there had been a particle of shade to be found, I expect the men would have insisted on stopping. But they went on in the hope of finding a better place. Toward evening, the wind turned to the north, and the gritty air cleared, giving us some relief, and as the sun sank lower, I saw a stark outline limbed against the brilliance of the sunset. It was not so much a tree as the skeleton of one, leafless and scoured bone-white by wind-driven sand. But it was unquestionably Forth's second landmark. We camped in what might have been its shade if it had possessed any leaves. Bathing was out of the question, of course, but we spared a scant cupful of water to sponge off the sand that had formed a crust on our perspiring faces and limbs. A change of clothing as well afforded great relief. As the chill of the desert night closed around us, Emerson and I sat by the small fire on which our meagre evening meal was cooking. He had lit his pipe. Ramses was seated some distance away, talking to Kemet. Beyond them crouched our riding camels, grotesque shapes in the cold moonlight. The men had placed their camp farther from us each night, a gesture whose significance did not escape me, but which I considered it best not to mention to them. When I mentioned it to Emerson, he shrugged his broad shoulders. They were the pick of a poor lot, Peabody. If I had had the time to send messengers to my friends among the Bedouin, I don't know what they're complaining about. Thus far, matters have gone very well. Except for the camels dying. The weak have been winnowed out, said Emerson sententiously. They were the weakest. The others appear healthy enough. I saw Dawood haranguing the men this evening, they were gathered around him like conspirators, and he broke off when he saw me coming. He was probably telling them a vulgar story, Emerson said. Good gad, Peabody, these womanish qualms are not like you. Are you feeling well? He reached for my hand. Within it, figuratively speaking, lay the means of altering Emerson's set purpose. I was not feeling well. All I had to do was admit to the feverish malady that had afflicted me since the previous afternoon, and we would be on our way back to civilization and a doctor as fast as Emerson could take me. But such a course was unthinkable. No one understood better than I the passion that drove him on into the unknown. Not only had Forth's map proved accurate, but the discovery of ancient remains substantiated the theory that along that hitherto unknown and unsuspected road had passed the merchants and messengers and the fleeing royalty of the ancient Kush. I was as eager as Emerson to discover what lay at the end of that road. At least I would have been if my head had not ached so much. Of course I am well, I replied crossly. Your hand is warm, said Emerson. You brought your medical kit, of course. Have you taken your temperature? I don't need a thermometer to tell me when I have a fever, and I know as well as any doctor what to do about it if I have. Don't fuss, Emerson. Peabody. Yes, Emerson. Emerson took my face between his hands and looked into my eyes. Take some quinine and go to bed, my dear. I'll dose the dead the cursed animals and bed them down for the night. If I am not entirely satisfied in the morning that you are in perfect health, I will tie you on a camel and take you back. Tears flooded my eyes at this demonstration of affection. One of the noblest ever made by man for the sake of woman. But my gallant Emerson was not forced to that agonizing decision. Fortunately, the men abandoned us during the night, taking with them the camels that carried most of our remaining food and water. 
The effect of this admittedly disconcerting discovery made me forget my discomfort, and when our greatly reduced party gathered to discuss the situation, I felt almost as alert as usual. Kemet, whom Ramses had discovered lying unconscious amid the trampled sand and camel dung that marked the men's former camp, had refused to let me treat his wound. It was only a bump on the head, he said, and his sole regret was that the blow had prevented him from raising the alarm. It wouldn't have mattered, I reassured him. We could not have forced them to go on. We do not use chains and whips like the slavers. No, but we might have uh, persuaded them to leave us food and water, Emerson said. Not that I blame you, Kemet. You are a true man and you did your best. It is my cursed stupidity that is to blame for our plight. I should have kept one of the supply camels with us, instead of trusting the men with them. There is nothing so futile as regret for what cannot be mended, I remarked. If a mistake was made, we all share the blame. True, Emerson said, cheering up. Precisely what do we have left, Peabody? Our personal possessions, changes of clothing, notebooks and papers, a few tools, two water skins, but both are less than half full, a few tins, a tin opener, two tents, blankets, <coughs> said Emerson when I had finished. It could be worse, but it certainly could be better. Well, my dears, and my friend Kemet. What shall we do? There are only two possibilities, for we obviously can't remain here. Either we go on, or we turn back, try to overtake those villains and force them to share the supplies. A general chorus of disapproval greeted this last suggestion. They have several hours start on us, and they will travel as fast as they are able, I remarked. The ugly man has a fire stick said Kemet. Daoud? Emerson gave him a startled look. Are you certain? He struck me with it, Kemet said briefly. It seems to me that we have no choice, said Ramses. According to the map, which has hitherto proved accurate, there is a source of water less than three days' journey from here. It would take twice that length of time to return to the river. We must go on. Quite right, said Emerson, jumping to his feet, and the sooner we start, the better. We camped that night in a wilderness of rock and sand, without even a dead shrub to suggest there had ever been a drop of water available. In order to spare the camels, we had abandoned all our non-essential baggage, including the tents, but as the long hot day wore on, all the beasts showed ominous signs of weakness. Sheer willpower of which I have a considerable amount, prevented me from admitting even to myself that I was in little better case. There was nothing with which to make a fire, so we dined on cold tinned peas and a sip of water, rolled ourselves in our blankets and sought what relief we could find in sleep. I will not dwell on the misery of the night or in our sensations the following morning when we found two of the three camels dead. My malady was of such a nature that it seemed to be relatively quiescent in the morning and grow worse as the day went on. So I had been able to conceal it from Emerson. He had, I am bound to admit, other things on his mind. So we went on until the event occurred which I have described, when the last camel dropped gently to its knees and, in a word, died. I dare say most individuals would have been speechless with horror at this catastrophe, but that condition has never affected the Emerson Peabody's. Adversity only strengthens us, Disaster stimulates and inspires us. I found myself considerably refreshed by our discussion, and as we proceeded on foot, after a brief rest in the shade of the camel, I dared to hope my illness had been overcome by quinine and determination.
mostly the latter. We had gone through the saddlebags and discarded most of their contents, since we could carry only the barest of necessities. The clothing on our backs, the remaining water skins, with their sadly depleted and evil-tasting contents, and a blanket apiece. The latter were essential, for the night air was bitter cold, and they could be arranged to offer some shade during the hottest part of the day. Ramses insisted on carrying his little knapsack, and of course my parasol could not be left behind. Kemet carefully buried the rest of our goods, though I attempted to dissuade him from expending effort on such trivial things as changes of linen and a few books, for I never travel without a copy of Holy Writ and something to read. After he had finished covering the hole, we started walking. I confess to considerable pride in Ramses. He had not voiced a word of complaint or alarm, and he had trotted briskly across the burning sands. Kemet, ever near him, slowed his steps to match the boys. My initial optimism proved false. The breeze that rose toward evening did not suffice to cool my burning brow. The terrain became ever more rough and broken, making walking difficult. Some distance ahead, a range of low hills, as arid and hard as the desert floor, crossed the route the compass indicated. They promised some illusion of shelter, and I kept telling myself that when I reached them, I could rest. But a sudden stagger betrayed me. The ever-watchful eye of my devoted spouse saw me falter, and his stalwart arms broke my fall. The soft sound of muted curses came like music to my ears as he lifted me, and such was the relief of resting against that broad breast, I let myself sink into a swoon. The blessed trickle of water between my parched lips roused me. It was blood-warm and tasted like goat, but no draught of icy spring water has ever been more refreshing. I sucked greedily until reason returned, then sat up with a cry, striking the container from my lips. Good God, Emerson, what are you thinking of? You have given me far more than my share. Mama is feeling better, said Ramses. They were gathered around me in an anxious circle. I lay in the shadow of a great rock, wrapped in a blanket. There are dead trees on the slope, said Kemet, rising. I will make a fire. It was welcome. The night air was intensely cold. After consultation, we agreed to pass around the brandy I carried for medicinal purposes. It lessened my headache, but made me uncommonly sleepy, so that I drowsed and woke and drowsed again. During one of these periods of wakefulness, I overheard the others talking. It was Kemet's voice that woke me. He spoke more loudly than was his habit. There is water. I know it. I have... I have heard the desert men say so. <coughs> said Emerson. We made slow progress today. At this rate it will take two more days. Half a day for a running man. Emerson's snort of scepticism was even more emphatic. None of us can run at that speed, Kemet. And Mrs. Emerson... He had to pause to clear his throat, poor man. She has the heart of a lion, Kemet said gravely, but I fear the demons are winning over her. I heard Emerson blow his nose vigorously. I wondered, vaguely, what he was using for a handkerchief. A small, hard hand touched my forehead. Mamma's awake, said Ramses, bending over me. Shall I give her a drink, Papa? Not under any circumstances. I said firmly, and drowsed off again. It seemed to me that I lay in that state, half waking, half sleeping, for the rest of the night. But I must have sunk into deeper slumber, for I woke with a start to find myself clasped close to Emerson's body. He was snoring loud enough to rattle my eardrums. I felt light-headed and weak, but comparatively better, 
and as the light strengthened, I found great comfort in contemplation of the dear face so close to mine. Not that it was looking its best. A prickly stubble of black beard blurred the contours of his jaw, and his firm lips were blistered and cracked. I was about to press my own lips against them when a shrill voice broke the silence. Mama, Papa, I hope you will forgive me for waking you, but I feel I must inform you that Kemet is gone. He has taken the water skin with him. Half a day to water for a running man. That was what Kemet had said and apparently he had decided to act upon it. By abandoning us, he had a chance at saving himself. I did not doubt that those long legs of his could eat up the distance as quickly as he had claimed, especially when he had water to replenish the moisture lost through perspiration. I am sadly disappointed in Kemet, I declared, as we passed round my canteen. Each of us took a sip, there was enough left, I surmised, for one more such indulgence. Fastening it onto my belt, I went on. I am seldom mistaken in my judgment of people. Apparently, this was one of my few errors. There was no need to discuss what we would do. We would go on, refusing to admit defeat, until we could go no farther. That is the way of the Emersons. But we were a sorry crew. Bearded and gaunt, Emerson led the way. Except for his bright eyes, Ramses looked like a miniature mummy, thin as a bundle of sticks, brown as any sun-dried corpse. I was only glad I could not see myself. We plodded doggedly on until the cool of morning passed and the sun beat down with hammer blows of heat. I began to see strange objects in the glimmer of furnace-hot air, mirages of palm trees and minarets, gleaming white-walled cities, a towering cliff of black rock topped by fantastic ruins. They blended into a grey mist like that of evening. My knees gave way. It was an odd sensation, for I was fully conscious. I simply had no control over my limbs. Emerson bent over me. We may as well finish the water, Peabody. It will only evaporate. You drink first, I croaked. Then Ramses. Emerson's lips cracked as they stretched in a smile. Very well. He raised the canteen. I focused my hazed eyes on his throat and saw him swallow. He passed it to Ramses, who did the same, and then gave it to me. I had finished the last of the water, two long, delicious swallows, before the truth dawned on me. You didn't. Ramses, I told you. Talking only dries the throat, Mama, said my son. Papa, I believe we can use one of the blankets as a litter. I will carry one end, and you... The harsh cackle that emerged from Emerson's throat was a travesty of his hearty laugh. Ramses, I am honoured to have sired you, but I don't think that idea is practicable. Stooping, he lifted me in his arms and started walking. I was too weak to protest. If there had been any liquid left in my body, I would have wept with pride. Only a man like Emerson, with the physique of a hero of old and the moral strength of England's finest, could have gone on as long as he did. As my senses swam in and out of consciousness, I felt his arms holding me fast, and the slow, steady stride that carried us forward. But even that mighty frame had its limits. When he stopped, he had just enough strength left to lay me gently upon the ground before he crumpled and dropped at my side. And his last act 
was to stretch out his hand so that it rested on mine. I was too weak to turn my head, but I managed to move my other hand a scant inch and felt another, smaller hand grasp it. As my senses faded into the merciful oblivion of approaching death, I thanked the Almighty that we were all together at the end, and that he had spared me the torture of watching those I loved pass on before me. Book Two. Chapter Eight. The City of the Holy Mountain. The hereafter was not nearly so comfortable a place as I had been led to expect. Not that I had possessed precise ideas of what lay beyond, for to be honest, the conventional images of angels and halos, harps and heavenly choirs, had always seemed to me a little silly. Not just a little silly, if I am to be entirely honest. Preposterous would be more like it. At worst, I believed there would be quiet sleep. At best, a reunion with those loved ones who had gone on before. I looked forward to meeting my mother, whom I had never known, but who I felt sure must have been a remarkable individual, and to finding my dear papa in some celestial reading room pursuing his endless researches. I wondered if he would know me. In his earthly existence, he was sometimes rather vague on that point. Delirium takes strange forms. If I had not been so confident of having lived a thoroughly virtuous life, I might have thought myself translated to some other place, for I felt as if I were being broiled on a huge griddle. Quantities of water were poured down my throat without assuaging my burning thirst. Worst of all, my demands for my husband went unanswered. I ran down endless corridors, walled in mist, following a shadowy form that ever retreated before me. Could my estimation of my moral worth be mistaken after all, I wondered? The worst punishment an offended deity could visit upon me was vainly to seek my dear Emerson through the limitless halls of eternity. After Eons of searching, I found myself no longer running, but walking with dragging steps down a long, sloping passageway, where walls and floor were of a flat, dull grey. Far ahead, a flicker of light appeared, and as I proceeded, it strengthened to a golden glow. I began to hear voices. Laughter rippled through them, and the sounds of sweet music— but despite the welcome they promised, my steps dragged, and I fought the force that drew me remorselessly forward, to no avail. At last the passageway ended in a beautiful chamber, filled with flowers and fresh greenery, and suffused with a brilliance brighter than sunlight. A throng of people awaited me. Foremost among them was a beautiful woman, whose heavy black tresses were wreathed with roses. With arms outstretched, she beckoned me to her embrace. Behind her I saw a face I knew, that of my dear old nanny, framed by the starched white frills of her cap. A venerable couple stood nearby, dressed in the antique styles of the early part of the century. I recognized them from the portraits that had hung in Papa's study. The other faces were unfamiliar, yet I knew with a certainty transcending mortal experience that in past lives they had been as dear to me as I was to them. 
All faces were wreathed in smiles. All voices cried out in welcome. My papa was not present, but then I had not expected he would be. No doubt he had become involved in some bit of fascinating research and forgot the appointment. There were children among them, but none had swarthy complexions and features a trifle too big for their faces. There were stalwart, handsome men, but none had eyes that blazed with blue brilliance or dimples in their chin. Summoning all my forces, I screamed that beloved name like an invocation. At last, at last, I was answered. Peabody, the well-known voice thundered. Come back from there this instant. The light vanished. The music and laughter faded into a long sigh, and I fell through limitless night into the peace of nothingness. When I opened my eyes, the vision before them bore a distinct resemblance to the Christian version of heaven. A cloud-like veil of gauzy white formed a canopy over the couch on which I lay, and hung in soft folds around it. The curtains stirred in a gentle breeze. When I attempted to rise, I found I could do no more than raise my head, and that not for long. But the thud with which it struck the mattress convinced me that I was not dreaming, or even dead. I tried to call for Emerson. The sound that came from my throat was scarcely louder than a whimper, but it brought immediate results. The footsteps that approached were steps I knew, and when he thrust the draperies aside and bent over me, I found the strength to fling myself into his arms. I will draw a veil over the scene that followed, not because I am at all ashamed of the strength of the mutual devotion that unites me with Emerson, or the ways in which it is manifested, but because mere words cannot describe the intense emotion of that reunion. When my narrative resumes, then, you may picture me in the affectionate grasp of my husband, and in a state sufficiently composed to take note of my surroundings. First, of course, I asked about Ramses. Fully recovered and inquisitive as ever, Emerson replied. He is somewhere about. With ever-increasing astonishment, I gazed about the room. It was of considerable size, the walls painted with bright patterns in blue, green and orange, and interrupted at intervals by woven hangings. A pair of columns supported the ceiling. They had been painted to imitate palm trees, with the fretted leaves forming the capitals. The bed stood on legs carved like those of lions. There was no headboard. The panel at the foot of the bed was gilded and inlaid with formalised flower shapes. Beside the bed was a low table with an assortment of bottles, bowls and pots, some of translucent white stone, some of earthenware. There was little more furniture in the room, only a few chests and baskets, and a chair whose seat was covered with the skin of some unknown animal. It was deep brown with irregular patches of white. So it is true, I said, on a breath of wonder. I can scarcely believe it, even though I see it with my own eyes. Tell me everything, Emerson. How long have I been ill? To what miracle do we owe our survival? Have you seen Mr. Forth and his wife? What is this place, and how has it gone undiscovered through all the years that... Emerson stopped my questions in a particularly pleasant manner, and then remarked, You shouldn't tire yourself, Peabody. Why don't you rest and take some nourishment, and then... No, no, I feel quite well, and I'm not hungry. The danger is that my brain will burst with curiosity if it is not satisfied instantly. Emerson settled himself more comfortably. Perhaps you aren't hungry. I must have poured a gallon of broth into you since last night, when you first showed signs of returning consciousness. You were like a little bird, my dearest, swallowing obediently when I pressed the spoon to your lips, but never opening your eyes. His voice deepened, and he had to clear his throat before going on. Well, well, that terrible time is over, thank heaven. And I certainly don't want to risk the bursting of that remarkable brain of yours. 
We may as well take advantage of this time alone while it lasts. There was a strange note in his voice when he pronounced the last words. So anxious was I to hear his story, however, that I did not question it. Begin then, I urged. The last thing I remember is being laid gently upon the sand and seeing you collapse at my side. Collapse? Not at all, my dear Peabody. I was merely taking a little rest before going on. I must have dozed off for a bit. When I opened my eyes, I could scarcely believe what they saw. A cloud of sand rapidly approaching, raised by the hooves of galloping camels. I got to my feet, for whether they were friend or foe, demon or human, I meant to demand assistance from them. They saw me, the troops swerved, and one rider drew out in front of the others. He was practically upon me before I recognised him, and I verily believe it was sheer astonishment that made me uh, lose control of myself for a brief time. When I awoke, I was surrounded by robed and hooded forms, one of which was pouring water over my face. I need not say, Peabody, that I turned from him to make certain you and Ramses were being attended to. It was Kemet himself who held a cup to your lips. He was soon pushed aside by another attendant, veiled in snowy white, who worked over you with an air of authority I had no wish to deny. Though my brain boiled with questions, I restrained them for the time. The most important consideration was your survival, my darling Peabody. After an anxious consultation, it was decided to proceed at the quickest possible pace, for you were in need of attention that could not be rendered under those conditions. Ramses, too, was in poor shape, though not as serious as yours. I saw him lifted into the grasp of one of the riders and helped place you on a remarkably clever sort of litter that had been rigged up, and then we set out. I rode beside Kemet and was able to satisfy some of my curiosity. He had not abandoned us. He had taken the only possible means of saving us. His first words were an apology for having been long. Living in the outer world, as he put it, had softened him. He was only able to run five miles at a stretch. The reception party he expected was waiting at the oasis, for that is what the water sign signified, a veritable oasis with a deep well. He led them back along the trail at full speed, and if ever there was a rescue in the nick of time. But... After we left the oasis and set out on the last stage of our journey, there were times, my dearest Peabody, when I feared rescue had come too late. Your medical adviser, if I may use that term, kept bathing and anointing you and pouring peculiar substances down your throat. You were in such dire straits. I dared not interfere. I had nothing better to offer... The only thing I could do was sample the bl blooming stuff myself before... Oh, my dear Emerson. Moved beyond words, I clung to him. What if it had been poison? It wasn't. Emerson squeezed me tight. But it was not until last night that I was sure you were out of danger. And you will be ill again, Peabody, if you don't rest... I have satisfied your curiosity. You have scarcely begun, I cried. How did Kemet know there was a rescue party at the Oasis? Are these people the descendants of the nobility and royalty of ancient Meroe? What is this place? How has it remained unknown? Answers to your questions would take days, not minutes, said Emerson. But I will try to give you a brief summary. As you know, there are many isolated peaks and larger massifs in the western desert. This place, the Holy Mountain, as it is called, is a massif hitherto unknown. We approached it in darkness, after riding through several miles of outlying foothills. The cliffs must be a thousand feet high, but they looked even higher, towering against the moonlit sky like the ruins of an enormous temple. Vertical erosion has carved them into a maze of natural pillars with winding passages between. And that fantastic vision, my dear Peabody, 
was all I saw. As soon as we reached the foot of the cliffs, Ramses and I were blindfolded. I protested, of course, but to no avail. Kemet was very polite, but very firm. There is only one way through the cliffs, and it is a closely guarded secret. I tried to keep track of the windings and turnings of the path, but I doubt I could retrace my steps. After some time, my camel stopped, still blindfolded. I was helped to dismount and assisted into a carrying chair. I had given Kemet my word I would not remove the blindfold. Otherwise, he politely but firmly informed me he would have me bound hand and foot. Did you keep your word, Emerson? I asked. Emerson grinned. His face was as tanned and fit as ever, if a trifle thinner, and I was pleased to see he was clean-shaven. How can you doubt it, Peabody? Anyhow, the chair was curtained all around. I couldn't see a thing. It was not difficult to deduce that the mode of power was not horses or camels, but human bearers. But I never saw them, because my blindfold was not removed until after we had reached this house, and they had departed. Nor, to be honest, was I concerned about anything except seeing you properly cared for. He paused in his narrative to administer a few demonstrations of that concern before resuming. The precautions taken by Kemet, in my case, explain one of the reasons why this place has remained unknown. I fancy the unfortunate Bedouin who happened to stumble on the secret entrance would not return to tell the tale. In fact, it is unlikely he would get so far. Groups of armed men who use the oasis as one of their bases constantly patrol the surrounding areas. As I observed, they disguise themselves as ordinary Bedouin, wearing the usual robes and headcloths. No doubt they have inspired some of the bizarre legends about raiders like the Tebu, whose camels are said to leave no tracks, and who purportedly drink the liquid from the bellies of those beasts. They probably also account for many of the stories about stolen camels and looted caravans. As for our friend Kemet, he broke off. Brace yourself, Peabody, he remarked with a laugh, and Ramses was upon us. As a young child, he had been given to extravagant displays of affection. But in the last year or so, these had become infrequent, owing, I suppose, to his notion that he was getting too old for such things. On this occasion, he quite forgot his dignity and rushed at me with such impetuosity that Emerson was forced to remonstrate. Gently, Ramses, if you please. Your mamma is still weak. Never mind, Emerson, I said speaking with some difficulty because Ramses had a stranglehold around my neck. In obedience to his father's order, he relaxed his hold and stood back, his hands clasped behind him. His lean little body was bare to the waist and brown as any Egyptian's. A short kilt or skirt of white linen reached to mid-thigh and was belted with a wide sash of vivid scarlet. But the most remarkable change was his coiffure. His hair, which was one of his best features, being black and soft like his father's, had grown rather long during our journey. Now it was all gone, except for a single lock on one side, which had been braided and bound with ribbons. The rest of his head was as bare as an egg. A cry of maternal anguish burst from my lips. Ramses, your hair, your beautiful hair! There is a reason for the alteration, Mamma," said Ramses. It is very good, very, very good indeed, to see you better, Mamma." His countenance did not echo the warmth of his words, but I, who knew that countenance well, saw the quiver of his lips and the moisture in his eyes. Before I could return to the subject of Ramses's missing hair, one of the hangings at the end of the room was lifted, and two men entered. They wore the same simple short kilt Ramses was wearing, but their military bearing and the tall iron spears they carried designated their profession as definitely as any uniform. 
they separated and turned to face one another, stepping as smartly as any royal guardsman, and grounded the spears with a muted clash. Next came a pair of individuals eerily veiled in white that covered them from head to foot. Like the soldiers, they took up positions on either side of the doorway. Two more men followed the mysterious veiled persons. They too wore short kilts, but the richness of their ornaments suggested high rank. One of them was considerably older than the other. His hair was snow-white, and he had a long mantle draped about his bony shoulders. His face was scored with wrinkles, but his eyes were bright, and he focused them on me with avid yet childishly innocent curiosity. A brief pause ensued. Then all six of them, soldiers, nobles, and swaddled forms, bowed low as a single individual entered with a stately stride. It was Kemet. But how incredibly changed! His strong, keen features were the same, his frame as tall and well-formed. Indeed, I had not realised how well-formed until then, for like the other men, he wore only a short kilt. His was finely pleated, and the belt that confined his narrow waist was inlaid with gold and gleaming stones. A collar of the same precious substances lay across his broad shoulders, and a narrow band of gold shone against the black of his hair. Kemet! I exclaimed, gaping at this apparition from the distant past, for I am sure the reader, like myself, recognises the costume as that worn by nobles of imperial Egypt. Still holding me, Emerson rose to his feet. That was his nom de guerre, Peabody. Permit me to present His Highness Prince Tarekenidal. The title seemed entirely appropriate. His bearing had always been royal, and I could only wonder why it had taken me so long to realize that he was no common tribesman. I was keenly aware of my own lack of dignity, cradled like an infant in Emerson's arms and clad informally. I did the best I could under the circumstances, inclining my head and repeating, Your Highness, I am deeply grateful to you for saving my life and those of my husband and child. Tarek Kenidal raised his hands in the gesture with which he had always greeted me, and which I now recognized, how could I have failed to do so, as one depicted in innumerable ancient reliefs. My heart is happy, lady. To see you well again. Here is my brother, the Count Amenislo, son of the Lady Bartare. He indicated the younger man, a chubby cheeked, smiling chap wearing long golden earrings, and the royal counsellor, high priest of Isis, first prophet of Osiris, Murtek. The elderly gentleman's mouth stretched in a broad smile that displayed gums almost entirely without teeth. Only two remained, and they were brown and worn. Despite the sinister appearance of his dental apparatus, there was no mistaking his goodwill, for he bowed repeatedly and kept raising and lowering his hands in salutation. Then he cleared his throat and said, "'Good morning, sir and madam.' "'Good gracious!' I exclaimed. Does everyone here speak English? The prince smiled. Some among us speak a little, and understand a little. My uncle, the high priest, wished to see you, and be sure your sickness was ended. His uncle was seeing more of me than I would have preferred, for my linen robe was sleeveless and sheer as the finest lawn. I have never been studied with such intense fascination by another than my husband, and it was clear, to me at least, that the old gentleman had not lost all the interests and instincts of youth. Oddly enough, I did not find his survey of my person insulting. It approved without offending, if I may put it that way. Emerson did not appreciate these subtle distinctions. He folded me up, knees to chest, in an attempt to conceal as much of me as possible. If you will permit me, Your Highness, 
I will return Mrs. Emerson to her bed. He proceeded to do so, covering me to my chin with a linen sheet. Murtek gestured. One of the white-veiled figures glided forward and approached the bed. Its feet must have been bare, for it made no sound whatever, and the effect was so uncanny I could not help shrinking back when it bent over me. The veils were thinner over the face. I saw a gleam of eyes regarding me. "'It is all right, Peabody,' said Emerson, ever watchful. "'This is the medical person I mentioned.' A hand appeared from amid the filmy draperies. With the brisk assurance of any Western physician, it drew the sheet aside, opened my robe, and pressed down upon my exposed bosom. It was not the professionalism of the gesture that surprised me. One of the ancient medical papyri had proved that the Egyptians knew of the voice of the heart, and where upon the body it could be heard. But the fact that the hand was slim and small... "'with tapering nails. "'I forgot to mention,' Emerson went on, "'that the medical person was a woman. "'How do you know it's the same one?' I demanded. "'I beg your pardon,' said Emerson. "'The visitors had departed, except for the medical person, "'whose duties appeared to include several a Western doctor "'would have considered beneath him.' After performing those services only a woman can properly render to another female, she was now occupied in heating something over a brazier at the far side of the room. I deduced that it was soup of some kind. The smell was most appetizing. I said, How do you know she is the same person who nursed me on the journey? I said. Those veils render her effectively anonymous. And since I have seen two people so attired, I assume it is a kind of uniform or costume. Or do all the women here go veiled? Your wits are as keen as ever, my dear, said Emerson, who had pulled up a chair to the side of the bed. The costume appears to be peculiar to one group of women, who are known as the handmaidens of the goddess. The goddess in question is Isis. And it seems that here she has become the patroness of medicine, instead of Thoth, who held that role in Egypt. Isis makes better sense when you come to think about it. She brought her husband, Osiris, back from the dead, and a physician can't do better than that. As for the handmaidens, one of them has always been here with you. But to be truthful, I can't tell one from the other, and I have no idea... How many of them there are? Why are you whispering, Emerson? She can't understand what we are saying. It was Ramses who replied. At my invitation, he had seated himself on the foot of the bed. He looked so like a lad of ancient Egypt that it was rather a shock to hear him speak English. As Tarek told you, Mamma, some of them do speak and understand our language. How did they... Good heavens, of course... I clapped my hand to my brow. Oh, Mr. Forth, I am ashamed that I neglected to ask about him. Have you seen him? Is Mrs. Forth here as well? You did ask, Peabody, and the reason why you did not receive an answer is twofold, said Emerson. Firstly, you asked too many questions without giving me an opportunity to reply. Secondly, well, um, to be frank... I don't know the answer. Far be it from me to be critical, Emerson, but it seems to me you haven't made good use of your time. I would have insisted upon seeing and speaking with the fourths. Ramsay sat quietly. Papa has sat by your side since we arrived here, Mamma. He would not have left you even to sleep if I had not insisted. Tears filled my eyes. The truth is, I was weaker than I had thought. "'and that made me cross. "'My dear Emerson,' I said, "'forgive me. "'Certainly, my dear Peabody.' "'Emerson had to stop to clear his throat. "'He had taken the hand I had offered him. "'He held it like some fragile flower, "'as if the slightest pressure would bruise it. "'Was I moved? Yes. "'Was I annoyed? Very.' 
I was not accustomed to being handled like a delicate flower. I wanted Ramses to go away. I wanted the handmaiden to go away. I wanted Emerson to seize me in his arms and squeeze the breath out of me and and tell me all the things I was dying to know. Emerson read my mind. He can do that. The corners of his mouth twitched, and he said affectionately, I have the better of you just now, my dear, and I mean to take full advantage. You are not yet fit for prolonged activity, or even conversation. Apply yourself with your usual determination to recovering your strength, and then I will be delighted to supply... Um, Supply answers to all your questions. He was right, of course. Even the brief interlude with Tarek, for so we agreed to call him, his full name being something of a mouthful, had tired me. I forced myself to eat the bowl of soup the handmaiden gave me. It was hearty and nourishing, thick with lentils and onions and bits of meat. Not chicken, I said, after tasting it, Duck, perhaps? Or goose? We have been served roast fowl on several occasions. They also raise cattle of some kind. The meat tastes strange. I have not been able to identify it. I forced myself to finish the soup to the last drop. Soon afterward, Ramses and Emerson took their leave. We sleep in the adjoining room, Emerson explained, when I protested... I am, and have always been, within reach of your voice, Peabody. Blue-veiled twilight crept into the room. I watched drowsily as the ghostly form of the handmaiden glided to and fro on her duties of mercy. As the darkness deepened, she lit the lamps. Small earthenware vessels filled with oil and provided with wicks of twisted cloth such lamps are still used in Egypt and Nubia. They are of immemorial antiquity. They gave a soft, limited light, and the oil was scented with herbs. I was almost asleep when the woman approached my couch and seated herself on a low stool. She raised her hands to her face. Was she about to unveil? I forced myself to breathe slowly and evenly, feigning slumber, but my heart pounded with anticipation. What would I see? A face as frighteningly lovely as that of Mr. Haggard's immortal she? The withered countenance of an aged crone? Or even, for my imagination had fully recovered if my body had not, a fair face crowned with silvery golden hair, that of Mrs. Willoughby Forth? She did unveil throwing the folds of linen back with a very human sigh of relief. The face thus disclosed was neither fair-skinned nor terrifyingly lovely, though it had a beauty of sorts. Like Prince Tarek's, her features were finely cut, with high cheekbones and a strong chiselled nose. A net of gold mesh confined the masses of her dark hair. I enjoyed the display of girlish vanity in her use of cosmetics on a face that was not meant to be seen. Coal that emphasized her dark eyes and long lashes, some reddish substance on lips and cheeks. She seemed so gentle and ordinary, in contrast to the enigmatic figure she had presented while veiled, that I debated as to whether I should speak to her. But before I could make up my mind, I fell asleep. For the next few days, I did little except sleep and eat. The food was surprisingly well prepared. Roasted goose and duck served with different sauces, mutton in a variety of forms, fresh vegetables such as beans, radishes and onions, and several kinds of bread, some shaped into little cakes that were sticky sweet with honey. The fruit was particularly tasty. Grapes, figs and dates as sweet as the incomparable fruits of Sukkot. To drink we were offered wine, rather thin and sour, but refreshing, a thick, dark beer and goat milk. Water was not offered, and I did not ask for it, since I suspected it would not be safe to drink unless it was boiled, and I had abandoned my tea with the rest of our supplies. At Emerson's suggestion, we made use of our forced inactivity to study the local dialect. 
I had hoped our knowledge of Egyptian would assist us, but except for certain titles and proper names, and a few common words, the language of the Holy Mountain was a different tongue entirely. Nevertheless, we made excellent progress, not only because of certain mental attributes modesty prevents me from naming, but because Ramses had already picked up a good deal from Tarek, alias Kemet, even before we arrived. And needless to say, he took full advantage of his position of instructor to his elders, and on several occasions I was sorely tempted to send him to his room. One night, I decided to try my burgeoning linguistic skill on my attendant. I let her finish her tasks and relax with face unveiled before I spoke. "'Greetings, maiden. I thank you for your good heart.' She almost fell off the stool. I could not help laughing. Recovering herself, she glared at me like any young woman whose dignity has been damaged. In stumbling meroitic, I attempted to apologize. She let out a flood of speech, which I could not follow. Then, visibly pleased at my lack of comprehension, she said slowly, "'You speak our tongue poorly.' "'Let us speak English, then.' I said in that language, making mental note of the adverbial form, whose meaning was quite clear. She hesitated, biting her lip, and then said in Meroitic, I do not understand. I think you do, a little. Do not all the high-born people of your land learn English? I can see that you are of the high-born. The compliment lowered her guard. I speak a small, not many words. Ah, I knew it. You speak very well. What is your name? Again she hesitated, looking at me askance from under her long lashes. Finally she said, I am Aminitere, first handmaiden to the goddess. How did you learn English? I asked. Was it from the white man who came here? Her face went blank and she shook her head. None of my attempts to rephrase the question or render it in my stumbling version of her language brought an answer. I learned a few things from her, however. She had never unveiled or spoken while Ramses or Emerson was present, but this was not, as I initially supposed, because of their sex. Only the goddess and her fellow handmaidens were supposed to see her face— she was unable or unwilling to explain why she made an exception in my case. I came to the conclusion that she found me so very unusual that she was not quite certain how to treat me. We got to the point where we could chat in a friendly fashion about cosmetics and food, and particularly about that subject dear to feminine hearts, clothing. My travel-stained garments had been carefully laundered and returned to me. She never tired of fingering the fabric, exploring the pockets, and laughing at the cut and style. She would have laughed even louder, I dare say, if she had known about corsets. Since I only had the one set of garments, I was forced to assume native attire. It was extremely comfortable, but rather lacking in variety, for all the women's clothing were nothing more than variations on a simple unshaped robe of linen or cotton. The most elegant of them, to judge by the fineness of the weave, were pure white, but some were brightly embroidered or woven with coloured threads. Possessing neither buttons nor clasps, they were open all the way down the front and were meant to be kept closed by means of girdles or belts. Having not much confidence in such doubtful expedients, I made a strategic use of pins and wore my combinations under the skimpier garments. Emerson was as deficient in the haberdashery line as I, and often wore one of the long masculine versions of the loose robe, or a linen shirt of local manufacture, but he steadfastly refused to appear in a kilt like the one Tarek had worn. At first I could not understand his modesty, for as a rule I had a hard time making him keep his clothes on. Uh, let me rephrase that. When on a dig, Emerson was only too prone to stripping off coat and shirt, and of course his hat, 
I objected to this because it struck me as undignified, even when there was no one to see except the workers. But I must confess that aesthetically the effect was extremely pleasing. And I suspected that Emerson was fully aware of my reaction to the sight of his bronzed, muscular frame. Yet now that he had a valid excuse to induce that reaction, he refrained. Finally, after what he was pleased to term your incessant nagging, Peabody, he agreed to change into an elegant set of garments that had been supplied and let me judge for myself. Since Aminit was present, as she always was, he retired into his chamber to change. When he appeared, flinging back the curtain with a passionate gesture, I could not repress a cry of admiration. His hair was almost shoulder-length by now, the thick, shining tresses were held back from his noble brow by a crimson fillet studded with gold flowers. The rich colours of turquoise and coral and deep lapis blue in the broad collar upon his breast glowed against his deeply tanned skin. Armlets of gold and gemstones circled his wrist. A wide girdle of the same precious materials supported the pleated kilt that bared his knees, and I managed to transform my laugh into a cough. But Emerson's face turned a pretty shade of mahogany, and he hastily retreated behind the bed curtains. I told you, Peabody, curse it, my legs. They are very handsome legs, Emerson. Then your knees are quite... They are white, shouted Emerson from behind the curtains. Snow white, they look ridiculous. They did rather. It was a pity, for from the crown of his head to the hem of his kilt he was a picture of barbaric manly beauty. After that I said no more about changing clothes, but I sometimes saw Emerson in the garden behind a tree exposing his shins to the sunlight. We were never alone. When Aminit slept, I do not know. She was always in the room, or leaving the room, or entering it, and when she was not present, one of the servants was. They were shy, silent little people, several shades darker in colour than Aminit and Tarek, and if they were not mute, they pretended to be, communicating among themselves and with Aminit by means of gestures. The more my strength increased, the more I resented the lack of privacy, for I felt sure that was what prevented Emerson from taking his rightful place at my side by night as well as by day. He was rather shy about such things. Our suite of rooms surrounded a delightful little garden with a pool in its centre. They consisted of several bedchambers, a formal reception room with exquisitely carved lotus columns, and a bath chamber with a stone slab on which the bather stood while servants poured water over him. The furniture was simple but elegant, beds with springs of woven leather, chests and beautifully woven baskets that served for storage of linen and clothing, a few chairs, several small tables. Only our rooms were furnished, the rest of the building had been abandoned. It was very large, with innumerable rooms and passageways, and several empty courtyards, and part of it had been cut out of the cliff against which it apparently stood. These back rooms had probably been designed for storage. They were small and windowless, and looked very eerie in the dim light of the lamps we carried when we explored them. The walls of many of the larger chambers were handsomely decorated with scenes in the ancient style, depicting long-past battles and long-dead dignitaries, both male and female. The inscriptions accompanying these paintings were in the hieroglyphic script familiar to us from our study of Meroitic remains. Ramses at once announced his intention of copying them. "'To take back to Uncle Walter!' I encouraged him in this. It kept him busy and out of mischief. The only windows were high up under the roof, clear story style. There were no inner doors. Woven draperies and matting provided a modicum of privacy. A particularly heavy set of draperies covered one end of our reception room. 
Emerson had unobtrusively steered me away from them when we explored, for he was always at my side. But one day, after we had thoroughly examined the rest of the place, I resisted his attempt to lead me toward the garden. I don't want to go into the garden. I want to go through that door, for I presume there is one behind the hangings. Is there a pitfall of venomous snakes or a den of lions beyond that you are so determined to prevent me? Emerson grinned. It is a pleasure to hear you sound like your old crotchety self, my dear. By all means, go ahead if you are so set on it. You won't like what you find, but I think you are now strong enough to deal with it. He politely parted the draperies for me, and I passed through them into a corridor whose walls were painted with scenes of battle. With Emerson close on my heels, I marched the length of the passage toward what appeared to be a blank wall. An opening on the left led into an extension of the passageway. After several more turns and jogs, I emerged abruptly into an antechamber, lit by a row of narrow windows high up under the beamed ceiling, and found myself facing a file of men standing at stiff attention. They must have heard the slap of my sandals as I approached, for I felt certain they did not stand around in that uncomfortable pose all the time. They were a fine-looking set of men, all quite young, all at least six feet tall. In addition to the usual kilt, each man wore a wide leather belt supporting a dagger long enough to be called a short sword and carried a shield pointed at the top like a gothic arch. Some held huge iron spears and wore a sort of helmet, fashioned of leather and fitting closely to their heads. Others were armed with bows and quivers bristling with arrows. Their heads were bare, except for a narrow band of braided grass, from the back of which arose a single crimson feather. When I examined them more closely, I saw that, though the shields were identical in shape, some were covered with brownish fawn hide, while others, the ones held by the archers, had white patches on a red-brown background. Holding these shields before them, the men formed a living wall across the room from one side to the other. Nor did they give way as I approached them. I stopped perforce when my eyes were a scant inch from the well-formed chin of the young man who seemed to be in charge. He continued to stare straight ahead. I turned to Emerson, who was watching with evident amusement. "'Tell them to let me pass,' I exclaimed. "'Use your parasol,' Emerson suggested. "'I doubt they have ever faced such a terrible weapon as that.' "'You know I didn't bring it with me,' I snapped. "'What is the meaning of this? Are we prisoners, then?' Emerson sobered. "'The situation is not so simple, Peabody.' I'd let you see this for yourself, because you would have insisted on it anyway. Come away, we must talk about this. I let him take my arm and lead me back along the corridor. Rather cleverly constructed, this, he remarked. The turning of the passage gives the occupants privacy, and makes it easier to defend against an attacking force. It makes one suspect that the ruling classes don't enjoy the loyalty of all their subjects. I don't want to hear suggestions and deductions and surmises, I said. I want to hear facts. How much have you kept from me, Emerson? Come into the garden, Peabody. We circled a group of the little servants who were scouring the floor of the reception room with sand and water and sat down on a carved bench next to the pool. Lilies and lotus blooms covered its surface, the leaves of the giant lotus, some of them a good three feet in diameter, lay on the water like carved jade platters. A soft breeze whispered through the tamarisk and persia trees that shaded the bench, with a chorus of birdsong forming a musical counterpoint. Birds haunted the garden. Sparrows and hoopoes and a variety of brilliantly feathered flyers I could not identify. It was indeed Zerzura, the place of the little birds. "'Beautiful, isn't it?' "'Emerson took his pipe from the pouch "'that hung at the belt of his robe, "'serving as a substitute for pockets. "'He had smoked the last of his tobacco the day before. 
but apparently even an empty pipe was better than none. Some people might think themselves fortunate to spend the rest of their lives in such peace and tranquillity. Some people, I said. But not you. You needn't answer, my dear. We are, as always, in complete agreement. Never fear. When we are ready to leave, we'll find a means of doing so. I didn't want to make a move of any kind until you were yourself again. We may have to fight our way out of here, Peabody. I hope we do not. But if we do, I need you at my side. Parasol at the ready. Has ever woman received a more touching tribute from her spouse? Speechless with pride, I could only gaze at him with eyes brimming with emotion. Blow your nose, Peabody said Emerson, offering me a singularly dirty rag which had once been a good pocket handkerchief. Thank you. I will use my own. From my own pocket pouch I took one of the squares of linen that had been cut at my direction to replace my own lost handkerchiefs. We've never been in a situation quite like this, Peabody, Emerson went on, sucking reflectively on his empty pipe. Always before, we were familiar with the local customs, the manners and habits of the people with whom we were dealing. Based on what little I have seen and heard, I have developed a few theories about this place. It seems to be a peculiar mixture of several different cultural strains. Originally, like the oasis of Siwa in northern Africa, it may have been sacred to the god Amun. I believe that some of the priests who left Egypt after the 22nd dynasty came here and gave new life to the old traditions. After the fall of the Meroitic kingdom, the sacred mountain became a refuge for the Cushite nobles. There is a third strain of native peoples, the original occupants, whom we have seen acting as servants. Add to all these factors the changes wrought by the passage of time and by centuries of virtual isolation, and you end up with a culture far more alien than any we have encountered. We can make informed guesses about how things are done here, but we would be taking an awful risk if we acted on those guesses. Do you agree with me so far? Certainly, my dear, and without wishing to appear critical of your lecture, which was well-reasoned and eloquently expressed, it was quite unnecessary to go into such elaborate detail, since I had already arrived at the same conclusions. Facts, Emerson, give me facts. <laughs> said Emerson. The fact is, Peabody, that I haven't spoken to Tarek alone since we got here. He visited you every day, but he only stayed for a few minutes, and there was always someone with him. Besides, I wasn't in the mood for anthropological discussions. Yes, my dear, I understand, and I am deeply appreciative of your concern. But now... Tarek hasn't been back since you recovered consciousness, Emerson replied somewhat snappishly. I couldn't question him if he wasn't here, could I? I discovered early on that there were armed guards in the antechamber, and that they were disinclined to let me pass. But curse it, Peabody, we don't know why they are there. They may be protecting us from dangers we know nothing about. Let me remind you that Tarek's title is that of King's son. He is not the king. We haven't seen the king or the queen. The royal women of Meroe seem to have held considerable political power. The same may be true here. That would be splendid, I exclaimed. What an example! Curse it, Peabody! That is just what I was afraid of that you would start jumping to conclusions. The point I am endeavouring to make is that until we know who is in control here and how they feel about uninvited visitors like ourselves, we must walk warily. Why, certainly, Emerson. And the point I am endeavouring to make is that it is time we made an effort to learn these things. I am fully recovered and ready to take that place at your side you so kindly offered me. I believe you are, said Emerson, without the wholehearted enthusiasm I had expected. All right, then. The first step is to get in touch with Tarek. Do you suppose that omnipresent column of white swaddling will carry a message to him? 
If you can convince her that you have made a full recovery, we may be able to dispense with her services, he added, brightening visibly at the idea. The confounded girl is getting on my nerves, gliding around like a ghost. Amenit made it clear that carrying a message was beneath her dignity, but she agreed to find someone to take it. She admitted I was no longer in need of her medical attention. This did not have the effect Emerson and I had hoped, however. When I suggested, as tactfully as my still limited command of the language allowed, that her services could now be dispensed with, she pretended not to understand. We had made our move. It remained only to await a response. After luncheon, we retired for the brief rest that is customary in warm climes. Not for the first time I regretted the loss of my little library. I would as soon think of travelling without my trousers as my books. Cheap paper-bound editions of my favourite novels and works of philosophy. For I preferred to spend my resting time reading, my normally vigorous health making extra sleep unnecessary. The books had, of course, been among the unnecessary luxuries discarded after the mutiny of our servants. With nothing better to do, I did sleep for a few hours. When I awoke, I went into the reception room to find Ramses and Emerson already there, hard at work on a language lesson. No, no, Papa, Ramses was saying in an insufferably patronising voice. The imperative form is Abadamu, not Abadmunt. Bah, said Emerson. Hello, Peabody. Did you have a good rest? Yes, thank you. Has there been any word from Tarek? Apparently not. I can't get a word out of that wretched girl. She just squirms and grunts and scuttles off when I speak to her. Yet it appears we are about to have guests, I remarked, taking a seat next to him. Why'd you say that? I indicated a minute who was hopping around the room like a flea on a griddle, as my old North Country nurse would have put it, her hands flying as she directed the servants. I have never seen her move so briskly. The room was already spotless, as indeed it always is, but she has made them clean it again, and now they are setting up those little light tables and chairs. I recognise the actions of a nervous hostess. I do believe you are correct, Peabody. With an obvious air of relief, Emerson pushed his lesson aside and rose. I had better change. These loose robes are quite comfortable, but I feel at a disadvantage in skirts. I felt the same. I hastened to assume not only my trousers, but my belt. Thus accoutred, and with my parasol ready at hand, I felt ready for anything that might ensue. It was a good thing I had noticed Amenit's behaviour, for we were given no other warning. The curtains at the entrance were suddenly flung aside. This time, Tarek's entourage was more extensive and impressive. There were six soldiers instead of two, and four of the veiled maidens. They were followed by a number of men, all of them richly dressed, and by several young women who were hardly dressed at all. A few strings of beads, however strategically placed, do not, in my opinion, constitute clothing. These damsels carried musical instruments, small harps, pipes and drums, on which they began to play, enthusiastically if not euphoniously. All fanned out as they entered and took up positions on both sides of the door. An expectant pause ensued. Then came Tarek and his twin... There were two of them, at any rate, almost equal in height, and dressed identically, but a second glance told me that the resemblance was not as exact as I had thought. The second man was a trifle shorter and more heavily built, with shoulders almost as massive as those of my formidable spouse. By Western standards, which are, if I may remind the reader, as arbitrary as those of any other culture, he was even better looking than Tarek with finely chiselled features and a delicate, almost feminine mouth. Yet there was something repellent about him. Tarek's bearing had the dignity of a true nobleman. The other man carried himself with the arrogance of a tyrant. Emerson maintains that I am reinterpreting my reaction in the light of later experience. I stick to my statement. After a moment, one of the courtiers stepped forward.
It was Murtek, the old high priest of Isis. Clearing his throat, he spoke in a sonorous voice. Sir and madam, and small worthy son, here are the king's sons of his body, the two Horus, carrying the bow to the destruction of the enemies of his majesty, the defenders of Osiris, the prince Tarakenidal Meraset, son of the king's wife, Shanak Dachete, the prince, his brother, Nastas Namare, son of the king's wife, Amane Shachete. His pleasure at getting through the long address, with what he believed utter success, was evident in his broad, if toothless, smile. It was certainly a remarkable speech, fraught with intriguing implications, but I fear I was too busy struggling to preserve my gravity to take them all in, or to reply in kind. Emerson claims to have comprehended better than I, be that as it may, he was obviously the proper person to reply, and he was never at a loss for words. Your Royal Highnesses, uh, gentlemen and uh, ladies... Allow me to introduce myself. Professor Radcliffe Archibald Emerson, M.A., Oxford, Fellow of the Royal Society, Fellow of the Royal Geographical Society, Member of the American Philosophical Society, my honoured chief wife, the Lady Dr. Amelia Peabody Emerson, etc., 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 the noble youth heir to his father, born of the chief wife, Walter Ramsay's Peabody Emerson. Beaming, the old gentleman proceeded to present the others. It took quite a long time since they each had a string of impressive titles. Priests and prophets, courtiers and counts, fan-bearers and carriers of the sandals of his majesty. Their names have no bearing on this narrative except for one. Paseka, royal vizier and high priest of Aminre. All our visitors were finely dressed, with gold glittering on every limb, but Paseka fairly clanked with bracelets, armlets, massive pectorals, and a broad jewelled collar. His ornately dressed hair was obviously a wig. The little stiff black curls formed an incongruous frame for his weathered, scowling face. I suspected he was a blood relative of the two princes, for his features were an older, harsher version of theirs. We had got more than we bargained for. Not only Tarek, but representatives of the highest in the land. I would have taken this as a good omen had it not been for the hot, hostile stare of Prince Nastasen, who bore the same name as that of the remote ancestor whose tomb we had found at Nuri, and the unsmiling regard of the high priest of Aminre. Rising to the occasion, as a good hostess must, I indicated the tables, where the servants stood ready with jars of wine and platters of food. There was a certain amount of rude scuffling to determine who sat next to whom. I had hoped to get Tarek as a dinner partner, but his brother fairly pushed me into a chair and took the one next to me, beckoning to Multek to join us. Apparently his services as translator were required, Prince Nastasen did not speak English. His grave face lightening in a smile, Tarek elected to favour Ramses, which left Emerson to the high priest of Aminre, he and the two princes being the three highest in rank. The others took their places at different tables, each of which seated only two or three people. The musicians, who had stopped playing while the old man spoke, now struck up a jingling tune, punctuated by thumps on the drum, and one of the young women began to gyrate around the room. She was extremely limber. Nastasen was not much of a conversationalist. He applied himself to his food, and Murtek, though obviously dying to show off his English, confined himself to smiles and nods. Something warned me to follow his example which was wise, for as I later learned, one does not speak until the person of highest status present has deigned to do so. After demolishing a roast duck and throwing the bones over his shoulder, Nastasen fixed his fine dark eyes on my face. 
even when he pronounced the guttural sounds of his native tongue. His voice was beautiful, a deep, mellow baritone. I understood only a few words and deemed it best to admit not even to that. So I turned an inquiring smile on Murtek. The king's son asks how old you are, said that worthy. Oh, dear, I said in some confusion. In our country, it is not polite. Tell him we do not count the years as he does. Tell him I am as old as his mother. A voice not far distant murmured, Well done, Peabody. And the old man translated what I had said. Nastarsen proceeded to ask me a series of questions that would have been deemed highly impertinent in civilized society, having to do with my personal habits, my family, and my relations with my husband. For all I knew, such questions might have been rude in this culture as well, but I was in no position to object. So I fended them off as well as I could. Emerson, seated at an adjoining table, was not so controlled as I, I could hear him gurgling and gasping with rage as the Inquisition continued. The dear fellow assumed that the prince's intimate questions betokened a personal interest in my humble self. I doubted this, though to be sure I also doubted that my claiming to be the age of his mother would deter him from adding me to his collection, should he care to do so. Having answered a good dozen or more questions, I decided I might venture upon a few of my own. I hope your honoured father, the king, is well, seemed safe, but Nastarsen did not seem to like it. His face darkened, and he replied with a short, curt sentence. The old gentleman took some liberties in the translation. His majesty is Osiris. He had fled to the sky. He is the king of the western peoples. He is dead? I asked, surprised. Dead, yes. Dead. Mortek smiled broadly. But then who is king? Does his highness have an older brother? The old man turned to the prince. The answer was a curt nod, and I realized that he had asked for permission to explain the situation, which he proceeded to do at some length, and with a striking absence of grammar. The king had only been dead a few months the Horus flied in the season of harvest. In many other societies, the eldest surviving prince automatically assumes the crown. But here, the succession depended on a number of factors, the most important of which was the rank of the mother. The king had had a great number of wives, but only two of them had been royal princesses. The late king's half-sisters, in fact. The survival of this particular custom which was practiced in ancient Egypt as well as in the Kushite kingdom, did not surprise me. It made a certain amount of sense in terms of dogma as well as practical politics, for by marrying his sisters, the king kept them out of the clutches of ambitious nobles who might be tempted to claim the throne by right of their wives' royal birth and also ensured that the divine blood of the pharaohs would be undiluted. The children of lesser wives and concubines held noble rank, like the young Count, whom Tarek had introduced as his brother. But the sons of the royal princesses had first claim on the crown, for the first time in the annals of the kingdom. Each of these ladies had one surviving son, who were exactly the same age. When I questioned this remarkable statement, the old man shrugged. Not the same moment, the same hour, no. In fact, the noble Prince Tarek was somewhat the elder. But both had been born in the same year of His Majesty, and whenever there was a question, as for instance in the case of twins, the final decision was left to the gods. Or to the god, Aminre himself. When he came forth from the sanctuary on the occasion of his yearly circuit of the city, he would choose the next king. This was due to occur within a few weeks. In the meantime, the noble Prince Nastarsen had acted as regent in the absence of his brother, and with the assistance of the vizier, the high priests, the counsellors. And Uncle Tom Cobley and all, I murmured. No, said old Murtek, seriously. He lives not in this place. 
To say I was fascinated is a vast understatement. My life's work had been the study of ancient Egypt. To find actual living examples of rituals I had known only from weathered tomb walls and desiccated papyri was an indescribable thrill. Amin-Re was obviously Amun-Re, and he held the same high position here as in Egypt. From an obscure godling of Thebes, he had risen to be king of the gods, taking on their names and attributes, even as his ambitious priests gathered land and wealth into the treasuries of their temples. This would not be the first time Amun Re had selected a king. Over three thousand years ago, the nod of the god had gone to a humble young priest who had, as Thutmose III, become one of Egypt's mightiest warrior pharaohs. And had not the stealer of the first Nastasen, found by Lepsius, mentioned his selection by Amun? Murtek's words had also confirmed Emerson's theories about the importance of the royal women. How far did their power extend, I wondered? Could they only convey the right to rule, or did they wield real power? I was about to demand additional details when His Royal Highness barked out a brusque comment. It was evident that he was bored, and perhaps suspicious as well. Poor old Murtex swallowed convulsively and did not speak again. More wine was poured, and the formal entertainment began. Dancers, acrobats, and a juggler. The juggler may have been nervous, I would have been, with Nastasen glowering upon me, for he ended by dropping one of the blazing torches, which rolled dangerously close to the foot of his highness, before someone stamped it out. Nastasen rose in his wrath, shouting. The juggler fled, pursued by two soldiers. It appeared the entertainment was over, and the banquet as well. One of his attendants, bowing obsequiously, handed Nastasen his gold-bordered mantle, which he flung about his shoulders. I breathed a sigh of relief, for as courtesy seemed to demand, I had drunk quite a lot of wine. It may have been the wine that emboldened me to ask one final question, though I believe I would have done it anyway. There were hundreds of things I wanted to know, but this was the most vital. I turned to Murtek. Ask His Highness what has happened to the white man, Willoughby Forth, and his wife. The old man's jaw dropped. He glanced uneasily at his prince, but no translation was necessary. Either Nastasen understood more English than he admitted, or Mr. Forth's name itself made my meaning clear. For the first time that evening, his delicate lips curved in a smile. Slowly and deliberately, he pronounced a single word. I knew the word. Shock and comprehension must have registered upon my countenance, for Nastasen's smile broadened, baring his strong white teeth. Tossing the end of his scarf over his head, he turned on his heel and strode from the room.'